SQL series on Salesforce. Salesforce happens to be CRM distribution. CRM means uh, customer relationship management and it is one of the leading providers of uh, CRM and it is as uh, like software uh, as a service uh, it's a SaaS model so uh, basically the whole thing is to deliver your services over the net uh, so that you can access it from any platform from any mobile device and uh, can be a tablet can be a mobile phone can be a laptop and it can even be your desktop you'll be able to connect to salesforce.com and you will be able to do your uh, CRM related activities okay so it has a lot of features it has a lot of functionalities in it and uh, it has won a lot of awards and it is one of the best uh, CRM uh, softwares uh, available on the cloud now before we go into Salesforce and start uh, playing around with the interface uh, one thing I uh, want to make you guys uh, know what is a CRM in case you already do not know so in case you already know what a CRM is I'll suggest you skip uh, this tutorial and uh, in case you are already a member of Salesforce I'll suggest you uh, skip the next tutorial also uh, because we are going to give you an overview of CRM and the Salesforce in the next two tutorials and the first two tutorials and then we'll go into the interface because I'm taking for granted there are people who have heard about Salesforce and the idea is to teach them what Salesforce is and like what is the structure how to go about it and then we will go into technicalities right so uh, first we will learn what a CRM is okay so let's uh, go ahead and move into the module where I have done some slides uh, which is going to show you guys what a CRM is I'll just go full screen okay okay so basically it's all about uh, customer relationship management now uh, when we are talking about customers uh, we are not only talking about people who are actually buying from us so we are actually talking about people whom we are dealing with so in the sense a customer can be a customer who is actually uh, buying from us a customer can also be a person who is a lead uh, that is we have got the lead from somewhere and a customer can be a person from whom we are buying that is a customer can be a vendor also uh, a customer can be a business partner with which whom we are doing some deals okay so customers are basically people uh, with whom we are dealing with to run a business it can be a vendor it can be a customer customer it can be a business partner it can be a supplier so when in terms of CRM a customer means the people who whom, with whom we are connecting with whom we are interacting who with whom uh, we are doing our business that is the customer and the user means the people uh, that are associated in our team that is we the backend people okay so user consists of administrators and salespeople and marketing people and support people and call center people the CRM works out this way we are at one end is the customer that is the vendors users and uh, vendors and customers and partners leads and at the other end is the users that is us okay so now uh, what is customer relationship management so this is all about maintaining our relations with the customer that is all those three four types of people now so uh, what are the main features of our CRM that we normally look at uh, is its uh, first one of its uh, main aspects should be to, to automate the marketing right so one is marketing automation the second is the Salesforce automation third is the contact center automation and fourth is the service automation so what are these see marketing automation uh, let me give you an example marketing is a process where suppose a lead comes in okay so a lead comes in by calling in a phone or maybe a lead comes in uh, by call by sending an email or maybe from the social media okay so we can actually automate certain features in the marketing modules of the CRM 
that uh, we will shoot that person an automatic uh, email or a uh, email campaign or something like that as a response to the inquiry that we have just received even before we have replied to this guy manually an uh, email will go to this person with all the benefits with all the features and all okay so that is one aspect of uh, marketing automation the other aspect is we can create campaigns and we can follow these like we, these campaigns can be you know scheduled and all so as per the schedule things will go out and while they are going out the team members will be informed and uh, uh, this whole process is called marketing automation similarly there is something called uh, salesforce automation salesforce uh, automation is all about deals and the deal pipeline now what effectively happens when a lead comes in say it is like a post uh, marketing stage a lead comes in so we have to convert that lead into a uh, account that is uh, we have to make them our client as uh, and there has to be some business opportunity in it and once we have the business when we see the business opportunity and when we have made them our client we have to go ahead and send them codes and they will I and mean, ultimately we have to convert uh, them into a paying customer for whatever service or product that we are offering now this whole uh, uh, pipeline of sales uh, can be automated in many a ways like you can generate invoices uh, automatic invoices you can uh, shoot alerts to each other in the team uh, once you have inputted the data auto mailers can be sent and auto notifications can be sent you can schedule a lot of things to happen automatically okay so uh, this is what is called salesforce automation okay so uh, there's another uh, interesting aspect of it is we'll make sure this uh, makes sure that uh, same portion is not uh, being connected by two people okay so in the sense like you have a customer now uh, this system makes sure that uh, it gets designated to one particular person and it doesn't get designated to two three people so it's not that three people will be following up the same lead okay so that's another aspect of it uh, that's salesforce automation now contact center automation is another aspect of it so do note that the first one is about marketing the second one is about sales and the third main aspect of a crm should be the contact center automation so contact centers are basically uh, places where we are uh, giving support to the customer either by email or by uh, web tickets uh, that is support tickets which is very important or by telephone or we can even do like remote desktop uh, servicing like uh, where we can connect to their desktop and give them support and all so there are quite a few uh, contact center automation options uh, that should be there in a CRM. We are talking about an ideal CRM. And uh, like uh, so similarly, a lot of things can be automated when they get in touch with us. We can send them emailers and we can automatically assign cases to various departments and uh, we can assign support people to these departments and a lot of things we can actually automate in the contact center end. So uh, while the person is calling in, that person uh, through the IVR can actually be guided to a particular representative who actually deals with that case. So all this process instead of going by traditional me medium can actually be uh, automated with the help of the uh, contact center automation. <music>
make it mobile and social, build the app, and then deploy the app. This is the way business has to process if you don't have something that automates your steps. This is old school. This is manual. This is multiple, multiple business interactions. And you could tell the time that it would take would just not be cost effective. So with Salesforce, literally anyone in your business flow could have an idea. This Salesforce in the box cloud that comes with standard objects is ready to deploy day one and could be used right out of the box. And then as you as an admin and as a team become more proficient, you can customize, build that and extend it to meet your needs as your company grows. Different organizations see the admin role in different lights. And you'll hear us talk about uh, different hats that a Salesforce admin would wear. But these bullet points give you an overview. First of all, the admin must possess some proficiency in interacting with people at all different levels of the company because there's going to be ideas, uh, change requests, updates, and different business units throughout a given year or cycle of business are going to have needs. So the admin's got to be able to relate at all levels. Secondly, be capable of effectively analyzing data. So this data could come from multiple sources. There's got to be an analytical hat where you can see here's what's important. Here's what's in our database now. And here's how we can best use it. Thirdly, be expert in Salesforce. So you have to know the tool. You have to be able to interact both with the, the setup admin side and then with the user interface as well. Next, you have to have an understanding of the conversion rate of optimization to optimize the growth rate of the sales team and help with their excellent data skills so salespeople are selling. So as the admin, you've got to relate that to how the Salesforce functionality can support the business functionality. Possess great data administration skills to retain the data in an easily accessible way. So data is X's and O's and computer language and a compilation of raw facts that the administrator is able to interpret, able to uh, positively manipulate it so it can be arranged in a way that could help the entire company. Must be excellent at problem solving. So problems come up regularly the admin can be a part of the resolution be responsible to maintain consistency really big deal so that the the confidence and the confidentiality of the business flow can be expected and can be consistently built on for the organization next to take care of using available tools so Salesforce is connected to other tools. We'll talk about that in the app exchange and app building part of our lessons. Uh, checks for changes that need to be done in making the business process effective. So this is proactive and looking for ways to make the business flow better. Works at them as the main system administrator for handling the work environment with multiple users. So he's, he or she is the main source to give guidance. Checks for restrictions where there might be uh, data that needs to be accessible to different areas, different business units, different profiles. The admin 
make sure that the right people see the right things. Takes care of removal of redundancy or duplicates. This is a huge deal. Many, many legacy platforms, as you're moving data from your old environments into this new environment, the admin can be a great help in making sure that the data is clean and that Salesforce is leveraged at optimal capability without duplicates and redundancy. Next manages all executive functions, maintenance, user accounts, records, dashboards, additional conventional tasks. So reports, dashboards, and day-to-day -day functionality. This is where the business builds confidence and knows that someone owns the process to make it work and get better. And then organizes the assessment, extension, and conclusion of new requests. So there's constantly going to be new needs. And Salesforce provides three new iterations without any extra charge every year. And those iterations are built out to help businesses continue to grow. And the admin helps to leverage those. The app builder role includes at least at a minimum designing the data model, the user interface, business logic, and security for custom apps so the salesforce tool comes with right out of the box some standard objects and standard capabilities the app builder helps expand that role to customize for what your needs are and to build on the capabilities custom objects for most your needs are and to build on the capabilities custom objects for mobile use so ipads android devices smartphones this is where the business is constantly evolving and moving forward and then reports and dashboards so this is the enhancement of and the extension of the expansion of really leveraging the data so that it's used most effectively and then deploying custom applications so there are going to be many, many opportunities for the app builder to see needs, meet needs, build on needs, and even take the business unit further than they thought they could go. So here's our course outline. So excited. The introduction will, will be quick and we'll move through. Then we're going to talk about the user setup and how you make this tool most effective and it's designed to meet every user uh, where their needs are salesforce data and understanding how data flows and how it can be uh, most best practice leveraged security and access really really a big deal every business wants their components to be secure to be accessible but to be vital and vibrant for the business page layouts and tabs the look and the feel and the usefulness of all of this data the lightning app builder and how we can customize our tool workflow and process builder so automation things that need to happen repeatedly over and over and over again that can save user interface and build efficiency save time lightning flow so this is where there may be complex needs that multiple approvals or uh, apex code needs to trigger lightning flows uh, are excellent for that data management so ongoing uh, backup and exports and uh, deletions or additions for your data lightning reports and dashboards this is huge especially for the management level the, the executive level and really every user wants to be able to track and see how they're doing what they're doing and then lastly deployments when uh, we're migrating a large metadata uh, or, or just the, the onboard data in our system 
and how we move that into a new environments. So we're excited to get started. We'll see you in the course. Before we get started into the the overview of what the job is, what the responsibilities are, the details of the tool, there is an exam that can be taken for certification for the admin position. And it's a basic exam, but it's a, a challenging exam. So let's look at some of the details. So the overall format is that it's a multiple choice, multiple answer. The good news is it will tell you in each question, pick the best two or pick uh, the three best cases or uh, which one of the following is best case use scenario. And I will show you some question examples. Uh, in our lesson here, we're not going to show, there's no way to show every single question in the exam, but there are 65 questions that are uh, selected from literally thousands of potential questions. And each year, because Salesforce is expanding, the exam expands. And from time to time, it refocuses uh, what's vital and most important. You'll have 90 minutes to complete those 65 questions. The passing score is only 65, but don't let that confuse you or, or, or uh, make you feel that that would be very easy to make a 65. It's very, very challenging. So we're recommending uh, many practice tests. Uh, studying through the trailhead, studying videos, and hopefully our interaction uh, during this lesson will, uh, these 11 units that we cover will be of help as well. A registration cost is 200 for the initial exam and then a retake of $100 for each retake. So you can create a web assessor account to register register for the exam and here's the link that you can go to and once you're at that page then it walks you through a brief discussion about uh, what these exams include uh, how to schedule it and this web assessor will be a very good tool for you to uh, set up an exam at a, a local a place in your community or you can also take it online as well so here are the the weightages for each of the sections and this has recently changed so configuration and setup users profile security 20 percent object manager lightning app builder relationships and ui customization 20 percent so obviously we would want to focus a lot of our study and our thought processes on those first two areas. And just be aware that if you don't take it this season or this year, you can go to Salesforce Trailhead and uh, look up the exam focus. Again, there are practice exams that uh, you could get through the web assessor and there are multiple, multiple tools that can walk you through, but sales and marketing applications, accounts, contacts, leads, configuration, 12%. Service and support applications, cases, escalation, 11%. Activities, events, tasks, chatter, customization, 7%. Reports, dashboards, data import and export, data management, 14%. Workflow process, builder flows, 16%. So this is just giving you an idea Everything is important, but you're going to be tested with more questions focused on these top two areas and then reports and dashboards and workflow process builders secondarily. So it's a challenge. You can do it. Here's ways to focus. And hopefully uh, you'll begin gathering some of that a knowledge base as we go through our lessons but here are we can't copy exact questions but 
here's some samples. For example, what is a valid organization-wide default? OWD, the option for the account object. And you would choose which one of those valid default. Which three features can automatically create a case? Choose three answers. So again, it's going to tell you how many are effective and you would pick the top three. Which three standard chart types can be placed on Salesforce dashboard? Choose the three answers. Here's those choices. Lightning for Outlook layout can be assigned to which two options to choose the two best answers. So as we walk through this lesson, we'll be pointing towards those details and hopefully you'll begin to get a good foundation we want you to get certified it's in your best interest you can actually do the job and salesforce recommends uh six months uh, of actually being on the job and practicing hands-on and then studying and then taking the exam and that would make sense to you once you got involved in this because even if you're a really good test taker and you pass the exam without doing hands-on, once you get in the position and the business unit and the, your employer needs someone to start hands-on creating and updating and training what the tool can do, then you can see both are important. Taking the exam, being aware of a certification process, but also uh being hands-on with using the tool all right that's a great overview a great start let's start our journey Thanks for joining us with this introduction to Salesforce. We're excited on the journey with us. First of all, let's take an overview of our learning objectives. After completing this lesson, you should be able to do these five things. One, explain cloud basics. We're just starting off with the basics first, but we want you to be able to understand the cloud relationships and how Salesforce can be leveraged in the cloud. We're going to discuss CRM. We want you to be able to explain and understand what client relationship management is all about and how you can leverage it. We're going to discover Salesforce in general. There's a lot to uncover. There's a lot to be aware of, and we want you to get the initial discovery steps in place. We're going to list the Salesforce offerings. There are multiple offerings. Again, we're going to start with the basics, the fundamentals, and build on that over the next few lessons. And then we're going to demonstrate how to create a Salesforce account. We'll show it on our screens and then we'll demonstrate it in the next video. Let's get started. Cloud basics. So as an individual user, you can interface with cloud computing right from your laptop, your phone, your iPad, any smart device allows you to connect in the same way that major corporations and global entities would be able to interact with servers, virtual desktops, software platforms, and at your disposal are the resources connected to Salesforce, which includes applications, databases, networks, both internally inside your company and then externally in a very secure environment to connect the APIs to other external networks and then processing capacities. You will expand and extend what you can do as an individual by being connected to the Salesforce environment. So cloud computing involves all of those benefits in a very secure and direct accessible via the internet right to your device, whether it's a laptop, 
personal computer, as we said, smart device, phone, iPad, notebook, all of those can get you right to the access of these Salesforce interfaces. And here's the advantages. So economically, you, the return on your investment, what you input and invest in your Salesforce relationship, then can be expanded in building the business relationships that allow you to grow those relationships and ultimately expand the value of your business and add value to your clients. And those are measurable services because there are reports, dashboards, uh, analytics that can display and reflect exactly your stage and steps in the process. The availability of Salesforce is 24-7, 365, every day of the year. So when you're logging in, you have this access to get to work and get busy from the beginning. The Salesforce environment is a secure environment, so you can be confident that what you're inputting and what you're sharing and what you're developing and building on is in a secure native environment. Easy maintenance. So Salesforce takes the responsibility of keeping their interfaces and have entire teams of support that now becomes part of your relationship so that maintenance is really just keeping your org clean and organized, but you have backup and support in the Salesforce ecosystem in a way that is far beyond what you have to feel pressured to control yourself. So it's a pay-as-you-go entity. You are, are purchasing something on an ongoing basis as a type subscription that as it builds benefits to you, you see those value adds. It's an on-demand self-service environment. So what that means is all of the resources that have built, been built out for decades, you have disposal to all of that historical data, whether it's in video form or manuals, guidebooks, and or trailheads you can continue to expand and grow an on-demand as needed entity. And then you have a scalable network access provided and these networks are global. So even the smallest organization can connect in a scalable way to benefit from all the research and data that's available in Salesforce. So there are different types of clouds that are accessible. So there are infrastructure as service clouds. They offer infrastructure. And so this is application servers, storage servers. Examples of those would be AWS and Azure. There are platform as a service clouds. So they offer programming language. So custom applications can be built and developed. And those are like force.com which is the foundation of salesforce and heroku which is a marketing platform but then the software as a service saas cloud is where salesforce resides and it is a software application you don't download it you enter you log into it and interact with it and it's similar to a uh, onedrive google apps dropbox but designed specifically for building business relationships. And all of these types of clouds can be accessible to you in at your data center level, and Salesforce will leverage all of these interfaces where you can leverage the power of operating systems, development tools, networks, storage, all are connected as you log in to your instance of Salesforce. So let's jump into this introduction. Customer relationship management is what CRM is all about. Managing relationships for business 
advantage and value adds. So it is the process of managing and tracking customers from the very beginning, the first time we meet or interact with a potential lead all the way through the business cycle. Why would a person choose to leverage CRM? Well, all of these relationships and all of these potential clients have to be organized in some way to add value to them as a client with services or products that we could provide, and then to add value to our organization to build and grow. And it is a focused funnel that allows continued growth and historical recording for archiving and building on this relationship to the next level as clients grow and as our organizations grow we can have one point of truth one interaction that allows us to continue organized growth so crm in general offer sets of tools whether they're sales and marketing tools uh, management tools they allow us to move this initial relationship all the way from beginning lead to closing the deal and adding value and it enables our service side to support and manage what the customers request questions cases and even automate those processes so that there's quick value add uh, consistent and secure support for our clients so there are at least five key features that Salesforce provides. And the first is a visibility over the whole process. So this means that in one place, in one database, one platform, one interface, we can see all the steps from beginning to end of what our process specifically entails in our organization and they are customizable so that Salesforce provides out of the box some defaults that allow us to build on and then we can create and customize those to fit our specific business needs. And then in addition to those fundamental standards, then we can automate processes if there are business functions that happen repeatedly over and over and over again, the same function on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, those can be automated, thus saving time and expense for our individual users, our groups, and ultimately our organization. The third key feature is collaboration. And what this means is in a secure environment, in a native resident access point, Individual users can collaborate more efficiently upline with their management above them and their peers across all business units. And since business is moving more and more into a remote environment, collaboration in a secure and business functionality is an additional exponential value add. A fourth feature is the enhancement of the quality of service. So because we have a clear, clean, organized, focused uh, business process that can be repeatable, then our clients will see the level of quality raised exponentially because we can keep on track and know and find and report on daily activities and service points that benefit those clients and then a faster conversion rate so this makes sense when everything's organized it's all in one place i can repeat automatically processes that uh, my business provides and the go to market window allows me to do my job more efficiently more effectively and then 
with much faster repetition so that I can convert to the next stage in my business process and ultimately close deals and add value. So from a Salesforce introduction perspective, what we're looking at is on-demand client relationship management system. Salesforce is designed to do everything we've just talked about. And right out of the box, there's functionalities that automate marketing, sales, service processes, and any type of business functionality that will benefit your clients. So Salesforce enables the connection with customers again in a secure, connected, native environment, and then connection among your employees so that your networks, your interfaces, your files, your business transactions can be seamless. It offers everything that's required to transform your business into a social enterprise. So all of our social networking platforms can be integrated, connected, and then built on uh, this powerful cloud-based tool. And maybe best of all, it doesn't require any installation. So this is not taking up resident space on your servers. It's not something that would be impacted if an installation went bad because you're connecting, not installing, and that frees up your teams to be more efficient and effective. So Salesforce advantages. We've mentioned several times the low maintenance and risk. So you're not in the position where you have to fix glitches, bugs, of issues on the Salesforce platform, Salesforce takes that responsibility. And then you and your administration team can focus on the needs specifically to your org. The architecture is a multi-tenant arch architecture. What that means is you have your space that is scalable to in comparison to other large organizations, you get the same IT level support, the same interfaces and processes available to you on a scalable format, depending on what version and uh, level of needs your company would represent. And then Salesforce is always iterating, it's always updating, it's without extra cost to you and your team there are summer releases winter releases spring releases and those releases mean additional capabilities from a functionality level and then more capabilities to support your clients so what type of offerings so we, we see now that Salesforce is a powerful CRM, Client Relationship Management Tool. What does Salesforce offer? So the offerings include automations from a wide range of business areas like sales, service, marketing, customer support. As an example, there is a sales cloud environment where sales teams can leverage their objects, their interactions, and have focused capabilities from a sales vantage point. There are service cloud interfaces so that your service teams, clients now can feel the power of your team being supportive uh, in every level of your interaction with this client your business can leverage the service cloud to the next level of support. And the marketing cloud allows your marketing teams to be proactive, to reach out 
at multiple levels and multiple entry points and support uh, enhancements for your clients and allow them to see and interface with your best positioning of your products of what your company is providing to add a value and you can be proactive because of this marketing cloud environment so specific to the sales cloud information about leads which would be businesses or individuals that you have not done business with yet through the entire sales cycle all in one place so converting that first introductory level experience with a potential client all the way to keeping them happy and in in invigorating the relationship because you've added value to them no matter what you sell or what you provide sales cloud is all about from the bottom up that lead first interface and managing that relationship and then as that transitions and converts to a contact and all of the relationships for example knowing a person's birth date and anniversary dates or preferences and being able to historically refer back to and send a, a happy email on a birthday to a contact enhances that relationship makes them uh, feel more closely connected to you and your company and then allows you to continue to add value that contact is connected to an account which is their employer their place of business and all the information the addresses the phone numbers the details about that account can be managed and then ultimately allowing you to support the business deal as you're moving from uh, the introductory relationships all the way all the way up to providing uh, business deals and closing uh, advantage points and value adds to the opportunity you can manage that as well and then start the cycle again as you get referrals from these positive opportunities and new leads are created because your clients have had a positive business experience in the service cloud environment different than selling or adding value by a product this is a scenario where you as the support business provide solutions manage these customer relationships by giving them solutions to their resulting needs as your relationship grows with them providing ideas and knowledge based content whether it's in a pdf uh, written format or videos that you provide to them links to value add data as well as activities recording and being able to uh, keep track of each time we interact with our client and saving and recording historical email content of the steps and stages we took to make sure that the business relationship is enhanced and then as the client has issues with or needs updates for uh, what they have purchased or the value that you've added to them being able to track cases of issues that arise in any environment that allows you to build that relationship and track exactly what needs to be enhanced in the marketing cloud environment this allows capabilities in all the different multiple facets of marketing so that contact management we mentioned individuals that are part of the employers that we you are supporting the businesses that are your accounts you can manage those contacts and send out drip campaigns uh, just uh, gentle reminders in an email environment uh, 
get feedback from your clients in a chatter environment where you can post questions and surveys and get feedback from those contacts. Searching the markets available to us at large and being proactive in all the social media outlets. Then managing those leads as people show interest, as potential clients uh, respond and react to the value that we could add to them, then you can manage those leads and keep them in a consistent flow towards building uh, a business relationship. And then in a campaign environment, whether it's a phone campaign, an email campaign, face-to-face -face campaigns, you can track in a cohesive, organized way by region, by value, by independent relationships that your company has made. Whatever works best for your business functionality, you can organize groups of accounts and groups of contacts that then you could focus by quarter. We will call this many contacts this quarter, and then we'll be able to see the results of that campaign in that quarter and be able to track ex and report on exactly how that campaign unfolded. A baseline product where the fundamentals, the metadata is built on in this digital environment is the force.com ecosphere and building on that force.com there are native salesforce apps that are built in right out of the box uh, accounts contacts leads these are apps that are come right out of the box day one of your interaction with your environment then there are third-party apps. You will have the capability in the app exchange to search on and view the unique apps that may be, and these are thousands of apps that may be relative to and enhance your business. And then you'll be given the opportunity in this Salesforce cloud environment to create custom apps for yourself that would be unique to and leveraged by your users in your industry. An additional product is uh, the Heroku product, which is really a, a cloud application connected to and uh, leveraged by, as you have needs in your industry, for marketing and specifically deploying web pages and building those out where you show quality interaction and connectivity to uh, potential clients who may benefit from your services or your products. As I mentioned, there are literally thousands of applications in the app exchange that have been vetted by, tested by, and then uh, accepted into this ecosphere that could be directly connected to and attached to your org in as a package that you could manage that would add value to the specific needs uh, for your organization. An example would be if you had duplicates in a legacy platform and you want to move that data into Salesforce you can leverage applications that would identify those duplications and then allow you to merge them based on the built-in logic that you decide and filter on and then clean data could be represented moving forward in your org because you leverage these app exchange type apps that now enhance and increase the value of the data that you have at hand. One of my favorite products now moving forward because of the security, because of the collaboration, is this business chatter environment. 
So this boosts employee productivity because they can interact with your employees, can interact with each other. They don't have to be worried about email streams. You don't have to worry about uh, outside ransomware attacks because this is a native interface that's secure, that allows for social interactions, allows for postings, allows for customer service connectivity, and allows your individual users and groups of users to build on their business relationships in a day-to-day -day interaction that then could be reported on and captured for uh, legacy historical archiving that could show and reflect uh, how your best practices are working in your organization. There are two Salesforce versions currently. One is the Salesforce Classic. It is the initial version. It's an older interface, very, very stable, uh, was built out beginning all the way back in the late 1990s. The visual effects and the navigation are not as accessible to our mobile environments today, and they're actually uh, difficult to represent in the ongoing mobile connectivity that most of our users enjoy. So Salesforce launched the Lightning version in 2014. And now this version is basically an enhancement or refreshment of a re an upgrade of the Classic. If you've been in Classic previously, the rollout and the upgrades and enhancements to Lightning will allow your users to be even more efficient, even more effective in their time. And the tools that are upgrading and interacting, including these um, app exchange apps that we talked about, and your capability of building custom apps is much more effective and efficient and, and just cleaner in general for uh, modern day current users. It's pertinent information, contact relationship information, and then using your domain, your email address, uh, allowing yourself that first initial access to begin trying out the Salesforce environment. When you do log in, we'll show you in our next video uh, how to launch the apps that come resident in your initial interface, how to search for setup menu items by using the quick file. Find how to get to all the objects that are standard and then as you create those objects, uh, also known as tabs, how to search, and this Einstein search capability that has actionable items is a true game changer for quick access and efficiency, effectiveness of your users. And then uh, we'll walk you through specific icons that allow you to get to quick access for setup, both for sales and for service. And all of this is in one interface in uh, one location as you log in. And summarizing what we've covered today, we talked about the different types of clouds and that Salesforce is a SaaS software as a service cloud entity that allows you to interface in a very secure, very efficient, real-time, dynamic environment. And the key features of that interaction include everything from faster conversion rate of your business requirements, uh, enhancements 
for the quality of service, processes of automation, the duties and activities that are done every day can be automated. And these are just the beginning features. We introduced you to what Salesforce is as a cloud-based, on-demand customer relationship management tool. We talked about offerings that include the sales cloud, service cloud, marketing cloud, among other clouds that Salesforce is continually iterating and updating. We talked about the Lightning version and how that version is now an upgrade and a continuing enhancement to the older version that will at one point be sunset. And then we concluded by talking about uh, the console itself and a quick snapshot of all of the power of the interaction you'll be able to have as you interact with this viable tool. Thank you for your time. We look forward to seeing you in our next lesson. For this short dem demo, we want to help you learn how to sign up for free a developer Salesforce org so that you can be interacting with and learning and following through with all of the dynamics and the lessons to come. So we have logged in to and put in our URL, the HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash developer.salesforce.com and then we simply click on sign up and Salesforce is going to ask some basic information your name first and last your email address What role, and this is specific to you, I'm going to put down here, I'm going to choose administrator for myself. Now, you may be in different companies. I'm just going to put a, this company for myself, you can tell I've put it, I've had most, many different types of companies I've entered in here. I'm going to put a, Postal code, and then this is interesting. You you need to have a unique username. Usually, that's just built on your email address or something similar to that. And I'm gonna because I've used this email address multiple times, have multiple usernames in there. I'm gonna just create a new one. I'm giving a confirmation check and then sign me up. It takes a few minutes to build out this org and you can understand basically an email address so that I can confirm that a new account has built for me and this is all designed so that I have uh, specific to my needs a, a secure environment that would let me build this out and begin to interact with it so I'm checking my emails on a separate screen It'll take just a couple of minutes to build that out, 
but they're confirming so that I can have that capability and be able to start a fresh new interaction in the environment. Once we get the environment set up, then we're going to go in and look at some applications, how they come right out of the box available to us. And with those applications, we'll show you what you could eventually build out as, as customizations. And those will be available to you to, to input you know, your unique, obviously your company's information down the road, but all of this available to you in a, in a practice environment is what we're uh, creating today. Okay, we received our email, took just a couple of minutes. Once we click on verifying this account, then Salesforce allows us to create a password and put in a security question. And so I'm going to do that obviously off camera here for the moment and get those put in place, but it gives you how many characters would be important to you usually it's at least eight characters and uh, at least one number and then I'm entering that in now and you can do that then answering a security question and these are all designed you can understand right that these are designed to help you have availability to a secure environment for your Salesforce instance. And once I've created that, then this is the splash page that uh, comes available to me. I'm going to move on from those are welcome introductory uh, stages but notice that Salesforce immediately is uh, ready to show you all the buttons everything that's available and we're going to take it to the time to do that live I'm going to save this to favorites to my bookmarks and put that as a demo for myself and you may want to do the same and now it will be saved for my future learning capability so I remember what's in my interaction capabilities but here's here's the original setup page that would be available to you I went to the developer.salesforce.com. I uh, entered in and filled out the information that I needed. And now I have an org, a developer org, that's available to me. Notice it's defaulted to a setup environment. This is the administrator's interface. So you are the administrator of your org. There is a user interface and we'll be discussing that in future lessons but notice it's defaulted to the home page of setup we have an app launcher also known as the waffle that allows me to choose other apps and we mentioned that in lesson one and we'll go and explore those in future lessons it allows me to manage each of the objects that are currently right out of the box that are standard in my organization and then as I click back on the home tab I have multiple interaction points 
here on this left hand menu bar and you'll see as we walk through this together over the next several lessons this is consistent that the menu bar is on the left hand side and then the workspace the real estate where you'll do your work or have your learning interaction is here in the middle this can be customized and you can walk through and adjust those as you learn your tool and as you walk through with us for details but for this lesson here's a logo space that you could customize for your company's logo the search environment that is a global Einstein uh, actionable search environment your profile interface to view your profile notifications of your chat uh, groups and stream uh, interfaces your setup uh, gear help information for every page in Salesforce trailhead further trainings in the Salesforce environment and customizable in-app learning for your users that you can set up global actions that allow you to do everything from logging a call to creating a new task to creating an email we'll walk through all of those and then a favorites uh, window that allows you to have drop downs for pages that you frequent most often in the Salesforce world in your org all of this will make much more sense to you as we unwrap and walk through the steps provided uh, in the next lessons but in the sales console as one of the apps this is the out-of-box default of potential capabilities of your sales team seeing everything from their dashboards of their performance their calendar and events their tasks they need to follow up on recent records that they've looked at key deals and opportunities that they're processing Salesforce will have pop-ups for you where you can do more uh, learning and walk through those if you so choose Salesforce has an uh, artificial intelligence running in the background that will promote for you and lead you to uh, assisting being assisted with next steps in most current opportunities and what you need to be as a user be tracking and so each of these applications have records and objects attached to them and here's where you can customize and make available to your users depending on whether they're a service employee whether they're a sales employee that needs to follow contacts all of this information is right out of the box ready to be uh, interacted with and in our coming lessons we'll show you step by step how to leverage and customize this powerful tool to add value to your employees. That will promote for you and lead you to uh, assisting, being assisted with next steps in most current opportunities and what you need to be as a user be tracking 
And so each of these applications have records and objects attached to them. And here's where you can customize and make available to your users, depending on whether they're a service employee, whether they're a sales employee that needs to follow contacts. All of this information is right out of the box, ready to be uh, interacted with. And in our coming lessons, we'll show you step by step how to leverage and customize this powerful tool to add value lesson two. So thanks for joining in and continuing to be a part of where we're headed in your journey for Salesforce. We're going to get into user setup and really putting on our admin hat and begin to look at the power of and the capability of the position of the Salesforce administrator and how this tool can be leveraged. So let's get started. The learning objectives for this lesson, after completing this, you should be able to explain what an org is and the related terms. And that's a basic understanding and a starting point. And then two, be able to discuss what a user is, what's the difference between roles and profiles, how that fits together. The short answer is a user is a person that logs into your org. Uh, roles are what people are able to see the visibility in the org and their profiles are what they're, they're able to do the capable of the capability of accessing and, and uh, completing duties what they can do in the org number three you should be able to look at the different and understand and and even list the different types of profiles there are there are standard and customized and as the admin you understanding that capability will be a great benefit and then understanding profile control how the parameters are set up how the parameters are set up and the importance of security and who can do what in your org. So the organizational introduction. We're going to start broad based and then we're going to narrow down and tighten up what's important for you. So the organization in your Salesforce existence in instance is displaying the details of the company that you're working for. So literally you have the capability of setting up the org name, the primary contact, the division, the address and the phone number. And this is the main point of reference for your Salesforce connectivity. When it comes out of the box, there are defaults that are put in place. And that's the original interface, the first person, the, the first setup as you log in originally. So 
we're going to look at this from the PowerPoint scenario, and then we're going to dive down deeper. And in a couple of separate demos, we'll show you this live in the org. But the Salesforce.com organization. ID is the unique identifier, unique identifier for your org. Every single Salesforce org on the planet has its own unique identifier, and that's another way of keeping security and keeping uh, scalability. And your org is unique to your company. There is a default locale that comes out of the box, and this data helps solidify and visualize you know, where you're located on the globe. There's also a default language. These can be customized, but uh, when you're originally setting up your org, you have the capability of choosing which language would be the default language for your org, as well as the time zone. And if you think about it, it all makes sense that your unique org and your uh, unique part of the world and the primary language that your users would be using is where you want to start. And then you can give users other capabilities as needed. So looking at your company setup for the first time, and again, we're going to look at this uh, in a demo example here in our next representations, but you would start by Clicking on Setup, going to the Home Settings, scrolling down or typing in the word Company, and it will take you to, or you can scroll briefly down to the Company Information section and click on that. That will allow you, when you're in that window, to set up things like business hours, which are important because some companies really want to uh, reduce and constrict when employees could log in. For example, a telemarketing business typically will be Monday through Friday during business hours, and then they wouldn't really have a need to log in on the weekends. So each organization, based on their operating hours, can set those up unique to your scenario and then you could have multiple business hours maybe some days it's eight to five other days it's uh nine to noon and then those times can be set as a default they come out of the box and then you can set those up that works best for you and your company then the business hours can be tracked. And so when people are logging in and when they have access, you could use this as uh, part of the key performance indicators, the KPIs. So you know they're logging in during certain hours and you can report on that and then you can show how much productivity happens during those logged in hours, it just gives you another way in which you can put metrics and analytics to the value of this platform. In addition to language and hours and uh, those time frames, you can set up calendars. And there is a public calendar scenario to track the groups, the marketing events, when there's product releases, when there's training, and schedule activities that impact all of your users, employees of your business. And then you can track uh, usage of resources within your organization, like conference rooms, uh, specific tools, and you as administrator, in collaboration with your resource teams, can set this up so that it's readily accessible to everyone in your organization. Uh, here's a screenshot of what calendars look like and what you would be able to access and adjust as needed. Salesforce, in addition to this setup area and use uh, aligning what's best for your organization, which are all editable, they're not one and done, 
But in addition to that, Salesforce provides three releases every year. And these are releases that enhance your org. So this uh, at this recording, we're just coming through a new release. And there have been, it's over 600 pages of the workbook that, the electronic workbook that Salesforce provided for us that would enable new enhancements. And each of those releases uh, three times a year are in your best interest. And, and as a, the primary resource for your company, being aware of those and tracking those and then leveraging those are going to help your users uh, on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. This is important for different types of organizations, whether they're financial or they're nonprofit. It may be that your year, your fiscal year, is different than a calendar, a normal January to December calendar year, based on, again, your part of the world and where you're tracking your beginning and ending of your year. But the fiscal year plays a vital role in your financial reports, your transactions, forecasts, and quotas. And so you can choose. Uh, there is a default and there's a standard physical, fiscal year. And then you can customize that for your organization. Just please be aware once you customize your fiscal year and it's enabled in your org, then you can't disable it. So here's another reason to have a team, to have advisors around you, and for your leadership to be comfortable with what's the best scenario for your fiscal year. Here's the actual page snapshot of that uh, part of setup. And it's just showing that you can make those customizations as important to your organization. In addition to the calendar fiscal year, there's obviously holidays. And these are dates where business hours could be scheduled uh, and suspended or adjusted. And you can make those customizations right here. This doesn't have to be sent out anywhere else. Uh, no one else in Salesforce uh, ecosystem has to be involved with this. This is just you and your team and you setting up what's best for your business practices right in your org. I briefly mentioned at the outset we were talking about uh, language settings for uh, your organization. So you can set multiple uh, language scenarios and based on the locations that you would be interacting with and especially now that we've transitioned more into a re remote environment, you have that capability of allowing different language scenarios. So you can set up a language uh, for the whole platform. You can enable languages for individual users if that's their preference. And you have those capabilities. And this is a snapshot of the page that would allow that in your setup org. In addition to those customizations, you're going to have, uh, again, out of the box, uh, a domain that's in place. But you could customize that and set up your company name, uh, .my.salesforce.com. And that can be deployed so that you, again, add additional security to your environment or customizations uh, that would be appropriate. And that would be your choice in your organization and you can impact that as an administrator. Here's the page where that could be done and obviously you could click the edit button and make those adjustments. Now in user setup, so we're moving quickly through what are your capabilities, your opportunities as the resource provided. And in user setup, I mentioned at the outset, a user is a person that has an authenticated username and a password, and they are able to log in to your org. 
this could be all different types of users. So there may be sales engineers, there may be administrators, there may be managers, uh, other employees in the org that have uh, need for and access to the Salesforce platform. I would recommend in this little box here where it says admin that you reduce and keep to a minimum who has that profile and who is an system administrator because they have broad capabilities of modifying any and all uh, platform records. So just heads up, don't have too many administrators in your org. So profiles are the way in which we can uh, give capabilities to our users. And so a profile is a collection of settings and permissions that define how the user can access different records. And so the profile controls what permissions. So there's a baseline that's out of the box for all users. And then as they are uh, added to a profile scenario, then they could have different types of functionalities, and that would just make sense. A an HR department user would probably have different needs or accessibility to a new newly hired salesperson. So a sales profile would typically be different than an HR profile, but the profile can have many different users. You can assign multiple users to a profile, but the user can only have one profile assigned to them. They can be moved to a different profile, but each user must be assigned to that profile capability. So here's some different types of profiles. There's obviously standard profiles that come right out of the box. These are provided with force.com and they can't be deleted. But then you will be able to create custom profiles as you understand the capabilities as your company grows, as there's more needs, more business units. The admin can create and delete if there's no users assigned. If Once there's a user assigned to that profile, then if you tried to delete it, Salesforce would pop an uh, error window and let you know you would have to remove that person so that there's no one in that profile. And a little key note here, the best practice when it comes to users, we don't delete users from the org, we simply deactivate them. And that will, that will make more sense to you the more you're utilizing this tool. But the point is, if someone was deleted and there were records attached to them, then that's not number one, it's not best practice number two someone would need to be assigned all those accounts those contacts those opportunities those cases and so it just makes sense that deactivating that individual user would allow the records that, to then be transferred so we're moving quickly through what are your capabilities your opportunities as the resource provided and in user setup I mentioned at the outset, a user is a person that has an authenticated username and a password and they are able to log in to your org. This could be all different types of users. So there may be sales engineers, there may be administrators, there may be managers, uh, other employees in the org that have uh, need for and access to the Salesforce platform. I would recommend in this little box here where it says admin that you reduce and keep to a minimum who has that profile and who is an system administrator because they have broad capabilities of modifying any and all uh, platform records so just heads up don't have too many administrators in your org so profiles are the way in which we can uh, give capabilities to our users. And so a profile is a collection of settings and permissions that define how the user can access different records. And so the profile controls what permissions. 
So there's a baseline that's out of the box for all users, and then as they are uh, added to a profile scenario, then they could have different types of functionalities, and that would just make sense. A An HR department user would probably have different needs or accessibility to a new newly hired salesperson. So a sales profile would typically be different than an HR profile. But the profile can have many different users. You can assign multiple users to a profile, but the user can only have one profile assigned to them. They can be moved to a different profile, but each user must be assigned to that profile capability. So here's some different types of profiles. There's obviously standard profiles that come right out of the box. These are provided with at force.com and they can't be deleted. But then you will be able to create custom profiles as you understand the capabilities as your company grows, as there's more needs, more business units, the admin can create and delete if there's no users assigned. If Once there's a user assigned to that profile, then if you tried to delete it, Salesforce would pop an uh, error window and let you know you would have to remove that person so that there's no one in that profile. And a little key note here, the best practice when it comes to users, we don't delete users from the org, we simply deactivate them. And that will, that will make more sense to you the more you're utilizing this tool. But the point is, if someone was deleted and there were records attached to them, then that's not number one, it's not best practice. Number two, someone would need to be assigned all those accounts, those contacts, those opportunities, those cases. And so it just makes sense that deactivating that individual user would allow the records th to then be transferred and we'll discuss that in a future lesson. So creating users and the power and the effectiveness and the how-to in creating users. Again, we're, sh we're showing you snapshots here in our demo uh, recordings. We'll go into the live org but you would use that in the upper right hand corner of your home page as an administrator, you would see the gear icon. Once you click on that, you would choose the setup interface. Once you're in setup, really it's usually just down below. You can see in the quick find box, but typically it's just uh, not even uh, more than 10 uh, placeholders down and then once you click on users then you would have access to the page that allows you to click on the new user button and now you can type in sp that specific information notice that any uh, field with a red bar would ha would be required but you'll find that uh, the more information you can put in it's going to long term it's going to make uh, better capabilities, better responses, uh, just a cleaner data information for love each it. of those users in place. And as you're putting in, typing in, uh, some of the yeah. bars, they automatically fill in, like the alias would fill in, the username would fill in, uh, the nickname. Typically, you don't have to do all that typing, but you may... Uh, based on your your best practices for your organization, want to make sure that those are uh, appropriate and clean and uh, best reflect what the user dynamic is. And then on the right hand side column, there are again there's that profile that's required. Notice that the role has a default in it, uh, and there there is a non specified in place and a, a record could be saved with that information but it cannot be saved without having a specific profile chosen so roles and profiles let's dive a little bit deeper into roles and profiles 
also a role to find the data visibility. So I said that before, but repeat it again. The role of a person is not required, especially if you have a hierarchy like you see this little diagram below. The VP of sales would have more visibility into all the areas below him where each of these managers would only see the records reflected in their area. The VP would see all of those in this hierarchy because his role would be at a higher level of the hierarchy. And then the default is a baseline visibility. So right out of the box when you first log in to your instance, there are defaults in place, but then you can customize those and you can privatize and limit and uh, basically set up what's in the best interest. It's not a one and done. It's, it is fully editable over time, but it's uh, depending on your business format, then you can reflect those and who can see what in your organization by customizing them. So the out of the overall organizational wide default is typically here's an example. So the opportunities, which are the, remember those are the business deals, are typically set to private, and that would make sense because each salesperson or each uh, service person, if they're setting up an opportunity, they need to focus on that, and it's typically their or part of their business flow. But accounts are typically set up where they're public read write, and so that a user can update that account information, and that makes sense because an account is a business or a company that you're doing business with, and maybe their location changes. Maybe one company purchases another company and a name changes and the individual users that are in the sales environment or the service environment, they would know that first and so they can update those accounts as needed. Now the type of standard profiles that come out of the box I'm going to first refer to system administrator. And remember, I, I mentioned that you want to minimize how many people you have that profile because this person is a super user that can customize, they can see and modify, edit, customize anything in the entire application. So I would recommend minimizing this. It, it might be good to have more than just one system administrator, although that would be totally up to you, but having 10 administrators, unless your org is phenomenally huge, would not be a best practice. Then, of course, there's a standard user, and this profile can view, edit, delete their own records. They can run reports. They can view setup, but they can't manage they can't even view all of the parts of setup like you can as an administrator. They can access campaigns, but they can't manage campaigns. That takes a special license uh, pro uh, profile permission. Uh, they can create, but they can't review solutions. And typically, that's just a standard business practice that Salesforce has observed over time, over multiple client bases. And so that's your standard user. Then as a solution manager, so this permission, they can do what the standard user can do, plus they can manage published solutions, they can manage solution categories. So this is someone who's bringing answers to the organization, and so they would need those type of capabilities. The marketing user has all the standard user capabilities, in their profile uh, administration, but they can also import leads for the organization. And that would make sense because if they're constantly reaching out and trying to expand the business horizons, then they would need that capability. A contract manager has all the capabilities of a standard user profile, but they can edit, approve, 
active, uh, activate and delete contracts. So you can see that uh, these different profiles, including the read-only profile, this person would only be able to view records. And so this is a minimal type entry level where they couldn't adjust or change, uh, update any of the records, but they could at least view them. So that gives you a, an overview of the profiles. And then, of course, you can customize those profiles. And that's what this screenshot is showing. You can have uh, enterprise developers. You can have custom profiles if you're in the enterprise developer and unlimited systems you can customize what the needs are and name it what you want it to be and we recommend the best practice is to uh, leverage an existing profile clone it and then modify that profile so you don't have to create it from scratch uh, you'll see as you begin to work in your org that's going to be saving you multiple, multiple steps. So here's a couple of uh, screenshots from, again, when we're going into the setup and we're, we're going on the quick find and we're scrolling down and we're looking under users, we can click on profiles and it will show you here's what's out of the box. And the ones that uh, are checked would be custom profiles that you're creating just gives you a good overview of what's available and then you could click on the clone button to simply modify it rather than creating it from scratch so clicking on the new profile allows you to clone that so custom profiles will have the check boxes and you determine what name is provided for that profile and it's customizable by you and these profile controls include the way pages are laid out in the organ and how they appear to the user the user interface it also determines field level security so a field is uh, a box where records are typed in or uploaded into so it's a dynamic uh, digital uh, input window or box and the profile controls that as well as the custom apps that are uh, viewable accessible and can be uh, updated uh, profiles also the tabs that we at the top of that user screen Profiles control record types, the type of login capability, and any other uh, administrative or general uh, object permissions that the administrator would add to. But to summarize what we tried to show you in this lesson, you have capabilities of, of viewing the organizational defaults and, and then you can customize details about the company and who's the point main point of contact as an admin you can add new users and those are uh, individuals that have the capability of logging into your org and can be in sales engineers and managers administrators or other employees of your organization those users would have to be assigned a profile and profiles are standard or customized each user can have a role that would give them visibility and as an example a VP would have more visibility than sales managers because that's his role in the org and then the types of standard profiles include system administrator standard users marketing users and even a simple read only user and those profiles limit and provide accessibility based on uh, 
what those permissions are inside of that profile, but you can customize those and create custom profiles uh, after the best practice to clone the standard and then uh, make your additional customizations and then name it what you want and save it as a profile existing or new users. Thank you for your time. We look forward to seeing you in our next lesson. All right, for demo three, we're focusing on customizing profiles and users. We looked at last time where we can find the users and the profiles. We're simply going to set up. And by the way, if you're in the, the app launcher environment and you're in the sales console app as an administrator, which you'll be looking at both sides. This is the user interface and your users will be here and in their accounts and their opportunities. And they very rarely go here, which is more the administrator environment in the setup world. But once you choose setup, then you're gonna have access to uh, a quick find menu which would include, as I scroll down, like, like we looked at in previous demos, your user environment, and then adjustments that could be made or edits that could make, be made from this menu. So I'm gonna click on users, and once we make, make the choice to go to the user environment, this is the default screen for adding users we looked at where to go in lesson two to create new users now if these users needed to be edited so notice i have a minimal amount of users in this test org and only one system administrator and for editing capabilities i simply click on the blue edit link and you'll notice that Anything in blue that is underlined is a direct link. And then I can scroll down on this interface and make adjustments as necessary if I needed to include a street address, if I needed to add or generate a new password. So again, we mentioned in our earlier lessons, we never see what the passwords are. But if this individual has forgotten their password, then we can go to their user interface, click generate new password, and this will send them an email that would allow them to update their password and make that correct adjustment. So any of these fields could be edited, and then when we click the save button, then that record is saved as needed. Similarly, in the profiles environment, when I'm here in the setup page and I want to adjust or edit a profile I've com completed, remember, we can't delete a profile if there are users assigned to it, but notice that I can come to the edit button, click on edit, and now any field that's open or any check marks that would need to be made could be adjusted here. And notice the scroll bar on the right hand side. There are a lot of adjustments, a lot of updates that could be made. We're going to recommend that you, you check your profiles the first time you do it, that you spend time testing and you can go into your sandbox environment and or have users test out what you set up for them and then save it uh, as an update and then come back because 
if it's not allowing them uh, to do their job more efficiently, then the profile could be adjusted for that group of users and or that user could be moved to another profile that may better suit their needs. Regardless, you have multiple capabilities both with users and prof with profiles and you can see the importance of the administrator position and the best practice that only a few users in your organization would have this capability. Okay, that concludes customizing profiles and users. Look for us next Okay, in this brief demo, we wanted to take the opportunity to follow up with lesson two and show you the profile and role creation capabilities that you have. So I've logged into my test development org and it defaulted because I'm the administrator, it defaulted to the setup environment and the home tab and there's quick find that I could type in information but notice right as you scroll down and look down this menu list there are users data and email drop downs available so by clicking on the carrot next to users I'll just scroll down just a little bit you can see now permission set groups, permission sets, profiles, public groups, queues, roles, user management settings, and users. So these are all the different capabilities that you have as the subject matter expert and the administrator of your org. So let's start with roles. Remember roles are what the user can see, what they have visibility in. So I'm going to click on roles and notice it defaults to the first time you enter uh, this environment. It shows you you can set up your role hierarchy to control how your organization reports and accesses data. So it's giving you an example of the executive would have more visibility than the downstream or downline so this international rep would be able to see their records and get forecasting information opportunity pipelines but this executive would have visibility of all these users because they report up to them so I'm going to click on set up roles and you can see right now there's a capability of expanding or collapsing each of those roles but notice there are hierarchies in place and if I click add role the screen it gives me is now the capability of putting whatever label I wanted to and the role name and who it reports to and then as you move down that list notice that there are other options that I can show that this reports to and then as I build those out notice I've expanded those out and these different roles would roll up to that CEO position and then you can edit assign individual users to those roles as needed this is very, very helpful in allowing different territories and uh, different users to be aligned with either their sales role, their service role, their training role, their marketing role inside your org. Then when it comes to profiles, so you notice the menu is still available to us and when I click on profiles, now we have some standard right out of the box 
specific to this org profiles that include analytical cloud security user chatter free users uh, and then custom profiles that are specific to your org so as you scroll down you may see that there are when when you start out in your original org there would be probably fewer than these profiles because there have been custom we've added custom profiles but then you can make the customization and notice that we said uh, best practice rather than trying to create and start over again you basically find uh, a profile that works well in your organization and then you clone that so for example if I wanted to look at this analytics security user and I click on clone it allows me to name that and then once I save it here's all the different types of capabilities as you're scrolling down you can give the different tabs that are assigned to that profile you can make them hidden or defaulted on or off you can move into their administrative positions and give them uh, different types of uh, whether it's viewing records with PLL or general permissions where they would have different accessibilities uh, based on those permission sets and then the standard object permissions and you can see that by cloning you can uncheck or check what's already existing for you and save the record including their session settings their uh, password policies and then choose to save that for your newly customized profile rather than trying to recreate all of that from scratch all right that's a quick look at the profile and the role creation Look for us next time. Thank you for joining us for lesson three of our Salesforce study together. A lot to cover. In lesson three because this is referring to Salesforce data as you might imagine there is a wealth of information so let's get started here's our learning objectives so by the end of this very important interface after completing this lesson you should be able to one explain standard and custom objects to explain the fields that can be created or come right out of the box with standard and custom objects. We call them custom and standard fields. Be able to define dependencies because these fields can interact with each other for the benefit of your users. Number four, define data types. So there are different types of data points, data records, data objects that are available to you. Number five, how to validate that data. So Salesforce allows us to set parameters, set uh, functionality that would allow you as administrator and leaders in your organization to validate what your users are providing on a daily basis. Number six, you should be able to discuss the relationship with data modeling. So there are multiple types, again, of standard 
and customizable relationships that allow you to set the model uh, in the best interest of your business functions. Number seven, create fields and relationships using Schema Builder. So Schema Builder is a tool that those of you who are in the IT field will feel very comfortable with interacting with basically pictorial representations of the data flow inside your org. So starting with standard and custom objects, Salesforce data. First of all, an object is a database table that allows us to store data specific to our organization in our Salesforce environment. But you can imagine that if all of our users had to interact with tables on a regular basis, it would be very difficult for them if they have little or no background in the IT environment. Or if they weren't used to Excel spreadsheets, normal human interaction for multiple positions that would be using our tool would have a very difficult time leveraging the data and reporting on the data and synchronizing the data. So objects in Salesforce allow us to have these relationships in a, a user beneficial interface. So our users, no matter what part of our business functionality they're responsible for, can have a customized and a mutually benefit interaction. So these objects allow us to organize customer information, for those people that we are supporting as a business, sales related activities, leads, which again, remember, are those new, never before interacted with business individuals or business organizations. We haven't started business with them yet, but we want to organize our relationships with them. And then anything that helps us to track or automate business processes, this is what objects are in the Salesforce environment. So there are standard objects that come right out of the box with your original purchase of this tool. And there are custom objects that you can create that as your team collaborates and you learn how to leverage this tool, you can create for yourself objects that are unique to your business and that will influence and impact and enhance the capability of tracking relationships that are going to be mutually beneficial. So here are some standard objects provided by Salesforce. This is not an exhaustive list but an important list. So accounts are very important because remember, these are the employers. These are the businesses that we're doing business with. And in those accounts, there are contacts, individuals who we can interact with and bring again, this mutual benefit that allows us to conduct business campaigns, which are groups of these contacts or accounts that we can follow up on. Cases, opportunities, which are the business deals, solutions. We've, we've talked about these in previous lessons, but reports, ideas, and leads, these all come built in and in a environment that you could interact with and start business from day one. Then you as an administrator and your team, your stakeholders can discuss and create custom objects and you can allow users in your organization as they have needs to have interaction with and actually create some of these custom objects 
for their individual needs. An object is the heart of any application. It's the core of what's going to allow you to continue to iterate and enhance your business. Objects determine the questions that can be included so that you become more and more effective in your business processes. Custom objects provide structure for storing the data and you'll see as we begin to discuss and focus on this, if all you had were tables like Excel spreadsheet tables, it would be very frustrating to be able to refer back and keep historical records that could be synchronized in the way these custom fields and relationships to other objects and even the page layouts of these objects can be of benefit to each of your users and the user groups, the business units that will be using this. So let's do a deeper dive into custom objects and how they're created in this ecosphere. These next several screens are going to show you screenshots of how you would walk through creating custom objects. And then after we've completed this in-depth discussion, we'll present demonstration videos that give you a basic overview of everything we'll discuss a line by line in these screens. So first of all, to get to the creation mode, we would go to Setup, Object Manager tab, and here's in the upper right hand corner where you find that in your Salesforce environment. And when you click on Object Manager, you'll see this available window below which displays the objects that have come standard out of the box like this object accounts here at the bottom of your screen and then as you create these custom objects they'll be saved in alphabetical order and you'll be able to quick find them by simply typing in the name of the object you're looking for. So when you click on the create button from the drop down arrow, you'll be able to start the process of creating a new custom object. And notice that any field that has a red bar on the left hand side will be required to save that newly created custom object and you'll have the capability of entering a label name, the plural of that name, what you want the object to be called, and then other required related details as you need. We would recommend the best practice, including a description of this object, so you can refer back to it more easily, and then other administrators and or delegated individuals would be able to follow and understand what was created. The singular and plural labels are, are part of this creation and it makes sense you'll understand as you use the tool that those capabilities and those interactions are going to be best practices as other people interact with what you created and you are able to share with other leaders and administrators the processes that you're building. So historically, you'll have that continuing flow of collaboration. The API reference will be important for the back of the house interaction and updates or edits that you need in the future. So those will be part of your nomenclature and creativity as you develop each of these objects. Some optional features 
that will be important moving forward and are important to understand today, you can allow reports to be created on this object when you check this radio button in this box. If you want activities, so your users would be creating activities from their perspective once you create this object and you can record activities. For example, opportunities need to have activities associated with them so you could track the flow of the business processes in a functional way. So think about as you're creating these custom objects, do you need to track the individual fields? Do you need to allow chatter groups to discuss this object and relate to it in the future? Keep in mind that this will be editable in the future. So if today you don't check these boxes as you created this, then in the future you'll be able to refer back to this and update it and edit and add those features as needed. To classify this object and allow for more interaction, you can check these boxes or uncheck them as needed if you want them to be shared or not. If you want to allow bulk API access, if you want to allow streaming API access, you can check or uncheck these buttons. Notice that some of them are in a default mode. That as you practice and get more proficient, you'll be able to immediately uh, assess what's most important for that object and make those decisions more easily. But from the very beginning, you'll have this capability and then be able to edit it as you have needs in the future. So if you want this to be in a development mode, what you're creating today, if you simply want to have access to the capabilities, you could check the radio button next to in development, and this would give you more time. And so if there isn't a time frame or a deadline that's immediate, then you'll have much more time to allow yourself to develop it further when you check the radio button. But on the other hand, if you need this deployed very quickly, if the senior executives or uh, stakeholders need this effective immediately, you definitely would want to check deployed. And don't get frustrated if you've forgotten which you checked. You can come back to this and adjust it right from your setup environment and that those object pages in the future. Importantly, you would want to check this radio button uh, to allow searching in that object and to allow it to be searched on by your users to be able to access it in the future. Additionally, if you want, and probably most importantly, if you want a tab created, most of our users don't really relate to the term object. They're, they really don't even uh, need to or want to know what's in the background, but if there's not a tab for them to access from their user interface, they wouldn't really even know that it's available to them. So you definitely want would want to check this button if you want to create a tab that is relative to and available to your users. And then of course, we always want to save our work. So clicking on the save button allows every, all the creation steps to be activated. So if you want it to create a custom object from a spreadsheet. So for example, if you had uh, multiple fields that you wanted to make available quickly, you could 
instead of manually, like we just discussed, walk through each of those steps, you could check create custom object from a spreadsheet and whether it's your local personal computer, a Google Sheet, or a 365 document, you can access those environments to allow you to import multiple data points and would obviously enhance and speed up the process of creating custom objects. This is a new feature, feature in Salesforce Lightning, so we would have to allow access, so you may get this pop-up that would allow you to click on the allow button to provide this capability. Whenever you're uploading any one of these spreadsheet type documents, you will have to map the fields in that document with the available fields in Salesforce. And so be prepared to match those as needed, just like you would in any simple uh, basic wizard environment. So when you click the finish button, then you've got the process in place and you've created something that now could be usable in this object environment for your Salesforce users. We mentioned tabs, and so let's take a deeper dive into what a tab looks like in the Salesforce environment. This is, like we mentioned, the user interface component. And we create this so there is a display interaction with that custom object we've created. And this could be a web content application or an object that we created but every tab serves as a starting point for viewing and editing and inner information for that particular object for our users. And when we click that tab at the top of the page, it will re relate to us and expose for us a home page that we could, again, enter information or utilize in our business flow. So here are the different types of tabs. There are custom object tabs, like we just discussed that you can create either manually or from uploading spreadsheets. There are web tabs that you could interact and uh, connect to and make part of your org. There's lightning component tabs, lightning page tabs, Visual Force tabs, these are all, depending on what your business unit needs, these are all objects that, for example, many marketing teams use Visual Force tabs because they can be ad interacted with and leveraged for marketing capabilities. The Lightning component and the Lightning page is two ways that data is made relative to and open and available for our users and you'll have the capability of creating and customizing those as well. So here's how we create these tabs for our users. Going to again our setup button, the home menu, typing in platform tools or simply scrolling down to platform tools in our menu, expanding the user face interview and clicking on tabs. So the menu will be on the left hand side and when you access the tabs click point then you'll have the custom tab page open up for you. So custom tabs are what we can create to give unique style and a unique 
choice for our users. We can restrict or allow users with specific profiles to use specific tabs. That way they can focus their effort. We can keep the user interface clean and very applicable to specific profiles. Many of our profiles have by default objects that are available for them and then we can choose whether this tab we're creating is applicable and visible to only to certain profiles or if we want all of our profiles to have access. And once we click, click next, after we've made these choices, we'll move on to the next screen. Then we can, in this screen, we can choose which application we want to include with this tab. So applications, remember, are the collection of objects. So if we have a sales team and we want them to have certain objects to get their jobs done, it's all the same data running in the background, but now we can give each of these different marketing, high volume, customer access points, sales teams, service teams, we can grant them specific object tabs that will help them in their business flow. And when we're creating a web tab and we click on new for that web tab, then we'll have the capability of creating a full page tab that gives you full visibility to that tab area. Or we can create a two column interface that includes Salesforce functions, uh, for example, on the left-hand side, that would be accessible to them to get to other objects right from this web tab page. When we want to and need to create a label for this custom tab, then we'll see that, again, anything with a red bar on the left-hand side would be required, and we can choose by the search icon what tab style would fit best and match. It's totally your option, but will allow your users to have something specific to and that's important to them to interact with. When we pick that style, and that content frame, then that allows that user group, that profile, to have that specific capability. Then we, if we're creating this web tab, tab and we want a URL available, then we click the Save button after we've dropped that in, but this is where we're choosing that specific URL that would access that website for that tab. Always remember to click Save. If we're creating a Visual Force tab, then we're clicking on that new button, and similarly, we'll be able to choose tab styles for the Visual Force page, and select again, profiles as needed, and the tab we want connected to and associated with this Visual Force tab, and then save our work. The similar process works for Lightning tab components, and so we're clicking on the new button, we're choosing tabs and designating names for the component, and then clicking save. Same process applies for the Lightning Page tab. Again, the New button, choosing Tab Labels, Tab Styles, and Saving.
So now let's move on to fields. That was an important discussion about the tabs. Now let's dive even deeper. Each of these objects have fields. And like we discussed at the very beginning in lesson one, a field is similar to a database column. And object fields store the data for our records. So again, if all we had were these spreadsheet views, then our users would get frustrated if they needed to refer back, needed to keep historical, archivable, reportable details. But Salesforce provides for us standard fields that we don't have to create them. We won't be able to delete them. They don't need an API address name. But when you create custom fields, you will be able to uniquely create them and or delete them. And they will have a unique identifier, an API name that could be referred back to in the future. So custom objects will have some standard fields automatically included and they are a part of as, as soon as you save any custom object that you create these four standard fields your name as the creator your name as the owner the person who modified it and then the name of the record that you've created obviously if you have uh, administrators that follow up or and or you need to adjust what you created in the future then these fields could be updated but you can't edit standard fields and that makes sense because they would need to be audited from the beginning and so these actual fields themselves can't be changed they're part of the metadata right out of the box. So here are different types of fields that will be available to you and generated for you from the beginning. First of all, an auto number field. And this is a generated sequence number that maybe one of your business units needs that sequential data to be available on their object you'll be able to leverage the checkbox field so that if uh, an item needs to be recorded as true or false, a check or unchecking that box would allow users to establish that record. Currency fields that you can change what type currency is available and then amounts are put in in that currency value the date and then the date time so these are fields that are important to keep accurate records of how users are leveraging that object and these will all make much more sense when we show you a demonstration and then when you begin to use what you've created there are email fields so that a, an email address can be provided and then validation rules could be applied so that we have the right format for those email addresses. Number fields. So this allows, these fields will allow users to enter any number with leading zeros removed percent field so percentages can be added to objects phone numbers pick list values and this is probably one of the most used fields because pick lists can be uh, validated they can be selected by our users and it saves click time and typing in titles or names or choices and are very uh, applicable 
applicable to business flows. More fields that are available are multi-select pick lists. So for example, if you had a nation and then you needed a subset of states, then these multi-select pick lists would be available to you. Text fields that allow any combination, alpha, numeric, characters, so that if our users needed uh, a one-line text field to enter in a short definition or uh, address, then text fields could be used. Text areas allow for larger space. Instead of just one line, you could add separate lines, additional lines. And then the text long area will allow over 30,000 keystrokes, characters. So this would be for an, a longer explanation. Uh, many times our users use this to copy and paste from another interface a long description of uh, necessary items in an object. And then a text ri rich field would allow our users to add text values with format added and images and links so that it's accessible to and can be interacted with when the object is saved or updated and just allows for more collaboration and interaction because of what you've created. Different types of fields. So there are text encrypted fields, very, very useful for information that would need to be specified, but would need to be hidden from view of other users or uh, interface that would be specific but should not be shared. So like a social security number or a unique identifier number that combinations of letters and numbers could be put in this field but then could be encrypted. And then a URL field uh, like we showed earlier when you're creating a web tab you could allow for valid website addresses to be entered and that's especially available and important for accounts so the businesses that have a website users would be able to copy and paste into these URL fields that important information So now, how are these fields created? What are the steps that allow us to create these fields? Again, from the setup environment, we go to Object Manager. We select the object that you want to create these fields in. And you can scroll down and or type in a quick find search box, this object. And then when you click on that object choice in this menu, then your first option is the fields and relationship interaction. And once you click on that, you'll be able to access what types of fields you want created and then what's already available to you. So you can click on the new button and or use the drop down to edit these fields remember though it's important to note we can't delete standard fields they're right out of the box they're part of the core of your environment in this instance and custom fields are flexible and we can create and edit them per the requirements of our org and what our stakeholders stakeholders need so here's the detail page of creating and what's required when we click edit at the top of this window then we can 
make the edits as needed. If we want the field to be required when a user is saving information, then we can choose the radio button next to required. If there's validation rules that are attached to and are part of this object, we can include them here and create them if needed using the new button. We would first of all choose the field type so you can see on the left hand side when you click the, the radio button whether you need a checkbox type field or a date field. This is where you make those choices of the type field you want to create. Then whichever one of those fields we chose then we would enter field attributes again if we want it required if we want to uh, force the uh, identification of duplicate values and not allow them to be saved then we can make those choices as the administrator on this page profiles that we choose would then control the field permissions so we would choose the profile that we want to have access to this field and when we make those choices you'll notice that some of them by default are checked and you may need to uncheck or check as capable and or check the read only if that's the choices you need for that specific profile and the access level they would need. Then to add this field to an account layout, then we have this capability so that the field that you're creating would be attachable and become part of this object. And then we choose save anew or save as or go back if we need to adjust and move forward to the next step. The API name for these custom creations. This is what allows us in a formula field and or a program to have this uniquely identified field accessible and a part of business flows we would create. So the API name, the field name equals the customer name, the API name would be customer underscore name underscore underscore C. And so the, this is a unique identifier that can be viewed can be related to uh, future needs and behind the scenes in expanding, developing, uh, increasing the capability for our users. So the global pick list. So this is an overview of accessibility to pick lists that you could view and access from any place in the org and that would impact uh, data from anywhere in the org. So it's restricted so you can't have it unlimited. Only the Salesforce admin can add to it, modify it. So users can't use unapproved values and e even through the API environment the global pick list can be created to standardize, uh, for example, list of cities. That way, every time the data, both on the new customer, existing customer objects are updated, the city global pick list will show a standard list of choices. So it makes it easier to enter data and prevents redundant data from input. So if users had to type in a city name, every time they were entering, uh, searching, looking for 
saving a, a city name, it would be a nightmare. So when you create a pick list, it's a drop down. It's already there. It's a set standardized choice. And you wouldn't want to make it accessible to change it all the time at a limited basis. You would want the admin to control that. So in order to access, you go to Setup, Home, Platform Tools, Expand Objects and Fields, and you click on Picklist Value Sets. And from here, when you click on that, you get a detailed page, and you would be clicking on the new Global Picklist Value button. And then once you're in this detail page and you click on Save, you'll be directed to a Picklist Value Set. So here's an example of a value set. Now using these global pick list in objects is our next discussion. And we can use these pick list values while creating new pick list values. So you go to the object in which you want to create the pick list field. Click on the fields and relationships. Click on new. Choose the data type as the pick list and click on next. Enter the field label and the values. Check the use global pick list value set right so you're you're choosing that set as your default and you select the global the global pick list from the drop down list so you could choose and pick uh which of those you wanted which set and so on so you enter the label name enter the values check the available options that fit your needs it contains all the global pick lists that are important to you that you've saved and you're done the field dependencies so pick list fields then define how the field would be dependent on another field so you have a controlling pick list and you have a dependent pick list. So the controlling pick list obviously controls what rolls up to it and the dependent pick list provides related value. It gives again the the users don't have to type in all of this data and information we allow for them to be saved and chosen as a drop down and it just saves time and makes the tool more efficient for our users so for example if we had a state that was our controlling pick list like any one of these states then we can provide a dependent pick list that has a responding city that could be attached to or there's the API name here are the values of the states then here's the API name of the city and choices that could be made for cities in those states so when we create the dependency we're going to the field and relationships window we're clicking on new under field dependencies and then we can choose which controlling field we need and which dependent field we need so choosing that controlling field as a state and then the dependent field as a city then we can create those dependencies and we can show them as available and display what choose to display what we want to split to be displayed for our users so using these dependencies helps us avoid hard set code this is the configuring part of being an administrator and it will allow your org to be malleable which simply means adjustable 
and when iterations come, remember three times a year, those iterations would not be blocked by code that we created, but would work and be able to be enhanced and synchronized with the updates that Salesforce is providing on an ongoing basis. So we can choose a text field as the type field that we wanted in this example. And then the details like what we want it labeled, uh, a description of what this field means to us, how many characters could be added to that field, and then the API name that will, that will be displayed for future enhancements. In step three and four, then again, we choose the profiles that we want to have access to this field, and then how we want it to dis be displayed in which object to be available. So data types are not another interface that can be customized and so when we choose date then with clicking on that radio button a very similar process to what we've seen in these previous steps where we can choose the name the label we can put a descriptor for future reference and then in the date case we can choose uh, formula values which will allow information to be pulled into that current date so we show that existing day when it was created by the user and is saved as a record when we select the profiles, it's the same step as our previous customizations. And then we add the, the field object layout and the pages where we want them visible, similar to the other type fields. The same process with a currency field. And in, in this instance, we can also put our length of currency before and after the decimal point and this may depend on what type of currency you're using and how your users are going to be leveraging that information again we choose the profiles and we choose the page layouts and how we want this field to be represented just like we did in the previous fields. When we want this field to be represented, it will only be in read-only view, and it derives its values from the formula expression that we define. So it's supported on standard and custom objects. Formula fields uh, can reference standard or custom formula fields they can be related to objects we can enter 3,900 characters in that formula field and we have a compilation capacity of 4,000 remember an important consideration is that the formula field is updated when any of the source fields change. That'll be important to you uh, in future references. The choices that you'll have with building these formulas, you'll be able to choose the formula data type, choose the data type based on the output of the calculation, and you'll be able to enter that calculation or expression for this formula field. So the result types formula fields relate to and provide 
currency results, date results, date and time, numbers, percentages, and text. All of these are different results that can be made available for these formula fields. When you're creating these basic formulas, you would select this, the formula tab, choose the field type, the drop down list, choose one of the fields listed, and then insert an operator to choose the appropriate operator icon from the inserted drop down. And these are all efficiencies that you're adding for your users. It's restricted. We can create more complicated formulas by selecting the advanced formula tab. But when we insert the field, we, we click insert and we can check the syntax to make sure there are no errors in what we are creating. So here are functions that are available. We have date functions to display the date, year, month, and date format. We can also display them with a date value so the input can be uh, expressed by text. We can use a date time timestamp and then we have functions that allow uh, days to be extracted from a data field. We have date functions for month, for year, today's date, and then actually the date and time. All of these are available to us. We have text functions so that if the text begins with specific characters, then it would re turn a true match. If the text contains specific characters, then it returns true if it does. Otherwise, it returns false in the this function of text. The find search text start number returns a position for a search text in a string of texts. And then the trim text would remove spaces, ex extemporaneous spaces, so that uh, we have the amount of spaces between the text words that we need. Then if the function has a value that's selected by a multi-pick list, then here's a function for that, for that specific need. Uh, this function would allow the, the value, the pickless field, to be equal to a, a lot, literal string. All of these functionalities are capable for you to choose and enter into and are functions rather than writing code. You'll be able to choose any one of these text functions as options for creating your function field. The MID returns the characters from the middle of the string. The LEN returns the no of characters in a text string. The lowercase or uppercase strings can be introduced into your formula. If you want the left side of the pad or the right side of the pad, if you want to substitute a new string for the old text, if you want to convert the value of the text, all of these help you as administrator because they're already available to you in your setup and these are choices you can make from the absolute value to a rounded 
off number to a given number to rounding towards uh, zeros. These are all functionalities that in the past we would have to introduce code. Now we can leverage all of these functions as part of our function string. Math functions. If we wanted to return the least, if we wanted a round number, if we wanted the square root of a number, all of these are available to you. Logic functions, whether it's true, whether it's uh, one logic is true or the other logic is false, it'll return based on these choices. We have those options to put in place so that we're creating something that our users can leverage and we didn't have to write code for these functionalities. If you needed a null function, that's available to you. All of those functionalities then allow us to create these formula fields and make them ready access. So just in the same case as other fields we've created, we, if we choose the formula field, then this will create a field that allows for formulas. We would need to enter a formula that calculates the output and then we can choose what would be displayed whether they're zeros that we want to show or just simply blanks that's an option we can show uh, what profiles would have access just like we did other fields we can show the page output all of these options once you become proficient and practicing then you'll see the process is very similar it's just giving you multiple options including uh, validation rules that would validate our data so we want to keep quality it's a high priority and we want to define the expressions or the conditions that relate to this record. If that expression or condition fails, then it would show an error and, and would not be uh, capable of being saved by our users. This allows you to keep clean data. So creating these val validation rules we would go to that field detail page, click on the new button, and then creating a custom condition and the error message are all part of this process. So we create the rule name, we insert the field to which we want this validation to run on, we make sure that our syntax is correct on the function that we've entered and then we can type in the error message that we want to show so you can see the power of what you have available to you as an administrator similarly with roll-up summaries when a read field is only desire to be displayed in a sum, a minimum, a count, a maximum, then we can create this list and associate it with records in a master list or a child list and how we want it to be related. 
So roll-up summary fields will be enabled on the master object at, or a summarization on the child object. There's an option to include all the records in the roll-up or just the records that meet a certain criteria. It's an easy way of defining the roll-up summary to automatically display the values that we want to be related. And this can be a record count of related records or a calculation of the sum. And so now we're talking about relating these fields in a way that enhances and expands creativity and efficiency. So how do we create those roll-up field summaries? First step, choose the roll-up summary field on any master object and click next. Enter the field label. So you can customize what you want this to be called. Click next. Select the object on the detail side of the master detail relationship. This contains the object, the records that we want to summarize, and then select the roll-up type. So here's what it looks like actually in your setup org. You choose the master object, and you see the roll-up summary is enabled by default. You give the file a name and click on next. Based on the master detail relationship given, now we can choose the child object that we want to see this summary related to. So we can perform four different types of roll-up summaries. So there's the count, the sum, the minimum, or the maximum. You can make that choice by clicking on one of the radio buttons. Then we choose the profile that we want to have access, just like in the, the previous fields we created. Then we choose the page layout. So you can see there's similarities of each of these processes when you make these creation steps. So what about object relationships? How do they relate to each other and how can we make this work for our users? So the object relationship defines how the records in one object is going to interact with and relate to records in another object. So we've been talking about the master account. So at, for example, the account details. So this is the employer or the, the company that's part of our records. Then there is a ch if there's a child account and the opportunity needs to be related to both of these this is a great example uh, for hospitals. You may have the large major hospital and then clinics or outpatient scenarios. And there may be an opportunity for business. And we want to show how the clinic has a relationship to the master account. And then how that opportunity, that, that business point relates to both of those objects. So we have lookup relationships, we have master detail relationships, we have hierarchy relationships, and we have many to many relationships. And the reason that Salesforce makes this available to you as administrator, there's gonna be all different types of creative options that will allow your business to pivot and allow your users to make connection points. And it will just simply make their world much more effective and be able to keep better records and use these records to move the relationships forward. And all of this is behind the scenes that your sales teams, your uh, customer support teams, they don't have to worry about how it was set up, but you're the one that gets it in place to move forward.
So there are master detail relationships. So in this relationship, the master, master object controls the detail object records. And there's no duplication allowed. In the lookup relationship, it's similar, but the parent record is not always mandatory in the master detail. So on the left-hand side, the lookup relationship, you can create 25 lookup relationships for both standard and custom objects. But for a master detail relationship, you can only create two master detail relationships for the custom object. Lookup relationship can be created if the record already exists. The master detail relationship cannot be created if the record already exists. If we delete a parent record in a lookup relationship, then the child records would not be deleted. But in the master detail relationship, if you delete the parent, the child will automatically be deleted. Lookup relationships are optional. The master detail relationship is mandatory. The ownership and the sharing of the child record are not determined by the parent for a lookup relationship, but they are ownership and sharing of a detail record are, de are determined by the master record. In a many-to-many -many relationship, this allows each record to have one object to be linked to multiple records from another object and vice versa. A junction object is a custom object with two master detail relationships using the custom junction object. We can model a many-to-many -many relationship. For example, you can have contact roles that allow that role to be related to a, an account object and the contact object or opportunity object so that users can show how these relationships uh, flow and it's not limited to one so one role because there are contacts that have multiple roles in an opportunity in some business relationships. Hierarchical relationship allows a click to, to look up the icon and select another user from the pop-up list. So it's only available in the user object. It allows developers to create uh, manager fields so we can show who relates to who and then how the data would flow up for users in the upper level of your hierarchy to see and have access to more data. The relationship acts as a self-relationship and then re relates that data up the chain. We wanted to link, for example, a custom object called the bug with itself then we could show how the two different bugs related to the same problem. So you do have that option in a hierarchical relationship. Now here's the steps to test the lookup relationship. First of all, we create the field with a data type as a lookup relationship on an account object and related to solutions that acts as a parent object. After completing all the steps, the accounts are related list to the solutions. And then step three, we can create this relationship if the account record already exists. Now we can delete the solution records and then check the accounts associated with the solution. The result will be the account records will not delete. On the other hand, to test the master detail relationship, we create the field with a data type as a master detail on any custom object, like a customer. Then we give the related to cases. The case will act as the master object. 
and this field will not be created when the customer record exists. After creating that field, the customer are the related list of the cases. So to test this, in step five, we create the one case record and also create a customer record for that case. We delete the case record and then check to see if the customer record is deleted or not. The result is because we have that child relationship, the customer record would be deleted automatically as well. So we can create master detail relationship on the custom objects only. We can't create master detail records on standard objects. So how do we create this master detail relationship literally in our setup board? Well, we're going to set up then we're choosing the master object from the object manager page that we want to create this master detail field. Then we pick the field type as the master detail relationship. And this field will be referring to the objects that we select in the next step. So step two we choose the object to, to which we want to relate it. And then we choose the field label and we create a description and any help text if we so choose. We choose the profiles. Remember, in all of the previous steps, we want to make sure that this is related to the profiles that we want to have access to it. And then we choose the field page layout that would be applicable. Then as this child object, we have a relationship that we want to create to the parent object. And so we choose and make those choice, choices as needed. For some of you, this will be the favorite section of our lesson discussion, the schema builder. So by going to set up and typing schema in the quick find box at the top or scrolling all the way down in alphabetical order to schema builder, we can find this pectoral representation of objects and relationships. And this area is where we can create objects and fields and relationships using drag and drop down options. It gives us a clear understanding of visual pictorial of how they're connected to each other. And then if we wanted to create bulk objects or bulk number fields, this is a very user friendly, easy to cr create access point. So creating schema builder, as we mentioned, you go to setup, object manager, click on schema builder button. And then on the left hand side, you'll see the menu of the building toolkit. And then the objects and their relationships in a diagram type format. So elements. We'll, the elements tab will give you access to the field types and the object tab gives you access to create objects using the choices on the right hand side and those the object tab gives you access to that that are currently created this is another access point for you as the administrator that's not available to our users. For our summary of this lesson, remember we talked about standard objects that come right out of the box available to you from day one, which would include accounts, contacts, opportunities, leads, but not limited to those standard objects. You have the capability of creating custom objects 
and then those custom objects can be put in appropriate page layouts and associated and made available to profiles that would have the need of that specific object. We showed different tab types and how you can create web tabs, lightning page tabs, visual force tabs, all are accessible to you. We also discussed fields and how Salesforce provides standard fields for you and then you can create custom fields and those fields can be related in dependencies specifically to pick lists and multi pick list fields that save your users uh, click times and typing in data for a more efficient environment and then we showed how those objects can be related that again make it easier and more efficient for your users and business units Welcome back. This is demo one of lesson three. Here we're going to show a demonstration of creating custom objects and custom fields. So let's go right to our live test environment. This is our developer org. And remember, we start out by going to setup, the setup gear. Once I click on setup, then it's taking me to the quick find menu. And then I have the option of being in the home screen or going to object manager. And so for this demonstration, as the object manager field, I can open that window and notice all the standard objects are in place. And then there are custom objects that we could create moving forward. Remember, we mentioned there are multiple standard objects and obviously, you can, you can see in this org, we have lots of right out of the box possibilities. But for our purposes now, we're going to click on the drop down and the create button. And we're going to click custom object. Just before I do that, I just want to make sure that I don't have this object currently available. So notice I'm typing in to search in this interface, are there any objects called customer? So I validated that. I know there's nothing called customer that's an object available. So now I'm going to click on create custom object. So it's opened that page for me and it gives instructions on the step-by-step -step, and I type in customer and then I'm going to put the plural in so Salesforce can track that moving forward notice that it does not start with a vowel so I'm not going to click the radio button the object name when it's uh, in the API environment will be customer. I'm going to type in a short description. So I have a historical record of why I designed this. Then I have the option of making it sensitive to help settings so we could open the standard Salesforce help and training window or we could choose to open a visual force page that would be a resource for help for this object I haven't created one of those yet so I'm going to leave that radio button the, the way it defaults notice that it's telling me that the record name appears in the page layout as customer name it's a text type of data field 
here's where remember we talked about if we want the customer object records to be found in reports we would check that radio button if we want activities to be input by our users we click that radio button if we want the field history to be tracked we trick that click that and then if we want this to be uh, enabled and allowed in chatter groupings we would check so for our purposes in this demonstration we checked all of those radio buttons when these settings are enabled then uh, an enterprise application object would allow sharing allow bulk API access allow streaming and I want all of those options uh, since I'm in a development org and we're just doing testing I'm going to leave it as deployed because we want to access this right away if I want it in a development scenario I could check that radio button uh, then for search status if we want this setting enabled so the, our users could find records of this object from global searching and search environments we check that I want to be able to add notes and attachments so I'm going to check that radio button and I'm, I want to allow a customer tab so I'm going to enable that as well so notice I'm checking the radio buttons as needed and when I save this, then the record would allow me to, to move forward the way I've set it up. I'm reducing the uh, available field scope so that I have that capability as well if I needed that and needed more space. So now I can save this object because I've chosen all my options that are going to be required by these users and now it's taking me to the tab page and I need to choose a style of tab for customers so I click on the search button and now you notice I have multiple multiple options of being able to choose an icon that would fit close to or represent what would be best and you really have multiple choices so for our purposes I'm going to make it easy for us and we're going to choose the building tab and notice that I don't have any optional home pages designed right now that I could drop in, but I'm going to describe this And that allows me to save that tab, those colorings, and relate it to the customer object I'm creating. Then I click the next button on the lower right-hand corner. And notice now I have options as to whether or not I'm going to have these profiles available to view this specific object I've created. If I cl click on either one of these radio buttons, it gives me more options to make adjustments. So for example, if I did not want the marketing profile or to have access or they didn't need access to this profile, then I could check the radio button and for example, uh, 
the contract manager or uh, the free user if I didn't want them to have access to this tab then I can hide that so they wouldn't have the relational opportunity to make that choice if there were uh, any of these other profile options that I wanted to change availability then I can make that choice here and then click next in the lower right and now I'm looking at the apps that would have this capability this customer tab notice if I uncheck then I could the radio button next to include then I could make individual choices of what apps would have this capability to even view the tab and for our purposes I'm going to leave that at least available so that in the future I could make those adjustments as needed and I'm going to click save and now we've created this custom object notice in the upper left hand corner called customer and now I have the capability of creating fields and relationships and right out of the box notice that these four fields are automatically in place they're standard fields for who created this object the customer name that could be added in that field last modified and the owner and so I have those fields immediately available to me if I wanted to create a new field then I can click on the new button and as I scroll down it takes me into these different data types and I could choose any one of these radio buttons to add specifically to this object I'm going to click the phone button because it makes sense that we would want to have the phone number for the client and I'm going to type in uh, mobile and it's giving me the label and the name the field name I can add a description I can add help text I can make it a required field if we wanted this to make sure that we capture that phone number it's default that we can click that ready but it is defaulted to making it a report type and then I can I don't really need a formula field right now so I'm going to click next and notice again I have the option of what profiles would be able to view this field and then when I click next what page layouts it could be added to and then when I click save now we have the mobile phone number and because it's a custom field I could make edits in the future or delete it as needed so we have now created the custom object and the custom field and I'm going to take you back into the app launcher and look at the apps specifically we're going to choose the sales app so we can look for and, and validate that we have created this custom object that now could be accessible to our our home page for the sales application so here are the tabs that are defaulted 
and if I go to the more drop down then notice here's the custom object for customers that I just created when I choose that then the home page for recently viewed and all customers would show up and all of this has already been created in place when I created that custom object and now when I click on new notice that I if I were going to create a new customer today the standard field called customer name and the owner was already in place and then we created the mobile phone as a custom field so I'm going to create a sample and then sample mobile number and click save and so now you as the administrator because you created that object the customer object and you created a field for it all of these related objects immediately became available to you because of that initial setup and notice that this tab is in place and any additional new edits or updates or views now are part of my org because of that creation process thanks so much for your attention and our next demo we'll be looking at editing and updating those records so come back we're in at demo number two lesson three and we're looking at customer data and specifically customizing objects and fields remember in the last month we created a custom object and then we created a couple of custom fields and now we want to demonstrate how we can customize what we've created so our test environment developer org is defaulting to the administrative setup page and you'll find the more you use Salesforce, it is trying to remember and trying to help and anticipate what uh, your normal business practices are. And so I've been coming back to this setup environment multiple times. So it's defaulting to this page for me. And if we want to customize an object and we're not in this administrative page, remember, we can go to the gear icon and when we click on that we have some options and we'll be discussing these options in the bottom of this drop down and later demos and lessons but today we will be clicking on the setup link and that takes us to this page where we have defaulted and notice that there's a menu and we've used this menu for other interactions but today we're going to object manager because this is where we're going to be finding customization capabilities and once i click on that link it's taking me to the object manager page and i can scroll down and find what object i wanted to adjust and notice there are multiple multiple objects already in place or I can use the quick find search option in the upper right hand corner of this page and this search 
field is different than the search field at the top, which would be searching all of Salesforce, this quick find search field is focused specifically on this page, and you'll find options like this and fields like this in other object pages and other tab pages. And it just makes it easier for you as an admin and then your users to drill down quickly and search specifically on the page they're on. So I'm going to start typing part of the name of the object I'm looking for. And here we are at the customer object. So I can click on the label name and that will take me to that page. But ultimately, I can also use the drop down on the right hand side of this link and click the word edit. And that link takes me to the customer object page. And you should be familiar with, we've been here before and seen uh, the edit capabilities of the label, the plural, the plural of our label, the name of the object, descriptions that we could add in, and then other options that we chose to make this page usable for our business units. Now we want to dive deeper into making specific adjustments from our menu items here on the left hand side of the page. Notice that I can address fields and relationships, page layouts. If I had created a lightning uh, record page that's related to this object, buttons, links, and actions, compact layouts, which could be used on it as an individual component on a, a page of our choice and or can be leveraged for our mobile devices like iPhones, Android, and uh, iPads, uh, field sets that would be available to be adjusted and, and updated and edited, object limits, and so each of our objects have limits of their capabilities and that link would allow me to see and view those record types. So each of these menu items on the left hand side will take a moment to look at. But I'm going to focus first of all on the fields that are available. And so remember there are standard fields that are right out of the box that are available to us on day one that are not editable. For example, the created by field. Notice there are no drop downs or options on the right hand side. To make any changes to that, it is an automatic default. And so you'll see fields like that. And then as you create fields, notice that the name of field label is available to us then we created name and the data type that we're looking at in controlling fields and then whether or not these fields have been indexed notice that we can choose in the right hand corner to create a new field if there are fields that have been deleted we can find them here we could find dependencies if we've set them up. And then we can set uh, record tracking for this specific field if we wanted that to happen. Here on this page, we can make those adjustments. So each of these fields have the capability of, of being viewed and adjusted as needed. And for our purposes, we're going to look at the customer name field, and if I wanted to edit that field specifically, click on the drop down, and then I could change the name, the record name of the field, and then I have two options of making adjustments to what type of data could be input in 
that field. And then notice it shows us uh, recent accounts that could be relative to this customer name and examples. So being aware of that capability is important to you as an administrator and so that adjustments could be made accordingly. But I'm going to choose next our page layout field so that inside of this object there could be multiple different types of page layouts. Notice the customer layout page is exposed to us and for us at this point and we have buttons that allow us to create an, a new page layout and or assign this current page. I'm going to click on the edit button to open up uh, the layout of this page and notice from the left to the right there is a menu that I can click on and adjust to and look for any buttons that would be important to us um, in mobile lightning actions that we would want to make a part of this object and when we discuss mobile we'll look further at those fields and how they could be interacting with. But as I scroll down, you'll see that you have the capability of creating a highlights panel at the top of this page. And when I hover over it, it opens up the tool that would allow me to make those adjustments. And then we can enter this pop up and make adjustments on each of the boxes that would be important to us to show at the height the top of the page things would need to be highlighted for that specific page and then quick actions that would be important they're available to us and can be overwritten but here are the quick actions that are currently available, whether it's posting in the chat window, um, whether it's attaching a file. Each of these quick actions could be uh, moved, dropped down, adjusted from, as well as the mobile lightning action buttons. And then as I'm scrolling down, I'm literally coming into the main body of the layout of this page and notice that as fields are added they can also be manipulated to be moved to different sides of the page or put in different sections of any given page so I just move the mobile number over underneath the owner name and then I can move it up above that so that the name is on the left hand side of our customer and then their mobile device number would be uh, at eye level on that page. And then scrolling down further, you can see related lists that are available in this custom object. And anytime you see the maintenance tool or the editing tool, then I can click on that and a pop-up will allow me to then dra drag and drop or click over uh, details that might be available or important to us, fields that currently are not showing on this object page that we could move on selected fields and then we would have that option to show that as a part of the object for our user. Notice that there's also a revert default button at the bottom that would take us back to the original out of the box um, availability. So each of these related lists are areas in which this page could be adjusted 
And then we would need to click the save button. I did make that one move with the mobile number, so I'm going to click the save button in the upper left hand corner. And now it's taking me back to the page layout, main page, and I have updated this page layout. As I mentioned, there are capabilities of viewing and editing lightning record pages. Typically those are used by marketing departments and or uh, customer facing uh, business units that would uh, be addressing mobile pages or, and or web pages that could be leveraged by our company. I mentioned buttons, links, and actions, so there are default uh, standard buttons and actions that are in place and notice we can then create new as needed and when I click on that new action button it'll allow me to walk through those steps and this is part of the editing process for this specific object I mentioned compact layouts so a system default to that and we get add new layout or customize uh, specific ways that we want our users to be able to interact with this object. If there were any field sets set up, this is where we would find them. I mentioned object limits and you can see it's very expansive. There's a lot of room for growth. We currently only have one custom field that we've designed. We could create up to 500 fields just for this one object alone. Record types is um, provided for us in case there are different business units that would be using this object in a different way and need different capabilities. We can create different record types to allow those business units to have specific focuses and benefit most from what we've created. If there were lookup fields that we had created and we wanted to relate them and filter them, we could do that here. Uh, there are multiple search layouts. Searching is a key factor and option in our Salesforce org. And as I'm scrolling down, you can see there are a lot of ways in which this custom object could be searched on and part of search uh, links in the org. Uh, if your users are in a classic environment, those are also available. Search layouts are there as well. If you've created trigger, so these are apex type triggers that are usually parts of flows and they're related to this object, you would find them here. And then lastly, we'll have in a separate demo, we'll talk about a validation rules that are relative to and attached to this specific object. So this is a quick overview of the administrator's view of adjusting, updating, editing this specific object and the fields and page layouts and uh, buttons and links and actions that are attached to it. But I want to take a moment to show you from the user interface, this lightning experience will allow administrators and anyone they delegate to have capable, capable editing processes from the user interface. In other words, you can edit this object and its page layout from two different directions. So I'm going to go back to the user interface by choosing my app launcher, also known as the Waffle. I'm going to choose the sales app because that's where we would typically find this customer object and we set that up when we created originally to be one of the objects and tabs available in the sales app. But notice as I look across the top horizontal listing of these tabs, I don't see it at the moment. Whenever that's the case, always remember to go to the more drop down 
and scroll down to find there's the custom object that I created. And the reason it's not on that top line is I don't have enough real estate to put that in place. So once I click on it, notice it becomes a temporary tab available to me. And if I wanted to permanently put this tab in this place, then I could choose to create it as a, a permanent listing from a drop down here, or I can use my edit pencil and I can see the full listing of the tabs available. And notice as I scroll down, I could grab my customer tab and move it up to any location on that horizontal wall. I could add more tabs if I needed to, but for our purposes today, I'm going to save what I just adjusted and notice that the nav bar was updated and so I can now see customer available, this object available to me. Remember that it always defaults to a recently viewed listing. I can also choose all of the lists of these customers. And I've only so far created one but when I click on this test customer, and now I have this page layout, remember that I moved the mobile number field. It used to be underneath the customer name. Now it's at eye level next to this field. But here's the uniqueness of today's environment. If I want to make adjustments to this page from this user interface as an admin I can click on the gear icon and then scroll down past the setup links into edit page or edit object if I click on this edit object page a link it would take me back to where we were a moment ago in the admin interface but if I click on the edit page link, notice it's taking me to the actual page itself. And it gave us a pop-up that told us if we drag and drop from our menu here onto this canvas, then we can immediately update this page layout right here from the user interface side and then we have an edit menu on the right hand side so that if i have a business unit uh, or we have stakeholders who prefer the details tab of this page layout to be the default and to be furthest to the left in their line of sight then the edit menu on the right hand side can be adjusted by simply grabbing that details tab and moving it up. And notice when I did that, it immediately made the adjustment on the canvas. And then when I save that change, it allows me to activate it and write in a production environment, save that as the new look. And once I've made that save, then I can make it an organizational default so that every time any user from any business unit came to this page, it would be defaulted to what I just adjusted. Or if I only wanted this adjustment to happen for the sales app, then I can choose that sales app from this option and click, or any of the other apps and click next. Then I can choose if I want it to be a desktop chain or 
and phone or simply just the desktop or just the phone and make those adjustments if our users, for example, the sales team really wanted this adjustment only in their phone, then I can make that change here and click next. I, now I can review and see here's how I've assigned it and click save. And so now moving forward, only the sales app, not the entire organization, but just our sales team using the sales app will see details in the default position in the upper left hand corner. And notice that it's showing me the desktop view here. But if I wanted to see how this is represented on a phone, I choose the phone icon drop down and it's showing me here there's the detail page the detail link and the prominent listing and that's the way our users would see it on their phones so now that I have all of those in place and notice that you can make multiple changes from you drag and drop menu and then edit those as needed and see how those are appearing on your canvas. Now if I want to activate this, uh, this new addition, I've made those active activations, I've saved them, I'm going to make sure my work is saved. Now it's showing me that the changes have been saved. And I can simply go back to that page by clicking on the white arrow in this blue bar. And now I'm coming back to the customer page and notice that the details tab has been moved to the left, just like we uh, chose to do from our user interface. So that concludes this demo of customizing objects and fields. Look forward to future demos in this lesson and lessons to come. Thanks for joining us for demo three of lesson three. And so we're looking at demonstrating for you how to create validation fields and field dependencies. So these are going to be rules and relationships that you as an administrator can set up for your teams that again make them more efficient and more effective. So let's get started. Remember we start from the setup environment and notice that uh, I've already clicked on the setup here. I've already clicked on the object manager tab and now I'm coming to this customer object that we created previously. And when I click edit, it takes me to this customer object page. And when I scroll down, I can find the validation rules link and I've begun to fill out for you a, a sample and I found this sample provided for us right here in this environment. If you'll take the time to read the instructions and then look at what's available to you, then notice here there's a link to more examples. So when I click on that link, it's taking me to a help page that Salesforce provides that now you could leverage examples that are already in place. And because I'm talking about a customer, customer object and I'm thinking about their phone number, there's all different types of options that could be addressed but I wanted to look at 
the sample phone number capability. So you, you're seeing I can scroll down and look at and choose any one of these. And when I made the choice that was best for this scenario, I wanted to have something that would make sense for the customer object. So since the customer object is going to be a contact for us, I look in this listing of sample contact validation rules. And notice as you're scrolling down, you don't have to create code. You don't even have to create from scratch these formulas. Here's multiple different types of formula fields already uh, pre-coded and available for us to highlight as I did in this case. And when I scroll over and click on Control C, I could capture that information and then drop it into these different fields that were relative to making these adjustments. So I created a description, I made sure it was active, I dropped in what I copied here. Now I did have to change the API address spelling because remember I created this custom and so the underscore C is part of my formula. I clicked on check syntax made sure there was no errors i put in my error message that i want to show and then i chose to put it by the mobile field there's options that i could drop this uh, pop-up error for but i wanted it by the mobile field on this page layout and then when I put save, then I have the capability now. Here's the rule. It's now part of this customer object home page. When I choose validation rule, link now, here's the rule that we created. And so I'm going to go back now and test this in the test environment. So when I come back and click save, that I've made that adjustment and I may have to refresh the page, but nope, there it is. It's telling me we hit a snag, review the following fields, pointing me to that field. There's the error that we created. So I need to add that. 10th digit because US phone number require 10 digits and when I save that now there's no error and that's based on the rule the validation rule that I created in this demonstration. So moving on from there if I want to create a relationship between this customer object and another object and I click on the fields and relationships link and there are fields available that we got right out of the box or we created ourselves but now we want to create a new relationship and notice when I click on the new button now I can scroll down to the master detail relationship button choose that and then choose next And it's going to let me choose where do I want to relate this relationship to. But I'm going to relate it to the accounts object. Click next. The field label would be a special account. When I tab over 
it's saving the field name as an API address. I give a description to it. The child relationship name is customers. I can choose where I want it to be capable of sharing and make those selections. I can allow reparenting. I can add it to a custom support type. I can make additional lookup filters. For our purposes, I'm going to click next. And now this relationship can be available to different field level security references and which apps will be able to access it. And then any reference field page layouts that I would want to add, it's showing me here what's available. I click next, it's giving me any customer custom related lists. And then when I click save, now a relationship is made between the detail relationship of accounts, or if that is not possible, it's say it's explaining to me the new master detail relationship on existing custom objects. If the records already exist, we have to create a lookup relationship, populate the lookup field with data and all records, and then change the relationship type to master detail. So here we can go back to and make adjustments to make sure there's data in those fields and then save it and create that relationship on an ongoing, moving forward, data connection. So this concludes an overview of validation rules that would validate what's important to us, and then how we can create a master relationship between one object and the other. Alternately, if we want to leverage our schema builder to establish, establish relationships, then I'm beginning to type schema in my quick find. And when I click on this link, it's taking me to a visual representation of the objects. And notice that there's whole diagram of all different types of relationships and if I move my field of view notice that I can see all of these interactions and from the elements tab I could choose lookup relationships master detail relationships I'm going to click on that element now and it's showing me any of those objects that have those type of relationships in place and I can see that view as I scroll and scope and then I can look up and see the lookup relationships and how those are important to us. I'm going to choose to display and you know, hide any relationships between them and then you will be available to look at and see more clearly those objects. When I put them back in, now you can see all of the attachments and then
interacting and ultimately readdressing each of these. I'm going to come back to the customer object. And I only want to see that relationship. Then I select that tab. And here you can see the customer object and how it's currently related and how now I can make uh, edits and adjustments from schema builder and that's an alternate view of what's available as an administrator if that's your preference and your background is more comfortable then feel free to use schema builder to connect those relationships as well thank you we'll look forward to seeing you next time in our next demo hello welcome back to lesson four thank you so much for continuing to move forward with us today's lesson is one of the most important focuses of this, the environment that salesforce provides security and access are important in every aspect and specifically for administrators and users of the salesforce environment so let's get started Here's our learning objectives. So after completing this lesson, you should be able to do number one, customize the data access to profiles and roles. What that means is you'll be able to specifically provide for business units what's necessary and important for them to use the tool understand owd and the sharing settings owd stands for organization wide defaults and so there are some out of the box defaults that are important and then being able to adjust those and see what is capable for your teams number three you will be able to create permission sets so this is another level of security inside of profiles that allows you to give permissions for access as needed and then to be able to work on your organizational wide defaults in your specific org will allow you to advance what's capable so let's get started Data access. So a profile is a collection of settings and permissions that defines how a user can access those records. And using the profiles, we can assign field level security. And what that means is each of those individual fields on each of those page layouts can be focused on and provided access to for each of your objects using these permission sets and these defaults and what you create as capabilities across all your fields inside those tab settings. So Salesforce profiles decide the object record access. So that's why it's imperative that every single user have a profile so that you can provide for them how they would be able to access the records. And one can visualize and edit these settings as you provide that access to them. If you don't give them edit rights, they would not be able to edit their own records. So accessing this data, you're gonna to go to your setup using the gear uh, in the upper right hand of your home page and, cl and click on the home menu and then scroll to or type in the quick find the profiles section and we're going to demonstrate this 
as part of an addition to the training. But these, again, are screenshots of what you'll be able to see. There are two different types of access levels. So there's a basic access and there's a data administrator access. So from left to right, you can see there are more capabilities as an administrator. And that's why we recommend that you minimize how many overall system administrators you have. And then you're careful how you provide, uh, you check or uncheck these buttons to give view all and modify all. Because it makes sense that the more capability you give, the more potential adjustments would be made. And so you limit how many people can view all and or modify all. So basic access is simply a user can read any of the records created by themselves. They could create new records on the object. They could edit the records they create and they could delete those records. And again, these are customizations that you're providing as your business unit needs those capabilities. Data administrator access would allow the user to see all the records in an object type, regardless of the sharing settings for the object. So this overrides any other sharing settings. The modify all capability uh, provides full access to all records in the selected object regardless of any of these sharing settings and so you can see this user given this capability could read edit delete transfer the records share the records administrate the records uh, in an approval process so this is a lot of capability for this level profile if you so give grant them that access so the record owner and the ownership of these details allows the user or queue for the cases and the leads because uh, queues can hold cases and leads. They have the right for that particular data record. If they own it or if it's held in a queue for ownership, then that provides right, all the rights to that particular data point. So security and access is defined by these profiles and roles. The record owner controls the records that are created, imported, or loaded by that user.
organization-wide defaults define the baseline level of access. So this is the bottom line for the data record for all the users is provided by that organization-wide default. And it's used to restrict data and it can be defined for custom as well as standard objects. So this is a baseline for your security. To navigate to these OWD settings, again, we're going to set up, we're typing in or clicking on settings, and then the shared settings link. And from the drop down list, we can choose the object that we would be focusing on to see the details of that page and how that object is set up. So once we've clicked on organization wide default, we can see all the different objects available to us and how they're defaulted in our org from the beginning. So the drop down list allows us to choose OWDs for specific objects, uh, access sharing rules that are applied to the object, and the profiles that are overriding the sharing. Once we click the edit button on this page, then we can view the permission sets for each of those objects. So let's focus on sharing settings. The OWD of specific objects selected. So again, when we choose the drop down, we'll be able to view and access the sharing rules that are overriding account sharing. So it specifically describes that for us and when check marks are in those different radio buttons that allows us to see what shared settings are in place. So what are the access levels in the OWD? So first of all, there's public full access there's read, write, and transfer access. There's read, write, public read only, private access, and no access or view only use. So these are the different levels that you could allow your users to interact with the data depending on their role or their business processes in your employer organization. So Here's what full access provides. You can change the ownership of the record. You can search records, report on those records, add related records, edit the details of a record, delete the record. So this is the access level if your user or the profile you've set your user up in has public full access. So private or public read only, public read write, public full access, all users can view, edit, transfer, delete, report on all campaign records if they have this set of access levels. What about read, write, and transfer access? So this user would be able to change the ownership of the record, search the records, report on those records. Reports are very important and providing this level would allow them to also add related records and edit details of the records. So you can see we're trying to display for you in, in a pictorial view what access each of these levels would give your users. So the read-write access they can search the records, they can still report on those records, they can add related records, 
they can edit records but you can see it's narrowing down the capabilities as we go to each of these levels so lead OWDs or access levels for a case can be set to private public read only public read write public uh, read write transfer when cases or leads are set to this access level then all the users in that profile could edit view transfer report on all the cases or the lead records so here's an example if Andy is the owner of case number 234 and all other users can view edit transfer ownership and report on that case only Andy can delete or change the sharing on case 234 so this option is available for cases or for leads only a, a second note to be aware of this public read write access level all users could view edit report on all the records if Sarah's for example if Sarah's the owner of the account XYR Corp all other users could view edit and report on XYR Corp account however only Sarah has the ability to delete that record or alter its sharing settings so then access for level four is the public read only so in this level records could be searched a report could be pulled and ad adding related records is possible all users can view and report on every record all users in this profile cannot edit the records only the record owner and users above that user role in the hierarchy can edit the record so here's an example Mike is the owner of the account record GETRP Mike is in the role of international sales reported to Julie who's in the role of the VP upline in the hierarchy in this case Mike and Julie have full read write access to that account so level 5 the private level only the record owner and the users above that role in the hierarchy could view edit and report on those records so if Mike is the owner of an account record and he's assigned to the role of international sales reporting to Julie who's the VP then Julie can also view edit and report on Mike's accounts so level six the no access or view only use this option is really only available for price books so they the user could use view only or have no access to the record and what that means is they have at the default access level that allows all users to access the price book information as well as using the price book configuring opportunities and so on with the products the view only allows users to access the price book information but not to use that price book detail in opportunities with the products and then the no access restricts users from accessing information for price books and prices at all different levels inside of the no access view So let's go further into granting access using hierarchies if a role hierarchy is in place. So using hierarchies by default the role hierarchy is automatically granting record access to users above the record owner in the hierarchy. It can be disabled using the, the checkbox if you check or uncheck that box and realize that granting access to hierarchies is automatically checked in standard objects so all standard objects 
have this automatically set up, we can change the option for custom objects, but not for standard objects. An important note is that the parent object is going to impact access and security levels. So a user can perform an action, view, edit, delete, on a record based on if they can perform that same action on the parent. If a contact record is associated at XYZ account using the control, usually controlled by the parent, then the user can only edit the contact if they can also edit the account because the account object is the parent of the contact object. So when a custom object is on the detail side of a master detail relationship with the standard object, its OWD is automatically set to controlled by parent and it's not editable. So the child record in a master detail relationship inherits the organizational wide default from the parent. This will make much more sense as you begin to use the record and set up relationships between objects. So the child record in a lookup relationship has independent organizational wild defaults from the parents. Changing the, the OWD can potentially delete manual sharing if that sharing is no longer needed. So changing from private to public would make that adjustment. So granting access using hierarchies can be deselected to prevent users that are higher in the role hierarchy from having automatic access. Users with the view all and modify all object permission will be able to view all and modify all the data permissions and still have access to, to the records they don't own. Example, organizational white default does not work in the profile have view all and modify all permissions for an object. So here are some limitations. The OWD for the solution object in the sales in Salesforce is public read write and cannot be changed. So the solution object cannot be changed. When a custom object on the detail side of the MD relationship is the standard object, its OWD is set to be controlled by the parent and it's not editable. So keeping those in mind when we're talking about solutions and we're talking about a cost, custom object on the detail side of the master detail relationship, those would be exceptions. So looking at the role and the role hierarchy, the role controls the level of visibility that the users have to the organi your organization's data. The user can be associated to one role. The OWD is established and the role hierarchy is put in place so that managers can view and edit the same records that are upline to the users that are subordinate to them. So in the role hierarchy example, managers can view A, B, and C objects because they're above the user in the hierarchy. The data holding in the A, B, C objects by the subordinates would be accessible by the manager so just like it's represented here in this chart so for role hierarchy it controls data visibility it controls roll up for the records the user inherits special privileges of data owned by or shared by those below them in the hierarchy standard object access rolls up through the hierarchy custom objects as an administrator and developer you can choose whether or not access would automatically roll up 
and then if you check or uncheck the grant access using hierarchy setting you impact all of that accessibility so working with uh, the specific roles we're going to set up going to administration and we're clicking on the roles link notice that we can set these rules up by clicking on the setup button in the lower middle section of this page when we begin to set up these roles we'll see that we can view the representation of the parent-child relationship in the roles we can see a list they can sort alphabetically by role name, parent role, report display name. We can see the list of the roles in their child objects grouped alphabetically by the name of the top level row. So these are options that we would be able to view as administrator. So when we create the role, we click on add role or new role depending on whether we're viewing it as a list view or tree view we edit that role and we have the capability of deleting that role once we put it in place moving forward this is the tree type view and here's where we could be adding those details and we'll show that in our demonstration so then assigning users to roles Notice that in the tree view, you have the assignment link. And so we're going to the roles. We're clicking on this uh, assign link next to that role. We're making the selections with the drop down list, selecting a user that you want in that role. And then we click the save button. So basically, when you click on assign, you'll see available users and you highlight them, click the arrow, and it moves them into that selection. So here's the important points that we need to be aware of. We can create up to 500 roles for the organization. Every, every user must be assigned to some role. All the users require some type of visibility, and it should be belong to the highest level of that hierarchy and when we change the user's role any relevant sharing rules are evaluated and added or removed as necessary automatically by your instance so looking at permission sets that was giving us overviews of profiles and roles and now we're going deeper into permission set capabilities. As the administrator, you can set up permissions that are a collection of settings and permissions that give the users various functions. So they're found in profiles, but permission sets extend the capability and the functional access without changing the profile so it's basically a subset of their profile capabilities so here's reasons that we would provide permission sets we'll give users access to custom objects we create these permission sets so that the object has more capability of access and interaction with that user we don't have to change the profile we simply create the permission set for that use case for that user and users can have only one pro profile but they can have multiple permission sets so this just gives more customization for what your users and your business units can access so here's a, a diagram of 
the capabilities. Permission sets w will affect the op Object and the field permissions, they'll impact app permissions, Apex class access, Visual Force page access, system permissions. So permission sets could impact all of these different areas of your org. Important note is the profile could have many different users. If we give any permission sets at the profile level, then all the users assigned to that profile would be impacted and have those permissions. So navigating to permission sets. To give permission to one user without changing the profile, right? So we cr create the permission set, assign it to the user. The profile could have many users, but the user could only be assigned to one profile. So multiple perm permission sets could be given to that single user and here's where you find it in setup going to home administration under the user drop down we can choose those permission sets and you can see that there are several in this example already in place so to create a permission set we click on the new button enter the label the API name description of the permission set select Salesforce as the user license uh, in the select type of user and then click on the save button so we can select either the object the field the application the apex class the visual force page we can select the object which we want these permission sets to be affecting we can edit and give related permissions and then we click on the save button Here's a snapshot of that field and those page connections in setup. So for app permissions, we would click on the menu items and choose or edit settings for the app, the object, or the Apex class access. For system permissions, these are settings that are related to access view create edit permission permissions data the app information or the features so we click on the edit button to change the permissions and then click on the save button so when we're assigning these permissions from the user detail page we can assign permission sets or remove them as needed we're going to set up home administration and users and now we would see permission sets to assign we would select the user which we want to assign the permission set in the permission set we would click edit we would assign the permission set from the available permission and then click the add button so you're highlighting on the left hand side and clicking on the add button if we wanted to remove it we would highlight it from this side and click the remove button and then click save so sharing rules so you can see that there are multiple ways that you can provide access and availability to your users and sharing rules allow specific sharing capabilities so we use sharing rules to make automatic exceptions to the OWDs and then we can define that rule to specific users and using these sharing rules extend the sharing access to users in public groups and in their roles an important note is that sharing rules can never be stricter 
than the organization-wide default settings. They simply allow greater access for specific users. So here's a comparison chart between the profile and the sharing model. If the profile controls access to the object, the sharing model controls access to the records. Profile examples would be accounts, contacts, custom objects. The sharing model, one account record or one contact record. Profiles impact and specify that a user can see accounts, but the sharing model determines which account and the records that that user could see. The sharing model might determine that a user could see a specific record, but the profile speci specifies which fields that user can view and edit. So sharing models drill down into specifics. So accessing these sharing records in your setup, you would click on setup, home, and expand security and click on sharing settings. So in that specific object, I can begin to look at sharing rules assigned. So step one is to go to any object sharing rule and click on the new button and then enter the label and the rule name that you want. Select the rule type. So it's based on the record owner and the owner of line by line specified the user's records are stored. Select the category for the first drop down list and use that drop down list. If it's based on criteria, then the user would specify the field operator and value the criteria that records must match to be included in the sharing rule. The fields available depend on the object selected and the value is always the literal number of, of that string. A special note is to add filter logic to change the default account record in the relationship between each of those filters. Step four, this, when you're sharing in line, you can specify if the users have access in line. And we could select a category from the list and the set of users, the second drop drop down list. Then we can select the level of access for the users, if it's read only or read write. And here's a snapshot of those options we just discussed and creating and deciding how this would be accessed once we've created it and click the save button. So here's some important points about sharing rules. Sharing rules would apply to all new and existing records owned by the specified role or the group. Sharing rules apply both to active and inactive users. When we change the access level for the sharing rule, all existing records are automatically updated to reflect that new level. So once you're making this change, your Salesforce org will automatically make those adjustments for you. When we delete the sharing rule, the sharing access created by those rules is automatically removed. So you don't have to write code or expose what you already created. It automatically happens in your org for you. More important points are we modify which users in a group or a role the sharing rules are reevaluated to add or remove access as ne necessary. So when we change our users, it's going to impact the sharing rules. Managers in the role hierarchy are automatically granted the same access that the users below them have 
in the sharing rule. We can edit the access levels by any sharing rule, but we cannot change the specified group or the roles for the rule. So another way to share data is by manually sharing. So a user can open access to records on a one-off basis when it's too difficult to change or adjust other users who need access. Actual manual capabilities can be granted by the owner or, any, or anyone above the owner in the role hierarchy and they simply click on the sharing button to share those records. The sharing button will not appear if the object's organization-wide sharing defaults are set to public read-write. So full access versus read-write or read-only. This chart shows a comparison. For full access, the owner field is for the user and the queue member. Above the user in the role hierarchy, the pro profile permission is modify all data, the object permission modify all. For read, write, or read only, it's based on organization-wide defaults. Above the user will have the read, write, or read only in the role hierarchy. There's manual sharing, there's sharing rules, there's APEX sharing, profile permissions to view all data, and object permission to view all. So the comparison is either viewing or actually modifying, depending on whether we have full access or we have read-write or read-only access. So we've looked at profiles in your org. We've looked at accessibility to your data, what levels are in the defaults, how you can impact accessibility through role hierarchy, how you can give permissions to users without adding new profiles, and then how sharing rules impact the security and the accessibility of your data inside your org. Thank you for viewing this important, impactful implementation of your org. We look forward to seeing uh, next lessons in the coming uploads. for joining us again on our first demo for lesson four which is focusing on security and accessing data so working on organizational wide defaults and it's really basic and simple to get to that environment so let's get started remember to access your administrative setup, you would click on the gear button in the upper right hand corner and click on setup and that will take you to your setup home page and our recommendation is to start typing in shared sharing settings in that quick find box and notice as soon as I did that it brought me to the link where I could click sharing settings once I clicked on that here we're at really what is the main page for all of the organization wide defaults so as I scroll and it tells you that in the instruction on the top if you're going to manage settings and you wanted to edit an individual object then you could scroll down find that object once you click on it then notice it's taking you to an existing default 
and you have the option now to make adjustments by clicking edit and now I have exposed that specific default for those updates and I could make adjustments right here from the drop down choices and then once I've made those adjustments then I can click save and it will take me back to the shared settings environment so other settings that may be impacting price book specifically are right here and we can click on and adjust them as needed if alternately I want to create a new sharing setting then I click on the, the default back to all objects and now I can scroll down see what's currently available notice that for example the leads object has a default of public read write and transfer and it's in a private setting so that means that the hierarchy would be in effect and managers upline would be able to see what their users are doing but users that are peers would not be able to see each other's leads environments and notice that the grant access using hierarchies box has been ticked or checked so the hierarchy is in force but if I want to create a new shared setting with leads or accounts or any of these other objects then I can click on the new button here in these related lists and now I could create the label the rule name describe it as needed check the radio button to base it on the record owner or I could base it on a criterion I could have it owned by a public group a specific role or roles and subordinates and then I could choose whichever role I wanted the records to be shared and then who I wanted it to be shared with is the drop down next to that and I could choose which role would have access to that record and then I could give it read only read write and those options would be in effect on this new sharing rule so that gives you an overview once I save that then all of the appropriate calculations would be recalculated automatically and then we'd have in place our new shared settings that's an overview of organization-wide defaults please visit us in our next interaction and demo Welcome to the second demo of our uh, lesson four. We're looking at security and access to data in our environment. So in this demonstration, we're going to look at creating permission sets and then assigning them to proper users. So remember, in our live interface, we're going to the gear setup cog we choose setup we come to the home menu I like to use the quick start guide at the top and start typing in the word permission sets and you'll see as soon as I get to the third or fourth letter I have the link available I clicked on permission sets and then again Salesforce gives you many instruction dynamics that you can interact with 
and have right in front of you here's the current permission sets that are in place and I can change the view if I wanted to set up multiple views of permission sets so the the more you create the more dynamics you want to filter so that if you have permission sets for certain users certain groups certain types of permission sets you could create that for yourself notice that in each of these we have the capability of seeing the title that was created the description and that's a best practice to make sure for instance the security center integration user has access to that center and their license type is a cloud integration user so this list is just very effective for tracking what you've created what's important to you and if you want to create a new permission set you click simply click on the new button and you get a page where you can set up a new permission you can make it uh, the activation be required you can assign it to certain licenses right from this page and I'm going to choose this permission set for the partner community and then when we click save then it allows this permission set to be in place and notice right from here I could clone it I could edit it I could manage the assignment of this permission set but before we do that let me scroll down to show you if there are assigned apps object settings visual force pages settings that apply to these apps are right here in front of you so that you can make these adjustments and these updates right from this page and then you can make them system-wide type permissions or service provider permissions but if I scroll back up to the top of this page and I click on manage the assignment of this permission set then I can look at my user interface here and choose I want to assign this person to that uh, this position this role this uh, type profile to that and then by saving that assigning it then it becomes part of that integration and so that's one way to walk through creating this new permission set adjusting it to what we wanted to have access to and then assigning it as needed so let me go back to the permission sets and notice here's what we created and then if we want it to be a assi allow assigning to connected apps then here's where we can begin building out and specifying what that permission set would allow alternately if we go to the user's interface then we can assign users from that listing so here's our users and if we wanted to allow this user a certain uh, level of permissions that are beyond what they currently have then here's permission set assignments and we can click the edit assignment button and this is going from the user interface and now if we click on available permission set and move it to enabled and save now that specific user has that permission attached to their object type and now those permissions 
would be available to that specific user. So that gives you a quick overview of what permission sets, how they can be accessed, how they can be created, edited, and how they can be assigned. We'll see you in the next lesson plan. Welcome back to our third and final demo for lesson four. We've been focusing on security and talking about how important that is in the Salesforce environment. And so our thoughts are to move into a deeper dive in this security arena because there are multiple entry points and important brackets of information that we need to bring to your attention. So we're in our live org and to get to the setup environment, we clicked on the gear button, the setup link. It brings us to the home page. And for this demo, we could either type in the word security in the quick find or just simply scroll toward the bottom and see that security is a major drop down in this administrator in environment so here's the multiple layers of security access points and information that you can see once we click the carrot drop down there are multiple points we need to discuss. So first of all, activations. So what IP login activations are currently live in my org? And you can see uh, for each unique organization and instance of Salesforce, there would be different authenticated IP environments as well as client browsers. So for example, this user has Mozilla, the Apple phone, browser environment, Chrome, and Safari. A short note is that Chrome is the best environment for using the Salesforce ecosphere. It's designed to work most effectively with that engine. And so just keep that in mind as you're training your users. After, acti after activations is the cores. So this is the cross-origin resource sharing. And this org currently does not have that. But if you're in a complex environment, you have multiple interfaces, and you need to have the cross-origin resource of sharing capabilities, here's where you can create new origin lists and edit existing lists. Next is the CSP trusted sites and for any environment like this internet interface it would be prudent for you if your company so desires to set up web addresses that your organization can access easily and readily and get those in place because of the lightning component interfaces your IT team can help make those connections and make it a more seamless and efficient interface for those organizations that have a financial entity and you're either leveraging salesforce security or using the out-of-the-box uh, implementations that come with every org you can manage certificates from this page and manage your keys, your master encrypted keys, and your API certifications. So this page, again, your IT department will be uh, very happy to see that these are capabilities, especially if you're dealing with highly sensitive financial or personal information that would need to be encrypted or have these certifications. Delegated, delegated administration. So 
if again you have a large employment base and you have multiple administrators it's not the best practice to give everyone system administrator level of access but you can delegate and remember we talked about permission sets profiles and those can be given more capabilities than a standard user and then you can manage those in groups and this is the interface that would help you be most effective in doing that event monitoring so again different organizations prefer different levels of security and so event monitoring helps us track troubleshoot and audit the user activity and these are enablements that you can only you can process as the administrator and you can set up policies and manage these based on your users and your stakeholders you can set up uh, transaction security policies so that every transaction could have a policy that would impact opportunities leads or any type of transaction within your org and this is again for organizations that really need a tight high level of security expire all passwords so if in the event your organization your employment base your company has been compromised in any way and your team feels the need that everyone needs to start again from scratch you would not have to go to every single user and expire their passwords individually this could happen right from this environment and it's only as a last resort obviously and it's only capable from the administrated user profile system administrator user this interface allows you to look at each individual field and update or visualize the accessibility to every single field in your org so when I chose the account object then it opens for me two choices I can either look at that object by the fields or by the profiles that have access to it so when I click on view by fields then I have a drop-down choice of looking at any one of the fields that are part of the account object and now I can see the profiles that have access or do not have access to this specific field this this particular Dun & Bradstreet company field is hidden to all of our users and you can see that by simply look interfacing with this page file upload and download security for many of you it's important to understand what documents could be uploaded or downloaded and what level of security you have on each of these different types of documents in your org currently for example if there was a dot unknown type of document then it could not be executed to be uploaded or downloaded in your environment and so these are the blocks and balances that are built in and you have capability to make adjustments as needed this next link the health check link is probably one of the most important checks you can do in your org we would recommend that at the very least quarterly you go to health check and notice there are standards that are in place that your org 
would be balanced against and typically any percentage 72 or higher is acceptable and if there are risks you have a button to click fi fix risks in the upper right and or you can scroll down on each of the settings available to you and see the status for example maximum invalid login attempts our organization wants to leave uh, 10 attempts as a possibility for our users it can be edited and updated over time but Salesforce is just giving us a warning that the standard value if someone puts in their password incorrectly three times then they would be locked out for 15 minutes that could create some frustration so this particular org is defaulted to 10 incorrect attempts and then each of these settings whether they're maximum risk medium risk could be adjusted our IT department asked us to leave these settings the way they are today and after further review there may be more adjustments but that could be choices made by you and your advisory council in your company the low risk settings typically are just what they imply they wouldn't have great impact across the entire org but they're also given here for your discussion and your opportunity to make adjustments as needed so that is probably the most important check security wise that you could provide for your organization you can set login access policies so there may be ranges of IPs that would be a possibility there may be support organizations that you would want to uh, make available to your users and this is a page where you can make those changes name credentials so if there's specific required authentication parameters then when callouts are being activated then this page will help you with that network access so if there's ranges that you want to set that would be uh, most accessible and allow for most efficient login practices you can set those here outbound connections notice in this org Google Maps and Salesforce voice have been enabled but not adoption assistance so this is giving you a quick view of what's outbound in a connectivity password policies here's where you as the administrator can set up how long before the users would be prompted to update their passwords the best practice is the default of 90 days but you can make those adjustments how password history is enforced so Salesforce this org is remembering the last three so that a user would have to create something in addition to any one of those last three and they would be prompted to uh, make those adjustments when they were setting their new password uh, the minimum length in this org is eight there are other obviously edits you could make but that's a current best practice mm -hmm. and again each of these policies can be adjusted by you and messages could be set if they're locked out so that you can customize those for your users and even including an alternative home page if you chose to have that redirection for your users 
uh, platform encryptions so you have the capability of setting advanced settings in place so that if you need additional encryption this is where those decisions can be made key management when we're talking again about a financial based org a uh, personal private health based org there may be uh, key management needs and this will give you directions toward helping set those up if uh, there were private connect points both inbound and outbound then those could be set up on this page uh, remote site settings you can see in this org there is one apex developer network uh, remote site that is a possibility and you can add to those if your org needs that uh, security alerts this has now been replaced by release updates but you know you can you will be updated at least three times a year as Salesforce rolls out its iterations uh, session management so you can view information about deletion activities uh, location of IP addresses where users logged in can be found and managed here session settings so what's required to allow a user to access your org right now the multi-factor authentication is in place and others could be made a high priority or a high assurance and then you can set when the link expires or a page layout where a URL could be directed sharing settings so in a previous demo we did a, a deeper dive on these but just a reminder you have the capability of creating sharing rules and this is showing how your org is currently set up organizational wide de defaults trusted URLs so again if there are specific efficiency directives that you want to put in place you can have that uh, edited and updated here and probably the most important link for you as an administrator is to be aware that every single modification that anyone with an administrative access ever makes in your Salesforce org is captured in an audit trail and the last 20 are made available here at in this screenshot but notice you could uh, download six months of history if you wanted to validate if you wanted to verify who has been doing what in this organization then this audit trail is probably the most effective tool for administration and stakeholders and executives to have confidence that everything that's being done is being monitored is being saved and tracked for any future historical reference so great that concludes a deep dive into security we look forward to uh, sharing with you more insights moving forward welcome to lesson five this is page layouts and tabs if you're a creative individual if your personality enjoys setting up aesthetics a user interface that is uh, efficient and attractive then this is the lesson for you let's get started so at the end of this lesson you should be able to number one discuss the app manager and tabs be able to give an explanation 
of how to access those in both your user interface and your administrator interface. Secondly, you should be able to customize page layouts using record types. So we've talked about objects, records, fields, and now we're giving more explanation about more customization. And so different records can have different types based on business units and what your stakeholders and users need in, to fulfill their day-to-day -day functions. And you can set that up where different units have different capabilities and those interfaces allow them to do their business even more effectively. Number three, you should be able to discuss list views and related lists and give a proper understanding of what those entail. Number four, you should understand custom page layouts. We've talked about this in previous lessons briefly, and we'll do a deeper dive in today's lesson. So applications, an application an app for short is a logical container for all the objects, tabs, processes, services associated with a given business function, including fields and records that would be added to those objects and a group of tabs work as a unit to provide functionality. Remember in our live org, if you wanted to look at the administrator side of apps, you go to setup using the gear button, click on setup, the home page, you could type the word apps or simply scroll down and then choose the drop down caret to begin looking at all the different types of apps that you can impact and you can adjust. And this particular page is looking at the app management side where all of these different sales apps, service apps could be impacted right from this page. This is one area where you could make adjustments uh, and, and view what's currently in force, whether it's a lightning app, a classic app, and you could make edits to those individual apps here from this direction. In our demo, we'll take an even deeper dive, but for our users, they leverage the app launcher on your home page and then they can choose the app that would give them the best view and cleanest most efficient access point for doing their daily business functions so this is the user interface side where we were showing the admin point of view this is what your users see when they choose a specific app. And so the amount of tabs or objects across the top can be adjusted and home page adjustments can be made. And this is an basically the first glance of what an app means in the Salesforce environment. So there are custom apps that can be created or you can customize existing apps to match your workflow. You can build new apps by grouping standard or and custom tabs or objects together. There really are multiple multiple variations that are designed to help you support your teams. So key points of applications are the name of the app 
the description on the ordered list of tabs a custom logo that could be created and a landing page are all part of an individual app Salesforce provides standard apps including things like the sales app that we just looked at briefly in our org a call center app a marketing app community app and these are standard right out of the box that could be used on day one as you log in users can switch between apps because of the force.com platform and the app app drop down menu is in the upper left hand corner of every page and that's what we affectionately refer to as the waffle but from any given page if you choose any object or any related record in any of those objects you'll always have access as a user to the app launcher the types of applications as we mentioned are custom apps that could be created by you as an administrator and if you give your users the capability they can create apps as needed and they could have custom and or standard objects embedded in and attached to that app and then as we mentioned there are standard applications that come day one that could be modified and updated or customized based on your business needs so to go to the creating scenario and making these adjustments as an admin we showed you these steps at the outset of our interface here today and when we do our demo we'll do a deeper dive but on this slide a screenshot we wanted to provide for you exactly where you would be going in the snapshots of what would allow you to click through to make the adjustments so all of the existing applications can be listed and found in one page both standard and custom objects if you wanted to create a new lightning app you simply create click on the create new button and we can show that again by going to our setup allowing Salesforce to open up our admin interface coming to the home page and the quick find of the home page and simply scrolling down to apps and choosing app manager then we have the capability of creating new apps or editing existing apps and here's the buttons that we're referring to once you click on create you fill on any details that you might want to customize including the color of the app an image logo that you want to upload and the unique name that identifies your app the options can be uh, navigated to and created both in the desktop environment and or your phone environment and these apps can be personalized and allow users to personalize their interface with the application so utility items can be chosen that would include both items that are standard and are custom they're simply just objects these navigation items are objects that are part of your app and in our demo we'll show you how you can move this listing highlight what's available to you click the middle 
button that moves it into selected and then that item would become part of the new app you're creating you can also choose by profile who would have access to this app so again on the left hand side are available profiles you could highlight it and then move it using the arrows in the middle to the selected profile that would now have access we'll demonstrate that further in our demos attached to this lesson but looking at page layouts is important and again creative individuals who want to truly draw in their users can determine these page layouts in their detail in their edit pages and using the fields and where they locate those fields on the page can be a customized unique entry point for all of the users based on their profiles and their business units so page layouts can control the position the organization of the fields where the related lists are found they help control the visibility and editability of the fields on a record for example in the mobile environment users typically don't want to scroll down or slide a, a lot of movements or even have many many thumb strokes to put in data so you can create and customize fields that make it most efficient for their usage and these layouts can control what are required so for a lead object for example typically we really want at least a last name and possibly an email address to make that lead unique and savable and researchable but page layouts are not used to restrict access to sensitive data that shouldn't be viewed that's field level security that allows that to happen page layouts simply move the data around on an individual field further the page layout fields can be read only or even hidden we don't have to expose all of the available fields and sometimes that saves frustration because as we mentioned scrolling down and, and mouse mileage can be reduced if we just really put on the page what's important to that business user we can hide fields on, from specific page layouts based on the business use unit needs the user can still access hit the hidden field through other parts of the app but it's not a slowdown on their business functions for that page the page layout controls standard and custom buttons and how they're displayed and where they're displayed on that page so to navigate to page layouts we would go to setup object manner manager click on any object and then click on the new button and then the snapshot below shows us we choose the page layout link and click on new so once we've clicked on the new button we can choose the existing page layout uh, enter a page layout name and begin the process note that you can select existing layouts to clone them so you don't have to create from scratch you can create a page layout without cloning your page layout would not include standard sections that are already a part of a page layout that you would be cloning and they're not necessarily translated from the creating the creating point and so you would have to make that adjustment as you're developing that page layout so the page layout console allows you to configure 
or show or hide or move uh, vertically or and or horizontally where you want specific parts of the components and fields to be displayed so when you're customizing the fields allow you to choose which fields would be displayed for buttons it allows to expose or remove buttons for your mobile and lightning interactions page layouts can add or remove lightning specific actions uh, like bug bugs or questions or new notes that again based on your business user may be important to their business flow with page layout customizations you can expand uh, and provide expanded lookouts uh, lookups this includes created by last modified by so those lookup fields could be adjusted and placed where you need them you can move and adjust related list include them in the app move them down on the page in the app and report charts you can include a screenshot selected section of reports uh, and that that charting capability on your page layout so when you're customizing related list you could customize the buttons the column order column displays the record sorting and the order of the related list how they appear on the page again in our demo we'll show specifics but this is a, a small snapshot of what could be edited on a related list to navigate you would double click the related list and then customize the fields that you want updated so you could select one or more fields and use the arrows to move remove or add to the related list column you can define the order in which they're shown you can include up to 10 fields per related list you can select the field from the sort by drop down list to sort the items and it'll be displayed in ascending order unless you select descending lookup fields are not available for display on their corresponding related list example would be the case lookup field on an account it's not available when editing the case related list so to customize which standard buttons would be displayed in the list you could select or deselect on the left hand side and then click the button that moves it to selected or click on what has been selected and then the remove button to move it off the page so record types allow to provide different sets of objects and pick lists different pay ad page app layouts and custom business processes to specific users based on their profiles and this again is talking about customization and helping you meet your needs for your business units and record types allows you to get even more granular in your customization so here are some examples create record types for opportunities to differentiate internal sales deals from outside sales field deals and show the different fields and picklist values for each of those two record types or create record types for leads to display different page layouts for telesales versus sales prospecting so different record types would give different capabilities based on that page important note that the record type called master is always set for every object and it's not listed under the record types list assigned as a record type for a profile provided and it is the only assigned record type for that profile
So to navigate, we would go to Setup, Object Manager, click on the object we want to create a record type, go to record type, click New. So then we enter the details. So choose the master from the existing drop down to copy all available pick list values or choose an existing record type to clone as your next page type for that record. You enter the label, you enter the name. The name can only be contain underscores and alphanumeric characters and it must be unique to the org. So then we can enter the description, select the active checkbox to make sure it's activated, enable it for a specific profile, and make that record type available to those users with that profile, and then select the checkbox in the header row to enable for all profiles if you so chose. You can make this page, record page layout the default so that it's the default for your users in that profile. You can select the checkbox in the header to make it the default for all profiles. Those are all the options on that specific one page. Then we click the next button. We need to apply this single page layout for all profiles. We could choose apply one layout to all profiles. But if we wanted to do it for different page layouts, then we can use the drop downs and each profile could have accessibility as needed. Once we've choose that option for the records and, and this record type, then we can move forward, customize any pick list values that are in the record type, select the record type, and click edit, add value to those available value boxes, or remove any that we don't want, or choose a default pick list, and then click save. Assigning the record types to the profiles after you've created it, now you have the option to add it to different profiles. And so it's set up home user profile, select the profile, provide, click on the profile you want, and click edit for the appropriate next type record. Select that record type from the available list, add it to the record type list, make it available to users. Number five, as we mentioned, is the system generated record. Number six, you, you can, from the default drop down list, choose the default record type and then click save. So the procedure for assigning these page layouts, again, object man, set up object manager, appropriate object, click on the page layout in the page layout or record type Click the page layout assignments, click edit assignment. When you're selecting those page layouts, click the cell, column, or row heading. Uh, press shift click to add multiple table cells. Click any cell and drag it to the set range of cells. Uh, click next to or previous to view another set of record types. And that will conclude our session, realizing the summary is that we have looked at applications, that they are simply a container of objects and fields. And those applications can be standard or customized. They can be customized by you as the administrator and or your users. And your standard apps could be modified by you as the administrator. There is a, a console in your setup as administrator that allows you 
to make edits both to record types and page layouts and you can establish them in their connection to profiles so that business units can use both your payouts and your your page layouts and your record types as needed to help them be more efficient and effective in their daily business flow. Thanks for joining us. We're here on our demo one, creating record types for this lesson number five. So for our purposes, we'll be creating a new record type in the setup environment. So we simply click Object Manager and choose the object that we want to display for recording. And so once that object is available to us, then we choose the record type that we'd like to add this new record type. And when we select new, now we can either choose the master or a previous record that we've made need to make sure that it's active by checking the active button then we need to make it available to whatever profiles are important to us and in this case because we want to display that capability we choose all the profiles so it would be available to any of the profile users we could narrow that down if we so choose and then I can make available to a specific account type or I could apply different layouts for each profile and so if I choose apply differently then in each of my different profile areas I could put it in a different layout and that may be important if I'm a marketing user or if I'm making available to partners only a specific view then I can make those adjustments and save them and now I've created this new record type I have it active and it's enabled for all of those different profiles and then my pick lists that are available are displayed here at the bottom of this record type so depending on how I wanted to leverage this record type I could make adjustments to the pick list and I can make them web-based, phone inquiry-based, purchase list-based, and then I can set those defaults as needed. So now to test our record types, I'm going to go back to our waffle, click on the sales object, choose the account tab, in this sales application I'm going to click a new op option for a new record type 
and now I can choose test two as the record type I want available and now this account would be created and saved as this record type and now could be leveraged by the appropriate profiles and in the correct layout and available as I needed to for different business units. So that concludes this portion of the demo in creating record lists and we'll see you on our next demo. for lesson number five so we're moving right through our org and we're demonstrating in this short video how to create custom page layouts it's really easy so we go back to our home page where we defaulted to the admin setup we clicked on the setup button chose setup and now we're in the admin setup homepage so now to create a custom page layout it makes sense that we're going to the object manager and we're going to choose which object we want to set these custom page layouts so that our users can have a specific unique environment for their business unit so once I chose contact as the object uh, that I want to make this adjustment then you can see all my options and choices that we've discussed in other demos but for this purpose we're choosing page layouts and now I can set up a page layout specific to my marketing team my sales team support team or simply give an overview for any users in the contact layout so here's a current capable page layout that would be uh, available to all users in that contact environment but if I want a new page layout here's where I choose an existing page layout and clone it and so I can change the name to the additional what I want it to be and you could name this anything I've used this nomenclature and it tells you as an option you can select any existing layout to clone it so you what you're looking for and if I want it to be feed based then it would include separate tabs for a feed if I was going to use it externally so I click Save and now I've created this test for demo type page layout and notice that all the buttons that are here at the top are available to drag and drop so these are the field uh, capabilities that could be added so if I wanted to have the email opt-out field in this page layout I can capture it drag it 
drop it and then put it right under the email address so that in this specific layout that would be a new option and I could adjust these fields as necessary by dragging and dropping them and the same with any buttons I needed to add for instance a submit for approval button and I could move this down into any of these available areas and sections to be a part of where I would want my users to have access for this this type button so I'm going to release it here into the contact detail page and move it to the front and allow it to drop drop in to my contact details so that this would be that button would be available to for approvals if I have quick actions that I wanted to adjust or mobile lightning actions expanded lookups uh, report charts if I needed to adjust this page layout to have a, uh, a section that would include that then any of those choices could be added my related lists I could uh, adjust but for our purposes I didn't want to totally recreate the wheel and so now I can save what I've created and now notice for this specific object I have this page layout available to me and now I could edit or delete that and uh, make the choice to put this uh, page layout in uh, other assignments and attach them to profiles as needed right from this main home page so notice I'm going to choose test demo and I could make that available in any one of these profile settings and so now my external users would see that page layout as opposed to a normal contact layout because that's how I wanted them to interact with when they logged in as an external user they would now see the test demo page layout for contacts okay it's as simple as that and now I have a new page layout that could be accessible to that specific profile Join us next time for our next demo. Welcome back. Demo number two for lesson number five. So we're moving right through our org and we're demonstrating in this short video how to create custom page layouts. It's really easy. So we go back to our home page where we defaulted to the admin setup we clicked on the setup button chose setup and now we're in the admin setup home page so now to create a custom page layout it makes sense that we're going to the object manager and we're going to choose which object we want to set these custom page layouts so that our users can have a specific unique environment for their business unit so once I chose contact as the object uh, that I want to make this adjustment then you can see all my options and choices that we've discussed in other demos but for this purpose we're choosing page layouts and now I can set up a page layout specific to my marketing team my sales team support team or simply give an overview 
for any users in the contact layout. So here's a current capable page layout that would be uh, available to all users in that contact environment. But if I want a new page layout, here's where I could choose an existing page layout and clone it. And so I can change the name to additional what I want it to be and you could name this anything I've used this nomenclature and it tells you as an option you can select any existing layout to clone it so you don't have to create from scratch what you're looking for and if I want it to be feed based then it would include separate tabs for a feed if I was going to use it externally. So I click save and now I've created this test for demo type page layout and notice that all the buttons that are here at the top are available to drag and drop so these are the field uh, capabilities they could be added. So if I wanted to have the email opt-out field in this page layout, I can capture it, drag it, drop it, and then put it right under the email address so that in this specific layout, that would be a new option. And I could adjust these fields as necessary by dragging and dropping them and the same with any buttons I needed to add for instance a submit for approval button and I could move this down into any of these available areas and sections to be a part of where I would want my users to have access for this this type button so I'm going to release it here into the contact detail page and move it to the front and allow it to drop drop in to my contact details so that this would be that button would be available to for approvals if I have quick actions that I wanted to adjust or mobile lightning actions, expanded lookups, uh, report charts. If I needed to adjust this page layout to have a, uh, a section that would include that, then any of those choices could be added. My related lists I could uh, adjust, but for our purposes, I didn't want to totally recreate the wheel. And so now I can save what I've created and now notice for this specific object I have this page layout available to me and now I could edit or delete that and uh, make the choice to put this uh, page layout in uh, other assignments and attach them to profiles as needed right from this main home page so notice I'm going to choose test demo and I could make that available in any one of these profile settings and so now my external users would see that page layout as opposed to a normal contact layout because that's how I wanted them to interact with when they logged in as an external user they would now see the test demo 
page layout for contacts. Okay, it's as simple as that. And now I have a new page layout that could be accessible to that specific profile. Join us next time for our next demo. Hey, welcome back. Demo number three of lesson five. I'm talking about page layouts and tabs, and we specifically focused on applications. And remember, applications are the containers, are the groupings of those objects and those tabs that have all those records that would be associated to a specific business unit. So if we want a specific app for that team, we can make that available to them in our org so that they're more efficient and can get right to the objects and the records they need easily, more effectively. So again, we go to the setup cog. We clicked on setup. We're here at the setup homepage and we can simply scroll down, click on app manager. And now we have all the standard and custom apps that are currently in force, whether they're the classic uh, app type or the lightning app type, we're going to be creating for this demo, the new lightning application type. So once we click, now we can create the name again, like is our practice. You can make this whatever you want it to be. Salesforce will automatically create the API name for future and this we can give a description we can upload an image that would be a logo or or a picture that would be important to us from uh, other applications and so I'm going to grab a random uh, logo picture in place. I can put a color behind, a color scheme that I wanted. And so when I've saved my color scheme, that will be a backdrop. I can make it the entire color scheme for the entire org. Or I can just leave it specific to my interest just for this app. So when I click next, now I have uh, specific navigation styles, whether I want it to be a standard nav navigation or the console navigation. Remember, standard would mean the horizontal tabs across the top, the console would allow us to drop the tabs into vertical arrangements and then we could see the real estate of the object in our workspace all in one location. So I'm going to choose the console navigation for this business unit. I can make this available for desktop and phone or just specifically to either one of those I'm going to make this only available to desktop because I know these users are going to be in a cube in front of uh, a desktop environment and they won't be using this application in any mobile scenario then I can set up this for our service setup environment or for all setup options and I'm going to leave it defaulted to that for now and then if I don't want anyone to personalize this in any way and the navigation would be locked then I could choose uh, and put a tick mark here I want my users to be able to make options and so I'm going to leave that in place then we can choose utility items so whether I wanted uh, any one of these capabilities I could choose notes and so notes would be a, a possible part of 
this uh, utility uh, utility bar and could be leveraged by and I know they're going to need that in this specific group so I've saved notes as part of their utilities then if I want navigation items to be available to them then I simply highlight and move them to the right hand side I know I'm going to want accounts available to them I want the calendar available to them campaigns so basically I'm creating the tabs they would have easy access to and I know since they're a service unit I'm going to want uh, cases and chatter available they're going to need this workspace so I choose that and then I know they're going to need this devel development object readily available to them. And then you could choose any other. They don't really need forecasting. They're not a sales group. And they don't really need healthcare items because they're not be working on in a healthcare environment. Uh, they will need invoices uh, to be able to view those and make sure they're in the correct order. They are going to need opportunities. And so I choose that as one of their readily available tab items. And then, oh, they, of course, they need products. So now I've made the choices of you know, what's important to this group. And I can now have in place what's relatable to them and what's easy for them in their workspace tab. Notice that I can also make sub tabs part of whether it's operating hours, uh, parent accounts, any one of these specifics. I could choose parenting campaigns as a sub tab. I could choose for invoices. I may need a sub tab of contacts available to that for opportunities I might need opportunity history and so I can create sub tabs for that then to decide what profiles I want to have access to this app then I can do uh, any one of my analytics I can do sales profile support profile because obviously these are going to be support users I could have uh, partners I could give them access to so that they could see uh, what's being adjusted and up updated then I want my standard user to be able to see this and of course I want myself to be able to see it so I add system administrator so then clicking save and finish then we'll check for updates as needed and we eventually would see this new application designed and in place for the test environment and become part of our applications here in our app launcher it takes a few minutes for that to be processed and then it would show up here in app launcher and we could scroll down and uh, check on any record types that were related to it here in the app launcher as well so now you can see we've created a new type of lightning app and when we save it in this environment then it would be available to us in the production environment and we can save it as a, a record accessible day one or we can hide it until we've tested or used it for uh, future capabilities all right, that includes creating a lightning app demo. We'll see you next time. Hey, welcome back. 
Mission 6, the Lightning App Builder. This is probably one of the more enjoyable, uh, creative sides of the Salesforce environment. If you're an administrator that has a creative background, that has uh, any type of design or creativity, this is probably uh, an area you'll really shine in. We're going to go through the overview and then we're going to look at more demos. We have actually created uh, other demos reflecting on the Lightning app, but you'll find as you grow in your career and as you interact with this tool, there are many different ways to do the same thing and you just need to find what works best for you. So let's jump in. After completing this lesson, you should be able to do one or all or the better part of each of these items. You should understand the Lightning App Builder. Hopefully we explained that well and then demonstrated effectively. You should be able to implement standard custom lighting components. So not only are there lighting apps, lightning pages but there are components in those pages and being able to be aware of the standard right out of the box components and customizing those is going to be important to you as you're building out efficient tools and the ways that are going to help your business partners practice what they do so understanding uh, lightning page types so the really cool thing about Salesforce is it's always iterating it's always improving and there are current pages today at this recording that Salesforce is going to expand on and then you're going to be able to create whether it's visual force pages or other type of interactions that you'll create for your users to enhance your business opportunities and then create custom actions and buttons so it's it's amazing the, the capability that's built into this tool and if your teams need ways in which they can approve items by using an approval button or have specific actions that uh, trigger or enhance the day-to-day -day business of your company you'll be able to be the hero by creating those for your teams so let's jump in What does this look like? So the Lightning App Builder is literally a drag and drop tool. So it makes it easy to create custom pages for the Lightning experience. This wasn't possible in previous iterations in the classic environment. But now you're able to create single page apps, dashboard style apps, and custom pages to display your data in a way that makes sense for your users. So to build the app without code, it means you're literally gonna be able to drag and drop. Some of the components are standard. Some of these, you're gonna be literally creating the components to be able to drag and drop onto the canvas of what you're developing. So what it does is it makes everything quicker and it allows you to interact with off-the-shelf components so you'll be able to make lightning components available so that you and other administrators can build these custom user interfaces and you don't have to write code to do it one quick note salesforce mobile app and the salesforce lightning experience are built with lightning components so this is unique to the Salesforce environment. This is a resident and native capability. And so you can do this right from the out of the box environment. So what are some benefits of this lightning component framework? First of all, like we're saying, there are out of the box sets of components that help you really, you're like a miniature developer and the capability of developing applications 
with efficiency and effectiveness as you begin to find out what it is that your stakeholders and your company need then you can pivot and leverage these tools to provide for them what's going to make them more efficient especially in this remote digital and digital environment it just enhances the capabilities amazingly so this is event driven architecture so any component can can subscribe to an app or a component event so this is really a a subset of artificial intelligence where literally you're putting in place capabilities where the data can interact automatically and it reduces what manually has to be done and allows your users to do what they do best and effect effectively do their job so the framework optimizes performance it's designed to enhance performance capabilities not only your performance but your users so the client server shares only necessary information from the metadata base and the database and one example is you're going to be able to create pages that have accordion type interactions and so building out the components separately and allowing the page to open just what needs to be visible at first glance allows the page to open faster and reduces frustration and wait time for your users so the events we're talking about are communication media between these components they're typically fired by your users they click this like the drop down carrot and that triggers opening the accordion view that we'll be showing you here during this interaction and in our demos so here's a little uh, diagram a pictorial of the types of events and lightning and components and by the way most of your users most of your stakeholders they don't really concern themselves with this level of understanding but you as the admin uh, having a, a perspective of how this works and why it works just makes you more effective and more confident with the tool so the component events are triggered and handled by the component itself or by a component that's already present in the hierarchy so we've talked about hierarchies in other lessons but this is literally hierarchy of data inside and behind the scenes in your org and then application events broadcast messages and all other components which are subscribed to it receive the event notification so here's the process of creating event first of all events created secondly the events registered the event is fired and then the event is handled So in the lightning component, it literally is a compact, configurable, and reusable element that's added to lightning page. And that lightning page is part of lightning app builder. And all of that gives us the component. So the client server framework accelerates development as well as performance so all of this is what's running behind the scenes that users really never see but they are ideal for users especially with their mobile app and lightning experience on their iPads and and desktops it just makes for much more efficient workflow this diagram basically shows you 
the application is the broader structure and then the components can have components inside of them and those components are responding and firing and event connecting inside the application and you don't have to create this apex code it is built into your lightning experience so here's a few screenshots so samples of what we're going to be providing for you when we do our demos but we wanted you to have a view of the hard basically the hard copy of what the page actually looks like so when you're building a lightning app you click on setup home platform tools expand the user interface and then click on lightning app builder and you can see the link here that's exposed down at the bottom and then you have this home page which which is shown in created apps that have their label their name their name space their type and when they were created and last modified so when you're opening a new lightning page the header is going to be at the top in a dark bolded banner there's a toolbar on the left hand side there's a component menu pane here on the left hand side your canvas in the middle and then on the right hand side your properties pane and each of these sections help you build out from standard components that are available and then what you're creating so what do these lightning pages look like what what types are, of pages are there so there's an app page a home page and a record page here's the difference the app page can directly add third-party apps into the lightning experience into your menus and you have quick access to objects that are really have been created by other people or other companies that have been vetted and approved by the Salesforce environment that you now connect to your data in a way that helps enhance for instance there are apps that have leads connected to them and many many businesses need leads and so you can connect these apps into your lightning pages so that for instance your sales team or your marketing team can access those access those leads efficiently so then what's a home page a lightning home page it's a page that depends on apps and the user profile so each of the profiles can have their own home page to look at the data in a way that makes sense and that motivates or enhances their daily business flow and that page can be customized and supported only in the lightning experience and then these specific record pages so a customized version of an object can be presented in this record page detailing it to the user's needs so they're supported in lightning experience but they're really at the deepest and most intuitive and most directly user interfacing level so you've got the app then the home page and then the record page for specific records that you might be uh, making available for your users to have the cleanest most efficient way of doing business and then you build best practices around those pages and you help your users become more and more effective so it's really easy to create these pages it's really going to be finding out what do your users really need and then gauging out and practicing out how you do your business flow as administrator 
because I think you can start saying we're about halfway through this and you could really overwhelm yourself if you promise every one that you're going to do everything for them it could very very quickly become overwhelming so i tend to set up uh, a task flow and then when i come to creating these app pages it's really a few clicks and dragging and dropping information that already there and then building out on it so simply clicking on the app page, entering a name, clicking next, choosing the page layout, how you want it to be viewed. Is it two side uh, regions, three regions, one region across the top? You can make those choices. It, ha it comes with, each, each of these apps come with 15 standard components. And so you can see whether it's a flow quip notifications, recent items, you can make these available to your users, but you can only add global actions to lightning app pages. A global action is an action that can be done across the enterprise by any of your users. So to create the app page, we're clicking on activation. Once we've set it up, we've named it, we've got the page layout, how we prefer it, then we click activation, pick the app, click on add page, and click the save button. So a lighting home page. Now we're clicking on the home page link and we're entering, entering a label name, choosing the template how we want the home page to appear and there are 29 different standard components so rather than worrying about all the things that you're going to have to create you can set this up really in a matter of minutes and make it effective for and available to your users because there's 29 standard components already in place that you could leverage. After creating the home page, we need to activate it. So that's basically just when clicking on this activation button, and then we make it available immediately to the system, or we can keep it in development mode and just keep working on it until we're ready to launch it. So the custom record page. So we would be clicking on new record page link. And very similar, we're giving it a name. We're attaching it to the object we want this record page to be attached to. Could be an opportunity, could be an account page, could be a, a lead object. Those are your options. Then you choose the page template, and you'll have an option to clone what you're creating and add it, customize it as needed, and then click the Finish button. So record pages, again, just like previous steps, they have components that could be automatically added. They have field where you can drop in your canvas, and then they have customizing options available in this display of building out what's prominent and possible. So you've got your way of creating and adding and your design, and you did not have to write any code. So you add the components from the left hand side, drag and drop them into the panel. And then on the right hand side, you adjust those properties as needed and start the activation process. Once you save it, you click on activate. 
and make it available to your users. And in the record page, we've got to assign it what level access we want it. Do we want it to be organization wide? Do we have a, a specific application we want it attached to? And then we need to review what assignments and save it for building lightning pages. What do we need to do to get this in place and provide the best way of doing it? Number one, you got to prioritize what's important and ensure a better load time. When your user clicks on a page, how fast is it upload? What do they need to see first? What are the defaults? And we talked about those accordions and building those out separately so they can drop out when the user clicks on that drop down as needed. So we need to be careful with related lists because they take up real estate for one and then sometimes they take much longer to load based on what data is in that component. Number three, it's recommended not to place components below the activities or chatter. Typically, it's on the right-hand side of the screen because they usually tend to take up a lot of space. And so the components could get lost and your users would have to scroll down and it just makes it less efficient in practices. Then designing the apps for both mobile and desktop so you can look at the form factor and see how is this going to look on the phone because some of your users are going to use almost exclusively that mobile capability and so you need to be aware of how those flow and how the components fit on a smaller screen. Number five, there, there are tips that we need to help our users benefit from as we're building out pages. Those tips are literally, as you're the administrator creating these pages, you're going to have little notes that have been either at the top header or part of your uh, page flow as you're reading utilize those leverage those your users are never see those but you as the admin can benefit if you just take an extra moment and read through what's provided for you number six a compact layout should be configured to control the fields that show up in the highlight panel so there are actually smaller tighter less data components that could be modified and, uh, and made available in your highlights panel and that's going to save your users to be able to go right to that and see what's important from the top down. Number seven, configure the mobile and lightning experience that their action buttons, their page layouts so that they're easy to scroll down on remembering that especially in that mobile environment you want to have chatter available, you want to have activities available, but you don't want your users to be scrolling more than necessary. All right, three types of components. We have standard components, custom components that you create and then components that come from outside sources again in the app exchange that you can access through your setup in your admin environment that these apps have been created by other brilliant companies and teams and you can make them a part of and first of all test them in your sandbox environment to make sure they work how you want them to work and then make them part of your production. Then there's custom components that you 
as you have time, you have capability, and there are needs that you can create. And then lightning components that are standard and built by Salesforce that come right out of the box. Now, it's important to note, to use custom components, you've got to activate my domain in your org. I'm going to show you where that's located. It's not really a difficult scenario. You don't have to create code, but it is something that needs to be installed and used if you want these custom components to be uh, available to your users. And then we find packages containing these components uh, ready to use in the app launcher, and they can become uh, managed packages right inside your environment. Okay, the standard component. So these are right out of the box. So they're typically it, it set up in accordion tabs. They have actions and recommendations. They have Einstein next best practices. There are paths, recent items, recommendations. Um, there are co collaboration usages. And these are standard components that include activities, chatter, topics, Twitter, and then there are functionality, objects, and analytics. All these types of components, including highlight panels, event insights, rich text, related lists, knowledge, quip, uh, automation analytics would include standard components like the flow, visual force pages, report charts, these are all very effective and right out of the box. So the accordion type component helps you display vertically in a stacked section where each can sec section can hold one or more components but they would only expand one at a time. And again, this allows the page to load very quickly. And then if your user needs to see more, they could click that drop down and you can add those sections to your page layouts as needed. The, the launch pad helps us display quick links. So only items with tabs can be linked here, but they, they give us capability of creating this launchpad title, clicking on the select button and selecting the launchpad items, items and making them available in our list. Report charts. So this, these are just really good pictorials so that our users can see the data in a way that is going to be reflective for them. So it gives the ability to modify a report that's in a shared folder and this chart can be directly on that report so it can be added in a sample component right in the lightning page and the chart would be really readily available as soon as they clicked on that page so on the properties pane we pick the report add the filter condition and then we set the component visibility and the filters so that they get users can access them. So the dashboard component allows you to place an entire dashboard and many times the home page of a profile. It's a perfect place. For example, sales would love to see how many cases they've closed or, or, or even a support unit depending on how the cases are set up. This will bring these components into one location and you can set the height and the parameters so this snapshot fits on the page in a way that's effective but easy to scroll on or click on. Again, from the properties pane, you can select the dashboard available and those public Dashboards. You can't choose dashboards that are privately held in private uh, subfolders, but anything that's public could be uh, dropped right onto these pages. 
if you wanted to display uh, record details, then you can make that available as well on your Lightning page. You can make it user centric to where they see what they need to see on the page as it affects them. And see on the page as it affects them. And you have the flexibility to choose the page layout. Flows can be added. So, right directly onto your page, you can set up a wizard style component that allows them to walk through, for example, a survey or uploading items. And that flow can be part of your page. It's screen flows that are supported. You can't just choose any type of flow, but the layout can be one column, two column, depending on what the needs are. There can be rich text components. And so if you needed to drag and drop onto your page something that is an alert, as in this example, the discount alert, you can add those as well right onto your page. You simply enter the text in you want, text area, you add the filters that you want to be added on that, and then you drag and drop it on your canvas. Recent items. So this, this displays records that you recently, the user has recently, recently been looking at. And you can drag that onto your canvas to create the page. In the properties pane, you choose the objects. What you want is recent items. And you save it to your page. List views. So if you want a list of dynamic records. And you want a list view that is uh, the top of accounts or whatever you want set in place then the user can have that available and you can simply add it to the object what uh, records you need that are going to be best for your users and what have been publicly shared and those lists could be dragged and dropped as well paths so especially in a lead process when a lead is moving toward being converted to a contact or account or you have an opportunity that's moving from the introductory start phase all the way through the closing phase so these graphics can be dropped onto your page as well and it's available for objects specifically like opportunities leads campaigns contracts and custom objects as well so we set up the path in our builder and then we drag and drop that especially if it's a custom path that you created tabs so we can create tabs where users could click on and basically drill down into deeper dive in the data they look data they're looking for so this example on the right hand side shows a tab for chatter dashboard or details and you can set that up if that's the best way your users want to interface with the data so we can click on add to tab we can drag and drop it to the position on our canvas and then it will load the default tab first and then users could click on tabs as needed related list so we talked about this at the beginning related lists are available for multiple records and your users many times want to attach related contacts, related opportunities, related cases to an account. So this is where you can 
drag and drop those components. And then items to be approved. So if you have a workflow that requires a manager to approve the next steps, then you can create those and drag them and drop them on your page. Visual Force Pages. So only Visual Force Pages that are enabled for Lightning would be available, but this is marketing departments and departments that have specific needs. These Visual Force Pages can be created for your users as well. We talked about My Domain earlier. So this subdomain offers better login management and authentication and it allows for your name branding and your company name. But just remember, once you've created this new domain, you can't reverse it unless you go reach out to Salesforce to have that Salesforce support make those adjustments. So here's the advantages of my domain. Number one, it highlights your business identity. Two, it allows you to modify, customize your org login screen. It improves security because it blocks redirecting or other domains that don't match. It lets users log in to social accounts like Google, Facebook, LinkedIn. You can set the custom design login to determine how users will authenticate themselves, like a token or a uh, series of letters that would have to be entered that, was, that are sent to a mobile device. Those can be determined in your sub org or your, your, your my domain. And it allows us to work in multiple Salesforce orgs at the same time. So to navigate to my domain, you go to setup, click on home settings, expand company settings, and then click on my domain. And you can see that at the bottom left of the screen here. So once you enable my domain, It'll redirect you to, to choose and register a name. So this screen is showing you where you enter the name, you check availability, and then once it's available, you register that by clicking on the, the register button. Once you've saved that, then you can see a new do domain is created. Once you have it created then you need to deploy it to your users and here's where you just need to coordinate with your management with your stakeholders so that it doesn't disrupt business but it allows users typically at the beginning of a day or end of a day to uh, reconnect any outside links to what they're using on their screen, whether it's their Google connections, their internet connections, their uh, Firefox, or any of these other connection points, they would be able to adjust those to make sure that they're connecting to their Salesforce domain. So what about custom components? So there are components that you can create as the admin and that your users, if you give them that this capability using Aura programming, using Lightning Web Components, or using third-party App Exchange components, we can find them in custom category and Lightning Components page on the questionnaire. We can expand these custom components to see all the available components inside. And then we can drag and drop those components to the empty pane as needed. 
then we need to activate the page like we did in our record pages and other pages we've created and then assign the page to the right permissions so that users the right users can leverage these components so installing them the app exchange components means we go to app exchange search for the required type of component and then leverage our user ID to get those now and typically save them into our sandbox for testing now installing these packages into production is going to allow them to be available immediately so we would typically put them in sandbox first and then move them over as needed so choose which users are able to activate them whether it's all users, specific profiles, or just you as the administrator. Then once it's complete, then you'll be notifi notified with a pop-up and you'll show it in uh, your install packages. So what are some key actions in the Lightning experience? These are action items that you create and or are standard actions that are global and these help users perform operations like creating, editing, modifying records and you can make them a part of your Lightning experience. So a global action menu only contains these actions supported by Lightning it doesn't support uh, chatter actions but you can see a drop down here of these global type actions that your users would be able to use right from the home page and clicking on the global action button so you can create actions for list views many of your users are going to want to edit delete or change owner from their lists and that drop down is available as you set it up as you edit it or change it and are available right out of the box so on the home page you can set up actions whether they're new tasks new events editing emailing right from the assistant component on your home page then you can make actions available on record pages so if they need to follow a specific record uh, an account if they need to create new or edit those are all actions that you can make available on the chatter environment you can allow posts polls and questions to be deliverables right on the chatter page so in order to make these adjustments, you go to Setup, Platform Tools, Expand, User Interface, Expand, Global Action, and then click on the Global Action. So to create a new Global Action, you click on the New button, enter the Action Type, enter the Label. You add the field on which you created the Global Action, and we can drag and drop them right to where we want them on the page now setting predefined field values will help speed up the process help your users be more efficient and you can do that by creating these predefined fields for them to choose so setting these predefined values it's really as easy as you enter the field name, you specify the value, and then you click on the Save button. And we've seen this pattern over and over again. By now, you're starting to get used to how to create these. And it's pretty intuitive, and it's the same type steps over and over. Once you successfully created this action and these predefined fields, then you can add this action to the the global page layout. Go to Setup, Home, Platform Tools, Expand, User Interface, exp 
expand the action, and then click on Publish Your Layout. And you can see the click point here on the lower left. So to add these to a publisher list, you go to the Global Layout, click on Override the Predefined Actions to see the Lightning Experience Actions. And then from the Mobile Lightning Action Drag and Drop Down, you can create Salesforce Mobile and Lightning Experience Actions and then click Save. With these object specific actions, we can update records. So these actions automatically associate with related information. So select the object you want to create, the object manager, go to the buttons, lists and actions, fill in the, the new action details. So if the action type is create record, you make that choice and then you target where you want that created. Then you customize the page layout so you can drag and drop the buttons on the top to where you need them down below and you add ventures to the layout and click the save button. So when you want to set these predefined values you click on the new button and then in that section you enter the field name is subject and enter show ring as a formula value and clicks the save button. So to add this action to the object page layout, you go to object manager, contact, go to page layouts, click the contact layout that you're choosing. And then once you choose that, you override the predefined action so you can set these customized actions for lighting experience. Basically, you're setting this up in the best way that's going to work for your users. And so it makes them more efficient in their day-to-day -day tasks. So you drag and drop this new show ring to the mobile lightning action. Click the save button to finish. So to summarize, we have looked at how to build a Lightning app. We've looked at the different components, standard and custom components that you can create. We looked at Lightning pages and how we can drag and drop instead of creating code to make these interfaces available for our users. We looked at different types of Lightning pages we looked at different types of components and then we set up action buttons or action pivot points for our users in this lightning experience. So thanks for joining us for lesson six, demo one, creating lightning apps. So we've done other types of lightning interface demos and really this demo is to show you different ways you can do the same thing and you'll see as we walk through these lessons and these demos you're going to develop best practices that work for you based on your background where you've come from how you've done what you've done in the past and so this is another way to create the app, the Lightning app environment, and it might work best for you. So remember, we go to the cog in the upper right-hand corner. We click on Setup, and that takes us to the Setup environment. And for this demo, I just simply scroll down to User Interface, and there's the drop down carrot and once I clicked on that drop down then I chose lightning app filter and so now I'm at that home page and again Salesforce is very intuitive with its instructions it gives you kind of an overview 
of what you can do next and then it saves you know what you're doing as you save those elements and you could choose to clone what we've created in the past and then name that build on it adjust it so that you save steps but for our purposes we really want to start from the beginning and remember because i'm in the developer org you can see up here in my url i'm in a dev org so i may not be able to save everything and have an actual test version of this and i'm just giving that disclaimer up front but you'll be able to do that and we, again remember best practice we recommend you do this in your sandbox first and then once it's built in sandbox now you can uh adjust it into uh move it over into production or just recreate uh the newest version in your production org so i click on for our purposes today i click on the new button and now it's taking me to this uh a, a couple of splash pages that give me options and in a future demo we're going to talk about creating a new lightning home page using this method a record page and we'll probably touch on embedded service pages because some of you are in service orgs and they would be there, there are some nuances that are different for uh, service pages that may be important to some of you okay so i click next now i'm going to label this test and i'm going to give it a a year so that we you could put in i'm just making the point you can put in alphanumeric and these characters it'll it'll give you uh, probably over 200 characters you could type in here we're just recommending keep it the nomenclature something that's consistent with your org that you could refer back to that makes it easy for you to relate to right so then we click next and now we have the option of setting this this specific lightning page uh, in, in several different view scenarios so notice as i click it, it's going to give me different regions that i can make available and some of these are going to be important to you some you just want very very basic some are just what your team has requested what your stakeholders need so i'm going to leave it at the header and left sidebar so this is going to give me a main uh action page at the top and then two kind of sidebar environments this would be a menu because this is kind of the most consistent for uh, salesforce users and then this uh number three component area is usually where you find like the main real estate your workspace okay so notice that in the phone environment those three spaces would be vertical and the components would be one after the other uh, in your ipad depending on whether you're talking about a, a workbook or the ipad environment then it's going to be consistent with these views that you see up on screen okay so when i click finish again salesforce is going to talk you through a step by step and you could actually take a quick walk through for just generic and and a generic experience you know the first time you've been through this and i'm going to recommend that you take the time you know set set aside time to walk through each of these steps so that you see hey this wow i can do this in this environment but remember, you're going to have this menu area where you can drag and drop from here into your canvas area, which is the middle. And then over here, you, you have a publish editor. So the right-hand side, once you drop the component from the left-hand side into your canvas area, now on the right-hand side, you can make specific changes. I'll give you an example so uh many times 
we would put something like a recent item up towards the top and notice that we could select there it's showing one recent item and three records to this to display there's not really a label in place right now other than recent items but I could adjust that and notice it's telling you you can use expressions to define this area and so you could put your recent items right up front I'm gonna bring that back over off of the canvas by clicking on the uh, delete button the little it looks like a little trash can and I'm gonna put rich text up here and now notice that I could create whatever rich text I wanted and put it in place and adjust it with bullet points uh, display as a card I could also style it out to look uh, with different backgrounds and I'm gonna put uh, for the day and I'm going to make that bolded and notice it's in blue right now I could change that color to different colors if I wanted to let's make it a a, a red so that it really stands out and again I'm in a developer org so it's not gonna always give me exactly the color that you you can choose from in your settings all right so I've got that in place that 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 notice it's already put thought for the day in the area that rich text area and so I could update that daily if I needed to all right some here's that recent items again and I'm gonna put recent items so they show up and then on the left hand side and then a dashboard here that if there were dashboards available right now it's showing because I'm in the developer org and there's not really anything in place that I I would have to create that dashboard so let's see if there's report a uh, report chart that would be available okay so it looks like there's sample flow report screen area so that's just a basic I could add more uh, if there was visual force pages if there were components custom components that I had created down below here if there was a chat feed maybe that would be good for this area notice I need to make sure I touch the component above it and release it so it's green and no as soon as it became green now there's my uh, stakeholders have said they really want to see the uh, chat feed that's most recent so once I click on save now so I'm just giving you the a basic basic overview of possibilities that you could create for this lightning app and once I click save now it's saying okay I can make it visual to all my users or I could say not yet because I still want to develop it and I want other testers to see it first on my team but if this is something I really I'm ready to activate it and we need it right now notice that I can set up page settings so if I wanted to do choose an icon to represent this page if I wanted to activate it you know for system administrators only and just people on my direct team if I wanted to change the name from here if I wanted uh, lightning experience scenarios to to be able to these different apps to be able to see this specific page then I would grab that and drag drag it into know the sales console side or what I wanted in place and how I wanted to add the page to that app so notice here's all the different 
tabs and objects that are available in the sales console. So I want these different apps to be able to access that. And so I also want my service team to be able to see this as well. And so I've chosen that page. And then if I had mobile experiences that I wanted to be able to navigate to this, then I could make those specifics available as well. So I'm going to click save because I've made my choices on that, those pages. Notice it's been, it just told me it was activated successfully. So this test lightning page has been created and notice if I wanted to see how it would look on my phone, then there's, here's a quick preview. Thought for the day would be the top recent items and then chat feed and then other uh, feeds down below. If I wanted to see how this would look in the tablet mode in portrait view. So there's how it will look on my tablet. So that gives you a quick overview of how those changes have been made. And now I want to go back and come out of the builder into my setup page and you can see here's what I just created and so now let's go back and look in our app launcher and look for that page and there's S 2021 and so this is now that page we just created and it's accessible to the apps we wanted to have available and now users because we're in production production could save this as a tab a normal regular tab and begin using it immediately all right thanks for your time we'll look forward to seeing you in our next demo Okay, welcome to uh, demo two of lesson six. So we're, lo we're looking at lightning apps and creating in the lightning environment. So we want to go back to the home record and app pages and take a look at how those are created. Remember, we're, you're using the cog gear, we're clicking on setup. Uh, we're coming down to uh, user interface and then we're, we're Clicking the drop down carrot and we're choosing lightning app builder and we've created these in the past and so we want to create instead of cloning I'm just going to give you a quick view of we could go right back in and clone what we did here and so that if we like this uh, adjust it make additions to it and then save it as a different uh, lightning page so a lightning creation but for our purposes we really want to start new again because I wanted you to see we we looked at an app page a home page option a record page and so let's go to the home page and in one of our previous demos, we walked through these whole steps of typing out alpha and numeric choices. Again, we have different regions. Uh, we can make it look standard. We could create custom and add those down below. I'm going to leave it as the header in the three regions for right now. And so my canvas sets up to where I have something on the very top and then I can add. Components as needed. 
So, for this, let's choose an Einstein next best action. And notice there's not any strategies or anything in place right now. So, that would probably confuse our users. So, let's get for this home page. Let's add a list view so that this would be the very first thing that the user would see when they log in and rather than the anomaly event let's get all of their probably their opportunities a list of all opportunities in front of them and if we wanted to narrow that down we could put the listing of opportunities closing this month. And notice it's showing us it's only going to show up to three rows of, of information. And it's giving us the capability to enable in, inline editing or these other options that might make it just best for our users. And just before we uh, save this, let me see if there's anything else that maybe if we chose close next month. So I can see there's really not anything in this demo org that is closing right away. But in Opportunity Pipeline, now here's some information that might be important to our users so that they could have that right in front of them as soon as they log in. I'm going to choose the chatter feed because chatter feed typically is uh, important to especially uh, individual users that have, they need to collaborate. I'm going to uh, drop in today's events and today's tasks. So basically what we're showing our users, here's where your pipeline is right now. Here's how your business is flowing right now. Here's what you said you wanted to do today and you wanted to have on target and on task today. Here, as far as appointments, because events are calendar, uh, calendarized, scheduled appointments. And then tasks are what are some things I told myself, I got to have this done today. And then... Sort by is uh, th this capability of your chatter flow. And notice as I click on each component, it would let me adjust. And I could put here what I follow as my main component that would show up. And today's tasks, if I needed to add a filter to choose what kind of field, what kind of task. So if I'm using user fields, then I could check on specifically focus on emails and it'll give me that information that I could see any email that contains sp this specific type value and uh, maybe the name of an account that I could put in place and it'll show me here's specifically what I'm focusing on for my task. So you can see there are a lot of options from my menu column to my publishing editing column and then my canvas. There are just many, many options that you may want to test and try out and then have a, another administrator on your team or someone else, a, a trusted, uh, member of your company and they could specifically test out what you're trying 
remember I can save it for later and say you know I don't really want it activated right now and so when I save it it will hold this in place and allow me to come back to my setup environment and there's my test home page in place so those same type of steps exactly what we did there we could follow through with a record page and so record pages are going to be typically attached to uh, a specific object so this is a test record page and I'm gonna put uh, a year you could put a date uh, you could put whatever uniquely identifies what you want to happen and I'm focusing on opportunities today so I'm gonna uh, make sure this record page is connected at the opportunity object level and again here's all my different options of how I would want this record page to be displayed to my users and I can have it grouped with header and one region header and a sidebar which is th the default header in three regions that's usually a default for a home page one basic region then I could pin the headers and so that it would always default back to this and if that's you know your users are going to be coming back to the specific same location over and over again here's where you can make that happen and for our our purposes I'm just going to come back to the group header and one region and when I click finish again it, it'll walk me through a do tutorial but and it gives me a pop-up that I could customize the page for mobile and as these uh, iterations change three times a year you'll be able to walk through and drop in just details that are important so I'm dropping in components that uh, I'm acting as if I had talking talked to my stakeholders had conversations and now they want this in place for this record page and so I'm gonna put the opportunity at the top and then I'm gonna show a path notice that I could change my path to linear or nonlinear and I can save those uh, and make it to where it hides the path update it allows me to again to show how the path works so these are all capabilities that you can look at and then you can actually analyze is this a good type of page is it a good for my desktop is it good for my phone will it show indicators that I'm looking for and then once I save it then I can activate it now and this is important whether we're talking about a home page an app page if I allow it to be an organizational default then every business unit every user would have access but if I want it to default just to one specific type app or if I have specific assignments for where I want this specific page to go to then I can choose yep I want it to go to sales 
and I want it to be on their console. So these two apps would have access to this. And I really, for the sales team, I know I want it both on their desktop and their phone, but for the console, it really wouldn't be effective on the phone. So I make it only for their desktop. And when I click next, now I can save this as the master. And when there's relationships set up to child relationship scenarios, then here's where I can make a, a child relationship be created. So I'm going to allow marketing users to have that access. And here it's showing me what I put in place and what has the master relationship and now I can click save and now we've want to activate that and it's in place it's saved I chain I just make sure that there's if there's anything that need to be changed and so now this record page would be available I'm going to choose the sales console environment And when I use my drop down, and I check on, so where would the page be located? Then there's the test page we've created in previous uh, demos. So here's where the Lightning App Builder is showing us what we created, what's in place, what record type it is, the type of profile that can use it, and whether or not they're in the desktop or desktop and phone environment. So that gives you an overview of creating lightning home pages record pages and app pages uh, we'll take a, mo a moment to look at service pages in our next demo so demo three 
uh, lesson six. So we're still focusing on lightning apps and, and components and being creative in the lightning environment. And so we talked about uh, service pages. We've, we've kind of done all the other interactions, but we want to show you adding a standard type component into a service environment. So again, we're back in our demo org. We use the cog to get us to set up. We scroll down to user interface and then we chose lightning app builder and you can see all the things we've we've created we've created a couple of record pages an app page a home page and so now we're gonna again we've we've mentioned that we can clone these pages one of the things i want to mention about home page we when you're choosing uh organizational wide default i did have an administrator that uh wanted separate separate home pages for different business units and so you can create that in each individual app so each of those apps could have and that makes sense each app could have their own basically their start off for each morning but when they chose to apply it they chose organizational wide default so everyone saw the same home page that's not a terrible thing it's not uh, going to permanently lock your org into that if you set up any of these they can be edited and so that's important capability to know that once we create these they're not done forever they don't have to be uh, sent off off-site and checked and validated you have control to make those editing and, and deletion points as needed. Just be aware that when you make those kind of changes, uh, this particular admin, the very minute that she made it, the, the homepage she was designing, uh, an organizational by default, then one of the business units immediately texted her and said, uh, I, my homepage has changed. I just clicked back to it. And it's different than we had it before so it's no harm no foul you could go back and make those adjustments and she, within like two minutes or less she was able to change and get right back to what she needed to see and, and what the business unit needed so my whole point of that discussion is we're going to come in and now look at a service page but we could edit this once we create it so I'm going to create this as a test service page and I like to put in a year uh, just so it, it cues me when this was created notice that the, the really the only object we have as a drop-down choice right now in this specific org is a service appointment object I click next so there's the default that's how it's designed today and now here I am back at my uh, three areas of creation so I have here's my menu and over here is my editing capabilities and then here in the middle is my canvas so these are all standard notice their standard capabilities standard components in the lightning environment and then as we're creating and you get better and and more adept at creating new components that are unique to your environment then they would show up here in your menu and you could drag and drop and then edit them as needed so I think the first thing we're going to do here is drop into the canvas. This first type of component and then appointment times and if there was data. So you can tell I haven't used a lot of service data in this org, 
but you could make these adjustments and these changes and describe them and this can become part of the service environment and then you can add and remember we we allow the component to go green and then if we were going to add components in new tabs then here's where we could create those new tabs in this left-hand environment and name those tabs appropriately and then adjust them as needed and each of those would be would show up in our canvas as needed so again I'm right now showing the tablet view many of our service agents are in the field and so they're going to be looking at a phone or a tablet and so that's showing you how those tabs would show up in their environment then I can click activate and I could deploy it as needed so there's no current de deployment needed or necessary so I can activate this as needed and right now there's in this environment we're ready to deploy we're in that position where we've put in standard components everything is good to go and we've made say saved uh, components in their place and now if we go to the service app then we could begin uh, viewing and looking at embedded in specific areas what's best for my service team so now you can see when I use my service setup application I click on service setup it takes me to my service set setup home page and I drop down to user interface and lightning app you can see there is the embed embedded service page that we created when I click on it now you can see it is a lightning page that if I had need and needed to update it then I click on the edit button and I'm right back to as that da da data is available now I can leverage this for my service team all right, that concludes our three demos on Lightning Components. Look for us in our next lesson. We've talked about the Creative Hat where we're creating uh, pages that would, or, or apps, or user interface that would allow users to uh, enhance or upgrade their their capabilities their functionality so they can match their business flow with what's available to them uh, whether it's list views on a home on a home page or dashboards uh, accessible on different objects those are all the creativity side there's the administration side where if users have uh, login issues or if uh, they need to be trained these are all different hats that an admin uh, a system admin would need to wear in their organization and in this lesson we're looking more at the configuration hat so admins typically do not write code although they they may have uh, some background or some capabilities but really they're so busy we have other people developers architects and, and other implementation experts that typically would write the code word world but we still need to automate our system as much as possible to reduce manual input so lesson seven is about the configuration hat and what an admin would need to be ready to do or capable of doing 
to build out these and configure these automated flows without building or writing code. And Salesforce makes that possibility a reality. So what are the learning objectives for this lesson? After this complete, completing this lesson, you should, number one, understand what a workflow is. Two, be able to create workflows and the actions that are, are a part of or attached to an individual workflow. Understand approval processes. So there are managers who need to approve uh, quotes or prices or part of the business functionality. And you should, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to understand how that works and then be able to create uh, an approval process for your org and then work with the lightning process builder. So the automation world in Salesforce lightning is just so enhanced and effective that we feel like it's very important uh, for admins to understand it. So process automation. A process, let's, let's talk about terms first of all. A process is a series of actions that are carried out in order to achieve a particular result. So this is the tool repeating an activity or providing a, a deliverable in a process environment that doesn't have to be done manually. So it makes users more efficient and allows them to focus on other important parts of the business that they could be doing specifically. An automation tool is the process of building this tool out, which triggers actions based on predefined rules. So the tool itself has logic built in and you can set in motion to make the processes flow correctly. And so there's customization that can happen that doesn't have to be sent off to another office somewhere but can happen right in your org in uh, real time. And best practice, obviously, is to uh, set these in a sandbox environment and test them, you know, have your UAT environment and then move them into production. But the automating process is defined by criteria that you set up that will start an action after something else has triggered and or the action has been completed. So let's see how that works. So a workflow, an approval process, and process builders can all work together to create a seamless flow of activity that allows a user either to save an item or trigger an item in your org that then allows automation to finish or complete or create the next step. So workflows, let's take a deeper dive into workflows. Workflow is a Salesforce out of the box tool that helps us automate our business processes. It allows us to define the rules to automate certain actions when a particular criteria is met. So here's some benefits. Improving the quality and consistency of data. So you can imagine if everything in your org always had to be entered or completed manually, then the workload for your user is exponential it's so much more they have to physically do which just you know they have their regular job let's say it's a salesperson and they're trying to sell the items that your company makes or provides and if they have to at 
every step and at every object and for every report, enter everything in manually, then it's the consistency will drop and the quality and integrity of the data will drop just because the human factor is would be would be overwhelming. So data in integrity is increased because it's a repetitive automatic process. So efficiencies, productivity, lowering costs and reducing risks. So anytime even even in an upload environment then your data structure can be impacted, right? I mean that's that's just a given. And so what we're trying to do with workflows is automate at every point so that there's less user interface, especially behind the scenes at, at this data level. So workflows allow us to automate different types of actions. So an email alert. So there are many, many reasons that managers or groups or different business units need to be alerted when, for example, a certain threshold is, is met in an opportunity pipeline or uh, someone is has triggered uh, the approval of a discount, then managers need to be alerted regardless and previous to workflows, it's really a manual. Someone has to remember to send the email that, uh, or request the email via the normal manual email process. Tasks can be automated. Outbound messages. So outbound means something that's not inside the native structure like chatter or, or tasks that are shared among users, but a message that's sent to a platform or an entity outside of the Salesforce environment. And then field updates. So literally if uh, a, a certain threshold or plan stage is met, then a field could be updated to show automatically, here's the amount or the next step or whatever logic needed to be built in. Simply one notice to, before we go on to the next screen, workflow rules are triggered when the data is saved. So they don't happen automatically. Uh, again, best practices to, to create these in sandbox, but either way, they are not triggered until the data is saved. So here's some workflow rule components. So there's there's two different main components, the criteria and the action. So the criteria are the conditions that trigger the action, which should take place. And then the action should be performed when those criteria are met. So the little diagram below shows here's the workflow that's set up. Criteria are met equals true. And then the action is implemented. So there's three different types of evaluation criteria for workflows. So they evaluate when a rule is created. So it runs the rule if the criteria is met only when the record is created. Using this option, the rule runs one time only. So if you think about it, when it's created and saved, one time workflow is initiated created and every time it's edited so these are different options of criteria so this runs the rule if the criteria is met every time a record is created and when it's edited this option allows the rule criteria to run repeatedly as long as the rule criteria is met little side note Time dependent actions cannot be added in a workflow when this criteria is in place. And you can you can imagine if you were trying to do a uh, 
a workflow that initiates a certain time that something would be triggered, you can't set that up in an environment where every time it's edited, the time would have to be recalculated. So it's not possible with this uh, second type of evaluation criteria. The third type is created and every time it's edited and sub subsequently meets the criteria. So the rule runs always when a record is created and when it meets that criteria or only when a record not meeting the criteria is up criteria is updated and now it meets the criteria this is the default when you're creating a workflow so just be aware that salesforce will default to this criteria so immediate actions and time triggered actions we talked about that in the last screen but an immediate action this kind of workflow the workflow actions execute immediately whenever a re record meets the conditions specified in the workflow rule a time triggered action is ex executed at a specific time which is specified in the when this action is created so the scheduled date and time it verifies that the record is still meeting the criteria or not notice that the action workflow rule can also trigger the execution of other workflow rules so these rules can trigger other rules the time triggered uh, action there's a couple a few important points to remember one cannot be added to active Salesforce workflows so if you're going to try to build on a workflow that's already active you can't do it this way to add a time trigger action you first deactivate the workflow rule and then add the action so it can't literally be running and you try to attach something new to it but you can deactivate the existing workflow and then add this action another time trigger cannot be added if there's already a time trigger action scheduled for that object and that makes sense right because if you already have a time trigger for this to happen on a certain day of the month at a certain time then if you try to add a secondary action on top of that then the logic basically will loop inside the org so workflow rules let's look at them at a deeper level there's four different acts types of actions we mentioned that in earlier screens email alert field updates task and outbound messages so these actions can send automated emails using a template and then salesforce provides a functionality so that you could create the template so if you think about something that's automatically sent you need to create and allow the action to choose what will be sent when the criteria is met so those workflow actions now they change a field value on the record that initially triggered the workflow rule if reevaluate workflow rules after field cha change is enabled then salesforce will reevaluate the workflow rule if it needs updates and results need to happen only workflow rules that didn't fire before they were re-triggered or cross object field updates uh, are available for changing the values of the fields related to a master record so the point being there are lots of options and again this would be why we would originally set up a workflow especially the first few times you're doing it and then allow users to test what you're doing and then from there uh, building it out in your production environment so it's it's assigning a task to a single user we can make sure that email notifications are sent to the right assignee 
uh, task can be assigned to roles if there's only one user assigned to that role. If there's more than one user assigned, then the, the task would automatically be assigned to the owner of the workflow rule users who triggered the workflow rule. So these are just points to keep in mind as you're creating. Uh, an outbound message sends particular information to an endpoint and these type of messages can be listened to using the SOAP API. So all actions can be used as immediate action as well as time trigger actions. Time trigger actions which are already triggered are visible in the time-based workflow queues. Administrators can also set default workflow users and default workflow users are the users that will be visible when the user that triggered the rule is not active. Here's some limitations. So basically we just gave you an overview of, wow, there's a lot of creativity, a lot of options, um, a lot of uh, moving part type scenarios that once you do a few of these, then it becomes easier and easier because you're, you know, aware of and more used to setting those in place. But here are some limitations. So the results of a field update cannot trigger additional rules such as validation rules, assignment rules, auto response, or escalation rules. So a workflow rule can't trigger all these other types of rules. The results of a field update can trigger additional workflow rules if you flag the field update to do that. So one workflow rule can trigger another workflow rule, but you've got to flag it to do that. And you can't make a field universally required if it's used by a field update that sets the field into a blank value. Workflow rules that update owners don't also transfer associated items. So to ensure the transfer, you have to click change next to the owner's name in a record and make sure you transfer those selections. So if any of the triggered workflow rules result in another field update, it's also enabled for workflow rule evaluation. So it's a dominate a domino effect. And the more the workflow rule can be reevaluated as such a result, the newly triggered field would be updated. So you just have to be aware that a domino effect can be created and that might be what you want to happen. So this cascade of workflow, uh, the reevaluation and triggering can happen up to five times after the initial field update that started it. Only workflow rules on the same object as the initial field update will be reevaluated and triggered and only workflow rules workflow rules that didn't fire before can be re-triggered. Cross-object workflow rules aren't candidates for re-evaluation. So, creating workflow rules. We're going to do a demo uh, in the live org, but we just want to give you the screenshots and the screens available that show you go to Setup, Home, Platform Tools, Expand, process automation and click on workflow rules. So the detail page will show what you currently have in place and then allow you to create new by clicking on the new button. So these steps are required to create a workflow rule. First, you have to select the object that you want associated to this workflow rule. Select the evaluation criteria and the rule criteria, specify the workflow actions, and then activate the workflow rule. First, you have to select the object. So, step two, we need to fill in 
the three areas one is required and the description and then choosing the fields so the first area is we're putting in the rule name and we can optionally give it a description then we've got to create choose the created uh, criteria so we talked about this in earlier screenshots so you have the choice of only firing the workflow when it's created when it's created and every time it's edited or created and any time it's edited to subsequently meet the criteria so part of that would be testing once you create it is this how we want it to automate so when a record is created or when it's edited and did not previously meet the rule criteria the rule is not re-triggered on the record updated that does not affect the specified rule criteria for, so for example we've created a workflow rule by selecting this option and the record status equals unvalidated if in the rule this workflow rule will fire when the account is created and the record status is status is unvalidated or it will fire when the existing record is updated with the record status equaling unvalidated if the previous value is set secondly only when the record is created this is to ignore any subsequent updates you don't want it to be updated it's just when this record is created the tr the rule would fire and then it, every time the record is created or edited you choose this option to include new records inserts and updates to the existing records and these actions will would ca will cause repeat triggering of the rule as long as the record meets the criteria so if the rule criteria there there are two ways of formulating the logic right run this rule where it equals criteria are met or run this rule the formulate evaluates to true so you can set up which logic flow you want to follow so if you choose criteria met this option displays by default and it allows the user to select the field from the drop down and select the operation from the list of values so an example the field is close date operator equals value is today or the field is closed not equal to true the add row link allows us to add more criterion to the options up to a maximum of 25 and we can give the filter logic so this allows a, a yes no boolean expression to set the criteria so you can have one or two one and two so in the one or two case the criteria are met will be true when any one of the criteria is true one and two in this case are criteria met both when both criteria are true so the formula evaluates to true criteria and this option it allows you as the admin to enter the formula that returns a value of true or false and the application triggers the rule if the formula returns true so you want to check the syntax so you after you've set up your criterion then you click check syntax and if there's no area errors then you can move on and click save and next so number three specify the workflow action so you can have immediate or time-based right and you can make those choices on this page which allows to configure those actions so i'm adding the immediate workflow so you're you're clicking on add workflow action from the drop down to the immediate workflow and you're choosing the below options so you can choose new task to create a task associated with the role new email alert 
to create that alert for your end users. Uh, new field update to define this field. New outbound message to define the outbound message associated with the rule. And select existing action to select what actions you want associated with the rule. So let's look at configuring tasks for the workflow rules. Again, you're going to set up home platform tools, expand the process automation, click on workflow rules, click on edit beside the workflow rule that you want to configure. And so here's your detail page that allows you to start making these options. When you click on the new task from the drop down list, then you'll have these type of availabilities drop down in a pick list. So when you select an assignee, it can be uh, in the form of a user, role, record, owner, and so on. And when you're entering a subject for the task, then you give a unique name for that task and then choose a due date status the priority when the due date appears in the time of the assignee and then set the notify assignee checkbox to send the email notification when the task is assigned next you would choose the protected component checkbox to mark the alert as protected you could and step six enter any comments on the description we would recommend best practice that at least you give yourself some type of clarity so when you come back to this in the future you have a reference point of why this was created or for what purpose and then step seven go to the assigning user login and check this task in my tax task section by clicking on the home tab Configuring email alerts for workflow rules. Remember, if you're going to have an email sent, triggered, sent, triggered, email sent, triggered, if you're going to have an email sent, triggered, then the, the Salesforce auto intelligence has got to have something to pull from to send that email so we're clicking on setup home platform tools expand the process automation click on the workflow rules click on the edit button beside the workflow rules that you want to configure and then you're clicking on add workflow action and you're selecting new email alert from your drop down list and then to configure this alert, you need to enter a description for the email alert, enter a unique name for the email alert, choose the email template, uh, uh, the creation of the email. So we're clicking on setup, home, platform tools, expand the process, automation, click on the workflow rules, click on the edit button beside the workflow rules that you want to configure. And then you're clicking on add workflow action and you're selecting new email alert from your drop down list. And then to configure this alert, you need to enter description for the email alert enter a unique name for the email alert choose the email template uh the creation of the email field but uh you've got to make sure it's entered and you give it a unique name so configuring the email alert for the workflow so the protected component checkbox is used to mark the alert as protected and we select who should receive this email alert from the available options. If the owner is selected, then the email alert is sent to the user 
who is set as the owner of the record. All of that makes sense. It's drop-down capability. Uh, Salesforce is making it as easy as possible possible for us. Now, the if the course team selected, then we have to choose from the list of users that are assigned to a particular team. So the email alerts are only sent when the rule is associated with a specific object. And the user listed in the record creator is the user who is set by the created by the field. So all of these are resolved as you walk through the drop downs. And it's not really a complex scenario. It's much easier than code. It's choices you can make in these drop downs. So the email address field is selected, the email field on the contact record, and the owner of the record. You choose the list of the users in particular public group. All of those things are right there on the page and can walk you through it. Uh, you choose from the list of users assigned to a particular role. Uh, you could choose from the list of users plus the users in a role that, that are below that role. Or you can choose from a list of specific users. So these are just choices you could have this email alert sent to. You can select the recipients who should receive this email uh, available recipients list. You can interrupt the five additional recipient email addresses. They may or may not be users in Salesforce, but you can set from the email address to either the current user or default the workflow to the workflow user's email. Then you click the save button. Make sure you save what you did. Workflows. So again, you're going to set up home platform tools, exp expand the process automation, click on the workflow rules, click on the edit button beside the workflow that you want to configure. And all of that is really, it's, it's a similar process that we walked through in this entire lesson. And it's very intuitive, just going right down that these fields are available in front of you. So you click on the workflow, add workflow action button. You select a new field update from the drop downs, enter a name, unique name from the field update. In our description, not required, but it's recommended. And then upon choosing the field update, a new section called specify new field appears where you can set the logic for the de desired field update. So again, you're just walking through basically a punch list that is allowing you to use drop downs and all of the coding and the development is going on behind the scenes and you're just making choices that are going to be in the best interest of what your stakeholders are asking for in this workflow requirement. So available options depending on the type of the field uh, are, are the following scenarios. So if you need check boxes then you can specify that's what you want. Or choose uh, you choose true to select the checkbox, false to, to deselect it. If you want a pick list, then you select a special value from the checkbox, pick list options, in this, and specify the new field section when you make this choice. So configuring these updates, here's some special bullet points to remember. You need to follow these steps. Choose a blank value null if you want to remove any existing value and leave the field blank. Choose a formula to set the new value up, up to calculate the value based on the formula logic. Click on save to complete the configuration of the field update. So if you're adding existing actions, so we can add existing either task, alert, uh, update directly from the selected existing action options. So again, set up home platform tools, expand process automation, click on the workflow rules, click on the edit button besides the workflow rule, and now you've got this page in front of you and we're walking down those choices. 
click add workflow action. Choose select existing action. In the select existing action page, you choose the type of action that you want to add. So this sounds familiar, right? And then you click the save button. It's just making the choices you want to make. And again, best practices is we do this in sandbox. We test it, uh, UAT testing, let some users uh, that you're comfortable with, uh, make sure the flow works like you want it to, and then you put it in production. Outbound message sends information to a designated endpoint. So uh, like an external service, you can configure outbound messages from setup you must configure the external endpoint and create a listener for the message using the SOAP API. So you're entering the details, you're putting in a unique name. And so it can be referred to in the API listing. You're giving it an endpoint URL. So the, the recipient who is going to get this message will be sent a SOAP message to that endpoint and then you click on the save button to complete the outbound outbound message configuration so if you're going to be choose a formula to set the new value up, up to calculate the value based on the formula logic. Click on save to complete the configuration of the field update. So if you're adding existing actions, so we can add existing either task, alert, uh, update, directly from the selected existing action option. So again, set up home, platform tools, expand, process automation, Click on the workflow rules, click on the edit button besides the workflow rule, and now you've got this page in front of you, and we're walking down those choices. Click add workflow action. Choose select existing action. In the select existing action page, you choose the type of action that you want to add. So this sounds familiar, right? And then you click the save button. It's just making the choices you want to make. And again, best practices is, is we do this in sandbox. We test it, uh, UAT testing, let some users uh, that you're comfortable with, uh, make sure the flow works like you want it to, and then you put it in production. Outbound message sends information to a designated endpoint. So uh, like an external service, you can configure outbound messages from setup you must configure the external endpoint and create a listener for the message using the SOAP API. So you're entering the details, you're putting in a unique name. And so it can be referred to in the API listing. You're giving it an endpoint URL. So the, the recipient who is going to get this message will be sent a SOAP message to that endpoint. And then you click on the save button to complete the outbound, outbound message configuration. So if you're gonna be adding a time dependent workflow, so now you need to click on add time trigger and the same dependent workflow action section, specify a number of days to hours before or after the date relevant to the record, such as the date record was created or modified, additional immediate or time dependent actions can be configured. You click on the done button and you can move on. Here's some uh, specifics to be aware of. We cannot trigger a time trigger when the rule criteria is set to every time a record is created or edited. The time trigger button will be disabled. And that just makes sense. You're going to get looping logic if you tried to do that. So it's Salesforce is basically just blocking us from making that error. The add time trigger button is unavailable when the rule is already active. You've got to deactivate it in order to apply the action. Also, the rule is deactivated but has pending actions of the workflow queue. So you can't set these time sensitive, time dependent workflows if either one of those three 
bullet items are in play. Activating and monitoring the workflow role. So the Salesforce CRM will not trigger the workflow until we have manually activated it. So to activate it, we go to workflow rule detail page, click on the activation link, and click deactivate to stop it from triggering. So it has to be activated manually. We can use time-based workflow queue to monitor, monitor any outstanding workflow rule that has this time dependency, right? The following path helps us review the pending actions and cancel if necessary. So we go to setup, home, platform tools, expand environment, expand monitoring, and click on time-based workflow. Okay, monitoring this workflow queue. The queue includes scheduled paths and there, there are time dependent workflow actions, scheduled actions for processes built in the process builder and the flow resume events. So give the criteria criteria and click on search. So you're setting up your criteria. Then understanding these, these cross object fields. So for all custom and some standard objects, we can create workflow actions where a change to a detailed record that updates the field on the related master record is there. So cross object field updates work for custom to standard, master to detail relationships, custom to custom, custom master to detail relationships, standard to standard, master detail relationships. So these cross object fields are viable in those environments. So we can create a workflow rule that sets the active check checkbox to true. And when a designated detail object is created with the status equal to active. The above example uses the creation of active data type equals checkbox on the opportunity and designation custom object and st number three status the data type equals the pick list on designation object values active and inactive so we can use cross object field updates for these three scenarios these, these three cases Number one, for all custom objects that are children of scenarios, these three cases. Number one, for all custom objects that are children of custom objects in the master detail relationship. Number two, for all custom objects that are children of certain standard objects in the master detail relationship. Number three, for standard objects that are children of standard objects. Standard objects that are children of standard objects in that master detail relationship. So configuring these, we're, we're going to very similar places that we've just been. Set up home, platform tools, expand process automation, click on workflow rules, click on edit button beside the workflow rule you want to configure. So once we click on add workflow action, click on the new field update. So that here we enter the name, the unique name of the field update. We can enter a description. We've talked about that multiple times. And then we select a detail object. Uh, for example, details object in the master detail relationship. Once the detail object is selected and the field to update will automatically populate the master detail account fields and detail opportunity fields. Select the field and specify new field value and click save. So we can create four different types of email templates. The simple basic text, you know, rich text format, HTML, which 
would allow us to use letterhead custom templates without using a specific letterhead or visual force pages that would allow email template creation and and be a part of that embedded template so for the text environment all users can create or change the text email templates for the HTML administrators and users with the edit HTML permissions can create those specifics without using a letterhead and then custom and visual force pages developers can create the visual force allow for advanced merging with the recipients data and can contain information from multiple records so all of these templates can include text merge fields and attach files we can include images on the html and visual force templates text and html templates can also be used when we send mass email we can't send a mass email using a visual force email template so again we're going to set up home administration expand email and then click on classic email templates so let's, let's take a deeper dive into the, the creating these templates so first of all we click on the new template button choose the text template type click next choose the folder which to store the template that makes sense we're going to want to come back and return to it once you've created this template you want to save it in the place that's going to be effective be able to get to it easily and then be able to share
format HTML which would allow us to use letterhead custom templates without using a specific letterhead or visual force pages that would allow email template creation and and be a part of that embedded template so for the text environment all users can create or change the text email templates for the HTML administrators and users with the edit HTML permissions can create those specifics without using a letterhead and then custom and visual force pages developers can create the visual force allow for advanced merging with the recipients data and can contain information from multiple records. So all of these templates can include text, merge fields, and attached files. We can include images on the HTML and visual force templates. Text and HTML templates can also be used when we send mass email. We can't send a mass email using a visual force email template. So again, we're going to set up home administration, expand email, and then click on classic email templates. So let's, let's take a deeper dive into the, the creating these templates. So first of all, we click on the new template button, choose the text template type, click next. Choose the folder in which to store the template. That makes sense. We're going to want to come back and return to it once you've created this template. You want to save it in a place that's going to be effective, be able to get to it easily, and then be able to share with appropriate other roles and or individual users in your platform. So you choose the folder which to store the template, select available uh, for use checkbox to make sure it's going to be available to everyone who needs access. And then it will be offered to those specific users or profiles. So enter the email template name and allow when you tab forward a Salesforce creates the API unique name. Select a default encoding setting to determine the character set for the template. And enter the description for the template. Both template name, description are for internal use. So the name of the template, uh, your clients or people you send these to won't see what you called it as the naming convention. You enter description. It's almost always optional but will help you in future reference points enter the subject makes sense that you want to have uh, uh, an important a catchy a uh, straightforward you know it's the first banner that our eyes see when we open an email so it's trying to be effective and efficient but also uh, eye-catching Enter the text that's going to appear on the message. Okay, some options are you can enter merge fields in the template subject and the text body. These fields are replaced with information uh, on the form itself. These fields will, will be replaced with information from records when the email is sent so there's the little brackets that are showing up for you when you're creating this but it's going to pull from whatever you've set up whether it's the sender's name recipient's name um, you can have macros you can have uh, email signatures all as part of uh, these merge fields that save keystrokes and once, once it's set up one time you don't have to repeat set up merge fields serve as placeholders for data that will be replaced with information records user information company information when we insert the count number 
merge field in an email, the template the syntax is bracket exclamation account dot account number bracket. So that's just one example. We won't read through every single example type, but that's one example. Creating custom HTML email templates. That was basically the rich text version. So you go in the same exact place, uh, but you, this time you're just making sure you're clicking on classic letterheads. Again, uh, check on the available use for the, make sure it's usable for all your users. Make sure that little tick mark is, is set. Fill the letterhead label and press tab. Click on save the button at the bottom of the top to make sure your work is saved. So upon clicking save, we can uh, navigate, we'll be directed to the letterhead customization screen. So we'll have flexibility to adjust the header, the body, and the footer. Creating HTML classic templates in a letterhead environment. So choose the HTML classic using classic letterhead button and then next and fill in the details like the, te the name, the letterhead that you want to choose can be uh, chosen from a drop down pick list. Use the formatting controls to customize the HTML content and use merge fields to personalize how you want this to be sent and how you want it to be visually represented. So enter the email body to the text and we can insert related object fields into this as well. So how does this impact groups? A group is a set of users, individual users or other groups the users in a particular row, the users in a particular row, plus all the users in the role hierarchy. And so you have types of groups, including public and personal groups. So a personal user, group user, can create groups for their personal use, but only administrators can create public groups. They can be used by everyone in the org. So let's take a deeper dive into public groups. It's a set of users and they're used in a sharing rule, access to folders or email alerts. And this group can be made of a combination of any one of these four users, roles, roles and subordinates and public groups. Just be aware when public groups are made up of roles and the role subordinates, a user is added or removed from the role, the group member, the listing is updated. So if you're making internal changes to any one of these group listings, then the whole group is going to be adjusted. And that's not a negative thing. It's just something that you need to be aware of. If you make changes at this level, it will impact that group. So creating public groups. We're going to set up to home administration public groups. Very simple. Click on the new button. Give the label, the group name, the public group. For public groups only, we select grant access using hierarchies. So this allows automatic access to the roles that are up. The role chain when they're selected. If grant access is deselected, users in the higher role won't receive automatic access to these groups. From the search drop down list, select the type of member to add. If we don't see that member, we, then we enter the keywords in the search box and click on find. Select the members from the available members box, click add to add them to the group and click save. Okay, cues. 
Okay, Q means the terminology is a location where records can be routed to await processing by a group member. So queues allow groups of users to manage a shared workload. So instead of uh, one person in a group getting that one notification, that one email alert, if they're on vacation, if they're out, uh, because we're all working remote in this environment, the queue allows multiple people to have access to what that alert is and can be set up so that uh, it's next up in the queue or anyone in the queue can have the access. And those are choices you can make as you set this up. So the queue allows groups to manage a shared workflow, a work shared workload. The record remains in the queue until the user accepts them for processing or they can be transferred to another queue. We can specify the set of objects that are supported by each queue. We can also specify the set of users that are allowed to retrieve records from the queue. So here's a couple of salient points. Number one, we can create queues for cases, leads, and custom objects. Whenever we create a case queue, a lead queue, Salesforce automatically generates a case list view a lead list view to enable you users to access the records in the queue. The case records can be assigned to queues manually or automatically using assignment rules. Case queues and assignment rules are very similar to the queues and assignment rules available for leads. So we're going to set up home administration, expand users, and now click on queues. To create the new queue, click on the new button. So we're on that detail page. We're clicking on the new button and it's granting X access. So very similar to previous detail pages, we need to create the label and the queue name to notify all queue members. Make sure it's enabled. Select the objects we want to assign the queue from available objects on the left to move it to the those to the right add the queue members from the top drop down you can do roles role support supportness users all of those choices and then click save the approval process so an approval process is an automated process that organization can use to approve records in Salesforce. So this process specifies the steps necessary for a record to be approved and who must approve it in each of the approval steps. The step can apply to all records included in the process or just the records that have certain attributes. An approval process specifies the action to take when a record is approved, rejected, recalled, or first submitted for approval. So an example, the max discount allowed on a product is 25%, but if it's more than 25%, then it should be approved by the manager. So a salesperson doesn't just take on themselves, giving a larger discount to a favored client. The approval process determines the delegated approver, determines the user can edit the records that are awaiting approval, and it decides if the records should be auto-approved or rejected. So, quick note, workflow rules and approval processes can be used together. So, for example, the workflow rule, it's triggered upon save. The approval process is triggered only when the user clicks submit for approval. Workflow rule consists of one set of criteria and actions. Approval process consists of min multiple steps. Have an entry criteria step, step actions, have initial submission actions, rejection, approval actions, and actions for each step. The workflow rule can be modified or deleted where some attributes of the approval process cannot be modified. 
it must be deactivated before they're deleted. So the approval process terminology. So approval actions. An approval action is an action that occurs as a result of the approval process. Four different types of approval actions. So the task assigns a task to a user that we specify and we can specify the subject, status, priority, and due date to the task. Email alert. Users with an email template we specify to send the email to a designated recipient. And field update. This changes the value of a selected field. We can specify a value or create a formula for that new value. So outbound messages. This is a message sent to an endpoint that we designate. We can specify the username and the data we want to include in the message. Approval requests. So an email notifying the recipient that a record was submitted for approval and that his or her approval is requested. So there are approval steps. So the approval steps assign approval requests to the various users and define the chain of approval for a particular approval process. Each approval step specifies the user who can approve the request for those records and whether to allow the delegate of the approver. So there can be, if an approver is going to be on vacation, out on leave, there can be delegate approvers added to this request. And then subsequent steps in the process also allow us to specify what happens if the approver, if that approver rejects the request. So assigned approver. So this is the user responsible for approving an approval request. Delegated approver. The user appointed by an assigned approver as the alternative for approval request. Delegated approvers can't reassign approval requests. They can only approve or reject them. So it can't go to a third level. Initial sub submission actions. So initial submission actions are the, those actions that occur when a user first submits a record for approval. By default, an action will lock the record that runs automatically onto initial submission. Initial submission actions can include any approval actions such as email alert, field updates, task, or outbound messages. For example, an initial submission action can update a custom approval status field to in progress. So the final approval actions. So final approval these actions are, occur when all the required approvals have been given for a record. And the final approval action can include email alert, field updates, task, or outbound messages. An example is when a final approval action is changed the status to approved and sends an email notification. Final rejection actions. So the final rejection action are those that occur when the approver rejects the request and it goes to the final rejection state. Final rejection actions can include email alerts, updates, tasks, or outbound messages. As an example, so if there's a final rejection, it can the status is changed to rejected and an email notification is sent to that user to un unlock the record so the user can edit it before resubmitting it. So recall action. So a recall action is where uh, a submitted approval request is recall recalled. By default, an action to unlock the record runs automatically on recall. Recall actions can include email alerts, field updates, tasks, or outbound messages. So this example simple. Recall action can change the status to in progress, not submitted. Record locking. So record locking is the process of preventing users from editing a record regardless of the field level security or sharing settings. Salesforce automatically locks the records that are pending approval. User must have modify all object level permission for the given object or modify all data permission to edit lock records. So the initial submission actions, final approval actions, final rejection actions, recall actions, related list 
contain record lock actions by default. We cannot edit this default for initial submission and recall actions. Approval process sections. Section 1, initial submission action. 2, approval step. 3, final approval actions. 4, final rejection actions. 5, recall actions. All approval process sections. So, number 1, initial submission actions take place when the record is initially submitted for approval. For example, initial submission action can change the record status to pending or it can send an email notification. Then approval steps. Number two, approval steps define to whom an approval request is routed as well as any actions that should be performed upon their approval of that or rejection of that record. Section three, final approval actions take place after a record has received all necessary approvals. Example is record status to approve or send a notification email. The final rejection actions, section four, the final rejection action takes place when the record has been completely rejected from the approval process. Final rejection action can change a record status to rejected and send notification email to unlock the record. Section five, recall actions take place when a submitted approval request is recalled. So then the, the status is changed to in progress or not submitted. So here are those sections from the setup view and how those can be updated, added, edited before they're put in to the live production field. Selecting approval options. So here's several bullet points that show options. Number one, we can let the submitter choose the approval manually. It prompts the user to manually select the next approver. Automatically assign it to a queue. So this assigns the approval request to a particular queue and the queues are only available on specific objects. Automatically assign using the user field selected earlier. This assigns the approval request to the user in the custom field that is displayed next to this option. This custom field has selected during the configuration of the approval process. Automatically assign approvers, which allows us to assign the approval request to one or more users or related users as shown. We specify multiple approvers in the automatically assigned to approver option. We can choose one of the following. Approve or reject based on first response. Require unanimous approval. So this record is only approved if all the approvers approve the request. And then we can optionally select the approvers delegate that may approve this request. A delegate is the user listed in the delegated approver field on the assigned approvers detail page. Delegated approvers cannot reassign approved requests. They can only approve or reject. Special note, use add row and remove row to change the number of approvers. There's a limit of 25 approvers per step. So if the flow is rejected, if this is not the first step in the approval process, we must specify what will happen if the approval request rejects this in, in this step. Rejections options are, one, perform all rejection actions for this step and all final rejection actions, or perform only the rejection actions for this step and send the approval request back to the most recent approver. So automatic rejects of the request are returned and the approval request to the previous approver. So Salesforce performs all rejection actions specified for this step. Process Builder. So like Workflow, Process for Builder has Salesforce out-of-the-box out of platform. 
And this tool can automate processes. It has a variety of advantages com compared to the workflow. It has the other abilities, including alerts, emails, initializing time-based changes, triggering other automation features such as flows. There's more actions available compared to workflow rules. Cross-object field updates. It comes with a lightning experience. The rule criteria is not mandatory. So here's a quick diagram. There's a start, a rule number one, an action, rule number two, action, rule number three, action. So the button bars, if we're building out a button bar, use the button bar to collapse and expand actions and clone the process and activate and deactivate the process. The canvas is the main workplace for the process. Adding objects, that's the records the process should evaluate. Criteria nodes, enter criteria node including conditions that are used to evaluate the records. And then actions, if the criteria is met for the record that starts the process, the actions start immediately or at a scheduled time. So here's some features. It's an expert version of a workflow tool. You can implement all the workflow actions except outbound messages. It provides some additional features to accomplish complex business processes. So to create a record, it, a process builder flow can create a record by manually entering values or by using the values of related records. Can update any related record. Updates one or more records that are related to the record that started the process by manually entering values or by using the value from related records. Quick actions, create a record, update a record, log a call by using an object specific or global action that you or another administrator created for your organization. Launch a flow. This launches from your process to automate complex business processes creates a flow to perform logic and enables events trigger that that flows via the processes without writing code that's a huge key all of these things without writing code send an email easily send an email from a process by using email alert email alerts are configured outside the process builder and contain standard text list of recipients and template for the email Configure process builder to walk through these steps. Set up home platform tools, expand the process automation, click on process builder. And these are the snapshots you would see. Click on the new button, fill the process name, press the tab, it generates the API name, just like we normally see with everything else we've been creating. And we can start the process three ways. When a record changes, when the platform event message is received, when it's invoked by another process. So choose the object. Specify where you're starting and then define the criteria. We can define criteria in three ways. Conditions are met. Formula evaluates to true. No criteria, just execute the actions. So in the context conditions are met we're given the condition is true it will execute the action we can choose which logic we need to apply if there are multiple conditions all of the conditions are met and any of the conditions are met or and then customize the logic so you have multiple options to customize this process formula evaluates to true if the formula condition is true it will execute the action or no criteria, just execute the actions. It'll directly execute what you put in place. So here's the schema on your canvas that you're setting up as you walk through these steps and picking these pick list values as your options. So Apex, using this, we can invoke Apex code. So you're not writing code, but your process builder flow can invoke an Apex code that's written in Salesforce that might be custom logic to save a record to a complex business process. To use these Apex class process builder, we have to use Aura enabled attributes. 
So we can create a record. This allows us to create new records, certain field values for the new record. Email alerts. In order to send an email from a process, we must create the email alert. Here's a special note. To send an email alert, the email template should be associated with that object on which the process is started. And we can trigger a, trigger a flow. You can launch a flow from your process to automate complex business processes. So Process Builder can post to Chatter. This would allow post information to any user or group with a feed in Salesforce. This post appears in the Chatter field as if the person who triggered the process had written it. We can refer groups to topics or add merge fields. Submit for approval. Only the record that started the process will be submitted. We can't submit any related records for approval, but we can with the process started record. Update records. So update one or more records that are related to the record that started the process. We can update the record with manually entered values or by using the values from related records. Quick actions. We must have global actions or an object specific action created in Salesforce to use these quick actions. This may include log a call, send an email, update a record. Process. This action will call another process to another to another process. For this action, you need to choose process type as is invoked by another process. Activate the process. Click on activate button to activate the process builder. So once you set up your process, then in the upper right hand corner, you, ha you have a series of buttons that will allow you to get this activated. So to summarize, we talked about process automation and how Salesforce allows you to create actions that will be more efficient because they don't have to have regular user interface. They're automatically updated without user and human intervention. Those include workflows, the automatable actions that are in those workflows, Email templates that you're setting up, setting up for these to move forward, approval processes, and then process builder, all of which can be automated that saves time and enhances efficiency for your org. Hello, welcome to. Uh, demos for lesson seven. So we've been talking about automation and in these demo processes there are creating workflows and those actions. There's creating processes and actions attached to those and then creating and configure approval processes. And best practice is to show you really in one setting the best way and the optimal way to develop your skills. So we went to set up the, the gear, the cog gear, and we lit literally could type in, in the upper left here, processes or automation, and it would drop down in our menu because there's so many items. You can, you can use the quick find to type in words that you're looking for, right? We've seen that in the past. But in this case, I just simply scrolled down to process automation. And once I opened up, expanded the, the down carrot there, you can see all of these different approval processes, automation, home, flows, next best action, which actually is a, an Einstein... Uh, next level with artificial intelligence built in, depending on your org, you should have most, if not all of these, including paused and failed flow interviews, posting templates, automation settings, process builder. Then notice workflow actions has a drop down and then you can create email alerts, field updates, outbound messages, sending actions, tasks, and workflow rules all inside of process automation. So 
in the beta format right now, this home page is available for automation. And I thought it was very important to take a minute and really start here because this is going to uh, give you access to and availability to really the best flow, natural flow, no pun intended, to walk through how do I do this, what are my resources, where's the best place to go, and Salesforce has begun to set right inside your org, basically embedded. Instead of going everywhere and, and trying to find resources, you can come right to this automation home and notice you could start creating flows, process builder, next actions, approval process, workflows right from here. If you already knew and had some background, boom, you're right into it. But this home page is going to allow you, as you're expanding and growing your org, you will be able to notice as I, I hover over these eyes, the information eyes, then you're going to be able to start seeing what you created how they're flowing if and when there's issues and then if you're just getting started out today you can start with an automation template build your business process with a template and so each of these will pop open a new tab and allow you to explore and do a deeper dive into best practices for flow solutions and so this obviously this could take you a lot of time in building it out but we're recommending that you have a, some type of advisory council some type of team some type of grouping so that it's not just you by yourself especially if you have a lot of users and you have um, many many different complex flows than exploring automation app development it's just amazing the wealth of knowledge that is connected right inside your org and you can begin if you like the developing side of this if you're a quick learner and love going through the trailhead uh, for me personally uh, earning these badges and ultimately earning my ranger status was really amazingly helpful in being prepared and so the point being right here in your setup org you have tools that can get you started depending on how you learn, depending on how much time you have, but we're going to highly recommend that you build in time to develop and understand your org. And these are, then you'll start seeing dashboards here to measure how your automations are working and how uh, well they're doing and if there's issues how you can begin following up and then each of these highlighted areas are going to help you uh, for specific details if you're trying to create an approval process and so when we walk through this in uh, our training window then if you need an approval process, typically it has something to do with uh, opportunities, usually, but not every time. It, it could be uh, case approvals. It could be uh, quote approvals. But literally, it's going to give you directions at the top. You can read the help topic, you can view your checklist, you can walk through any of these links that will take you to, for instance, a classic email template. And whether you want to create it in text view or HTML, visual force, all of those are capabilities for you to walk through 
and develop out those processes. So if I was going to create an approval process for an opportunity, I'm here at that page now. I can use a jumpstart wizard. I can use a, a standard setup wizard and then activate these processes one one step at a time following the guidelines that are provided for me and just knowing that I'm I'm looking at here are actual objects in my org and if I need an approval process for solutions then all of that allows me to create the wizard what the steps are what the logic is and allow automatically these approvals to be assigned to specific approvers and so all of these options then give me who I could relate it to who I would be searching for inside my org and then again remember we recommend you set each of these processes up in your sandbox and test them and have a user walk through them with you but the point i'm making is each of these are automated in a way that you're not creating code but you're walking through the wizard that's basically set up for you for example here are flows and a flow has capability of more complex processes and we would recommend if there are flows that have been created and are part of the platform that you purchased for example this developer platform has financial services built in has a uh, marketing club marketing apps built in and and uh, service cloud capabilities so many of these were already part of installed right out of the box and i would recommend that you check and just look at some of how and what these flows are currently built out in your org and then you can run it you can build on it you can save as in other words clone it and just test what it's doing and then come back to basically your detail page for your flow and then walk through creating a new flow and these are really drag and drop scenarios that's walking you through a wizard that's laid out for you whether it's free form it's auto layout it's just amazing what's already in place for you and you could be developing and creating in really literally in minutes all of these different capabilities so i'm going to jump down to workflow rules so we started and, and when we talked through workflow rules in our training environment here this page is giving you literal details what is a workflow it automates the following types of actions based on your organization's processes so part of your job is going to be finding out what what do your stakeholders need it's kind of a business analyst hat that you'll have to wear and you're finding out everything you can about what they need and then you're walking through okay they need this task they need this email alert then each of these will give you detailed descriptions of how to follow through and create this and then notice i've left this page available once you've read it a couple of times you don't want it to pop up again then you can tick 
the checkbox there and it won't remind you of these. These are just instructional. The, again, it's built in natively embedded in your setup to help guide you. But then when I click the continue button, now I'm literally in the window of creating workflows. And if any had, uh, if you inherit an existing org, then typically they'll have workflows in place here and you could, uh, look at a few of them and, and again, test them out and then a clone the ones that work best for you. But if you're creating the new rule, then you're attaching it again to the object you want it attached to. And you're just walking through this wizard, giving it a name, creating uh, the criteria behind what's important to you as the admin and your users. Then you're designing and setting up what is the best criteria for this specific rule and then walking through just step by step and if you miss a step like I purposely did here Salesforce is going to basically uh, walk you back and anything that's required to save this it's just going to say oh wait you've got to type in the rule name what do you want to call this and so you'll be walked right through and guided through each of those steps uh the next best action for example so here you're creating a strategy with your data and einstein is in the background running artificial inte intelligence that will help you walk through strategies for what's the next best action with my opportunities with the cases that are that are uh, currently we're facing in you know our business processes and then you can walk through building out naming what the strategy is and uh, making your best actions part of what your company needs as uh, their business unfolds uh, you're going to have view of and access to if there's been any uh, pauses or if you need to pause your flow interviews you're going to be able to set up uh, post templates so this is uh, allowing you again based on the object you need this available for to create templates to give specifics so your your users don't have to create from the ground up and start from scratch and in many cases here's an example that Salesforce is going to show you that is a template that's available that was created in the past and now you can leverage it and gain ideas that are going to be best practices and helping you to automate as much as humanly possible you can set up your automation settings and default workflow users who's your uh, approval submitter and again Salesforce is walking you through these yellow highlighted areas are going to give you guidelines to tell you what the following steps will be enabled or allowing you to build out under process builder again these are wizards that are allowing you to walk through and build out 
how the flow of your business will work. And Salesforce is constantly iterating and updating these. So literally, it's going to give you an instructional guideline. You know, here's what a process builder is. Welcome to the builder. Here's what you can walk through. It only takes a couple of clicks and you're going to be able to develop this and clicking on new I gets you started in the process. So the point I'm trying to make is you're in a, an amazing environment where in just a couple of clicks, you have all of these capabilities and all of these workflow actions. And if you'll just simply take the time to read through and look what's available in your org. So part of this is uh, I'm looking at a developer org that allows all these different creativities and you need to take as the admin, you need to take the time to see what's available in your menu item. And before you promise, okay, we're going to do this, 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 and this literally here's email alerts that I know could help multiple areas in your specific company. And you have the capability to do a deep dive, click on email alerts, read through what's best practices. And then when you click continue, now you're ready to start creating that alert after you've read through the details, reminded yourself, here's the best practice. Then here's going to, here are the recipients and here's where the template is found. And here's the object it's related to all of these drop downs are really, you know, capabilities that I'm going to recommend you basically jump in, test them out, look at each one of these. Uh, for instance, if you're going to be doing field updates using workflows, then there's the basic instruction page. Here's my new field update uh, explanation page. It allows, it tells me at the top of the page, here's what I'm creating and what it's best used for. Here's outbound messages and how they're going to be viewed and what their status is. Here are sending actions. So if I'm sending a specific email message and how do I want that to be developed? I give it a name and then this sending action can be attached to a process or a flow. If there are specific tasks that I wanted to be part of a flow, I would create that task attached to a specific object and then name that task and have it available in the flow that I'm creating. So hopefully this has been a, a good overview to get you started to do deeper dives in process automation and inside that one drop down, you have six, seven, eight capabilities of creating and testing and setting up your environment in a way that's going to allow testers to test what you're doing and then improve the automation of your day-to-day -day functionality so that the org really, really allows users to be efficient and to build out what works best for you and expand what this efficient project and product can provide. Thank you. See you next time and our next lesson. So welcome to lesson eight. We've talked about the various uh, hats and responsibilities that administrators 
need to be able prepared to wear and provide services for and uh, those could include training they they can include uh, configuring creating reports all of these different responsibilities we talk about in our lessons but today we're focusing on really more the configuring side of the responsibility of being an administrator in your org and really this is one of the newer capabilities and Uh, if your background is configuring and uh, design flow and you have a computer science background, you have an IT background, then this is going to uh, feel fun and be uh, more advantageous to and uh, enjoyable for you as uh, the administrator for the tool but it's only one part of. So there may be other lessons that we're studying that that's your strength and your best in that area. And you need to get better in areas like this. These are just part of the job flows and job responsibilities. And the good news is Salesforce has plenty of tools, uh, plenty of leverage points that you can continue to grow and get a little bit better every day and that's part of what we're trying to help you with here so let's get started what are the learning objectives after completing this lesson so number one we want to explore what the lightning flow builder is and how you can interact with it number two we want to invoke those flows for salesforce objects and show you that process we want to be able to use those flows by the time you're finished with these screenshots and then be able to invoke flows in pages so we're going to do some demonstration points we're going to interact with the tools itself in a live environment of the lightning flow breaks down into the the whys and the wherefores in the background so a lightning flow is a salesforce out of the box feature it offers point and click user interface to automate visually guided business processes so the point is you're not make, writing code you're not configuring uh, functions and designing those yourself you're leveraging what really has come right out of the box with the tool so here's some usage points well it automate these flows automate a guided visual experience for your users they start a behind the scenes business process so when a user clicks a button a record is created it can be updated an event, a platform event would occur, a specified time and frequency would be automatically created. Another area for Flow Builder is analyzing. So you can add more functionality for behind the scenes processes that are, that are even available in the Process Builder. So there's more capabilities in this Flow Builder. You can use Flow Builder to build more complex functionality. So here's a good way to select the best tool for the best job. So if you're looking at a guided visual experience that your business needs in whatever department or whatever area of the business flow, then processes that that need input from users, whether they're employees or customers, we would use Flow Builder. If it's a behind the scenes automation, then the process to get all the information from Salesforce org or a connected system, the user input really isn't needed, then we use Flow Builder or Process Builder or Apex. 
if there is an approval automation. So this is a process that decides how a record like a time off request gets approved by the right shareholders or stakeholders, then we use automated approvals. So that's just some guidelines on really the best practice to use which tool. Here's a comparison between process builder and flow. And really in the certification exam, there's distinctions and it's pretty clear you need to know the difference if you want to get certified and taking the exam. In the actual workday business requirements, really you have multiple tools at your disposal and you and your team can decide, hey, what would best make this process automated through our system? How complex is it? And what steps are involved? All right, let's use the Lightning Flow Builder because it's really, really a complex environment. So here's the comparisons. On the Process Builder, you cannot use it to delete records. Where Lightning Flow, you could create a flow that would be used to delete an actual record. But on Process Builder, not all objects are supported, but many objects are accessible using the Lightning Flow. For example, Opportunity Contact Role, User Device, which are basically subsets of objects that take more complex automation. And so we would use the flow. Process Builder can be triggered when a record is created or edited. In Lightning Flow, it can be triggered when a record is created, edited, or even deleted. Process Builder, you cannot use it to capture user inputs. Lightning Flow, it can be used to capture user inputs and then later process based on the business use case. And additionally, in the Lightning Flow, it can be scheduled to run daily, weekly, or just one time only. So here are some use cases for flow usage. So if you need to create a Lightning page, if you need to create a flow action, a utility bar, experience a builder page, custom Lightning components, Visual Force pages, web tabs, custom buttons and links. These are all places where flow can be used with a screen so users can get to it. So here are some types of Lightning pages. One, we can create home pages using these flows. This is what the user sees when they navigate to the home page. Typically, it's, you know, first thing in the morning, the first area we want our users to see that's going to help them uh, get started on the right best practices for their job position for that day. Or it's what a user decided they really need to see this most often easiest first and that's their home page landing record pages so what users see when they open a record such as an account or case in this lighting experience app pages so a page that's not tied to a specific object but can be interacted with in your environment and then email application pages so what users see from lightning for like
part of the lightning flow breaks down into the the whys and the wherefores in the background so a lightning flow is a sales force out of the box feature it offers point and click user interface to automate visually guided business processes so the point is you're not make, writing code you're not configuring uh, functions and designing those yourself you're leveraging what really has come right out of the box with the tool so here's some usage points well it automate these flows automate a guided visual experience for your users they start a behind the scenes business process so when a user clicks a button a record is created it can be updated an event a platform event would occur a specified time and frequency would be automatically created another area for flow builder is analyzing so you can add more functionality for behind the scenes processes that are that are even available in the process builder so there's more capabilities in this flow builder you can use flow builder to build more complex functionality so here's a good way to select the best tool for the best job so if you're looking at a guided visual experience that your business needs in whatever department or whatever area of the business flow then processes that that need input from users whether they're employees or customers we would use flow builder if it's behind the scenes automation then the process to get all the information from salesforce org or a connected system the user input really isn't needed then we use flow builder or process builder or apex if there is an approval automation so this is a process that decides how a record like a time off request gets approved by the right shareholders or stakeholders then we use automated approvals so that's just some guidelines on really the best practice to use which tool here's a comparison between process builder and flow and really in the certification exam there's distinctions and it's pretty clear you need to know the difference if you want to get certified and taking the exam in the actual workday business requirements really you have multiple tools at your disposal and you and your team can decide hey what would best make this process automated through our system how complex is it and what steps are involved all right let's use the lightning flow builder because it's really really a complex environment so here's the comparisons on the process builder you cannot use it to delete records where lightning flow you could create a flow that would be used to delete an actual record but on process builder not all objects are supported but many objects are accessible using the lightning flow for example opportunity contact role user device which are basically subsets of objects that take more complex automation and so we would use the flow process builder can be triggered when a record is created or edited in lightning flow it can be triggered when a record is created edited or even deleted process builder you cannot use it to capture user inputs 
Lightning Flow, it can be used to capture user inputs and then later process based on the business use case. And additionally, in the Lightning Flow, it can be scheduled to run daily, weekly, or just one time only. So here are some use cases for flow usage. So if you need to create a Lightning page, if you need to create a flow action, a utility bar, experience a builder page, custom lightning components, visual force pages, web tabs, custom buttons and links. These are all places where flow can be used with a screen so users can get to it. So here are some types of lightning pages. One, we can create home pages using these flows. This is what the user sees when they navigate to the home page. Typically, it's, you know, first thing in the morning, the first area we want our users to see that's going to help them uh, get started on the right best practices for their job position for that day. Or it's what a user decided they really need to see this most often, easiest, first, and that's their home page landing record pages so what users see when they open a record such as an account or case in this lighting experience app pages so a page that's not tied to a specific object but can be interacted with in your environment and then email application pages so what users see from lightning for like outlook or uh, the gmail connection with lightning each page serves as a different type use case go to any record detail page where you want to add a flow you click setup click on edit the page drag the flow component from the standard component the side menu and drop it in place so here's a snapshot there's on the properties pane you can see the canvas the menu bar on the left side and then properties pane you can edit and adjust and select which flow so you could add your flow to a utility bar similar to adding it to a lightning page a couple of steps that are important open the app manager select any app for which you want to, to add this flow in the utility bar and then add the flow lightning app utility bar under the app settings you're going to click utility items and this is for desktops right click add utility items select flow and Then third, you fill the required details and click save. And this is a snapshot of what that process looks like. So when you're creating specific actions with flows, so you can add flows to an action menu on a lightning page. When you create the flow action, you can pick from a list of available flows rather than enter uh, the URL manually. And then to work the flow action, it must be active and have screens. So going to set up object manager, click on any object you want to add this flow, click on buttons.
the user input really isn't needed, the user input really isn't needed, then we use Flow Builder or Process Builder or Apex. If there's an approval automation, so this is a process that decides how a record like a time off request gets approved by the right shareholders or stakeholders, then we use automated approvals. So that's just some guidelines on really the best practice to use which tool. Here's a comparison between Process Builder and Flow. And really, in the certification exam, there's distinctions, and it's pretty clear you need to know the difference if you want to get certified and taking the exam. In the actual workday business requirements, really, you have multiple tools at your disposal, and you and your team can decide, hey, what would best make this process automated through our system? How complex is it? And what steps are involved? All right, let's use the Lightning Flow Builder because it's really, really a complex environment. So here's the comparisons. On the Process Builder, you cannot use it to delete records. Where Lightning Flow, you could create a flow that would be used to delete an actual record. But on Process Builder, not all objects are supported. But many objects are accessible using the Lightning Flow. For example, Opportunity Contact Role, User Device, which are basically subsets of objects that take more complex automation. And so we would use the flow. Process Builder can be triggered when a record is created or edited. In Lightning Flow, it can be triggered when a record is created, edited, or even deleted. Process Builder, you cannot use it to capture user inputs. Lightning Flow, it can be used to capture user inputs and then later process based on the business use case. And additionally, in the Lightning Flow, it can be scheduled to run daily, weekly, or just one time only. So here are some use cases for flow usage. So if you need to create a lightning page, if you need to create a flow action, a utility bar, experience a builder page, custom lightning components, visual force pages, web tabs, custom buttons and links. These are all places where flow can be used with the screen so users can get to it. So here are some types of lightning pages. One, we can create home pages. Using these flows. This is what the user sees. the user input really isn't needed, then we use Flow Builder or Process Builder or Apex. If there's an approval automation, so this is a process that decides how a record like a time off request gets approved by the right shareholders or stakeholders, then we use 
automated approvals. So that's just some guidelines on really the best practice to use. Which tool? Here's a comparison between Process Builder and Flow. And really, in the certification exam, there's distinctions, and it's pretty clear you need to know the difference if you want to get certified and taking the exam. In the actual workday business requirements, really you have multiple tools at your disposal, and you and your team can decide, hey, what would best make this process automated through our system? How complex is it? And what steps are involved? All right, let's use the Lightning Flow Builder because it's really, really a complex environment. So here's the comparisons. On the Process Builder, you cannot use it to delete records. Where Lightning Flow, you could create a flow that would be used to delete an actual record. But on Process Builder, not all objects are supported. But many objects are accessible using the Lightning Flow. For example, Opportunity Contact Role, User Device, which are basically subsets of objects that take more complex automation. And so we would use the flow. Process Builder can be triggered when a record is created or edited. In Lightning Flow, it can be triggered when a record is created, edited, or even deleted. Process Builder, you cannot use it to capture user inputs. Lightning Flow, it can be used to capture user inputs and then later process based on the business use case. And additionally, in the Lightning Flow, it can be scheduled to run daily, weekly, or just one time only. So here are some use cases for flow usage. So if you need to create a Lightning page, if you need to create a flow action, a utility bar, experience a builder page, custom lightning components, visual force pages, web tabs, custom buttons and links. These are all places where flow can be used with a screen so users can get to it. So here are some types of lightning pages. One, we can create home pages using these flows. This is what the user sees when they navigate to the home page. Typically, it's, you know, first thing in the morning, the first area we want our users to see that's going to help them uh, get started on the right best practices for their job position for that day. Or it's what a user decided they really need to see this most often, easiest, first, and that's their home page landing record pages so what users see when they open a record such as an account or case in this lighting experience app pages so a page that's not tied to a specific object but can be interacted with in your environment and then email application pages so what users see from lightning for like outlook or uh, the gmail connection with lightning each page serves as a different type use case that could be uh, impacted by, created by lightning flows. So to display a flow page, we go to any record detail page where you want to add a flow. You click setup, click on edit the page, drag the flow component from the standard component, the side menu, and drop it in place so here's a snapshot there's on the properties pane you can see the canvas the menu bar 
on the left side and then properties pane you can edit and adjust and select which flow so you could add your flow to a utility bar similar to adding it to a lightning page a couple of steps that are important open the app manager select any app for which you want to, to add this flow in the utility bar and then add the flow lightning app utility bar under the app settings you're going to click utility items and this is for desktops right click add utility items select flow and And third, you fill the required details and click save. And this is a snapshot of what that process looks like. So when you're creating specific actions with flows, so you can add flows to an action menu on a lightning page. When you create the flow action, you can pick from a list of available flows rather than enter uh, the URL manually. And then to work the flow action, it must be active and have screens. So going to set up object manager, click on any object. You want to add this flow, click on buttons and links and actions, and then click on new action. So here's the page we're referring to. And when you click new action, it'll take you to the, a new window and you pick the action type as a flow and choose the flow from the drop down you can see that on this screenshot so when you're creating specific actions go to the page layout click on mobile and lightning actions the left hand side here you can find the the button added earlier drag and drop that button to the Salesforce mobile and lightning action section and then click save. So here's the section you would drag the button from up in the, the mobile and lightning actions section and then dra drag it down into what's active for that page. Using the lightning flow console, you're going to have a button bar, a canvas, and then your toolbox. Open the app manager, select any app for which you want to, to add this flow in the utility bar and then add the flow lightning app utility bar under the app settings. You're going to click utility items and this is for desktops, right? Click add utility items, select flow and then third you fill the required details and click save and this is a snapshot of what that process looks like so when you're creating specific actions with flows so you can add flows to an action menu on a lightning page when you create the flow action You can pick from a list of available flows rather than enter uh, the URL manually. And then 
to work the flow action, it must be active and have screens. So going to set up object manager, click on any object. You want to add this flow, click on buttons and links and actions, and then click on new action. So here's the page we're referring to. And when you click new action, it'll take you to the, a new window and you pick the action type as a flow and choose the flow from the drop down. You can see that on this screenshot. So when you're creating specific actions, go to the page layout, click on mobile and lightning actions. The left hand side here, you can find the, the button added earlier, drag and drop that button to the Salesforce mobile and lightning action section and then click save. So here's the section you would drag the button from up in the, the mobile and lightning actions section and then dra drag it down into what's active for that page. Using the lightning flow console you're going to have a button bar a canvas and then your toolbox So the building blocks of a flow are the elements. So that's these different icons, whether it's your start button, getting records, a uh, decision. Then you have connectors, which are referenced by these lines. And then you have resources that you can bring. And each of these allow you to create this, create this automation that that would fulfill the business requirement. So here's the building blocks. So the elements appear on the canvas and they're part of the toolbox that we can drag and drop and add the element to the canvas. Canvas. The connector is the path that the flow is going to run to in the runtime. And then they define the element, what's going to execute next. The resources are containers that re represent given values, such field values, records, formulas. You can reference resources throughout the flow. Example would be you look up an contacts ID, you store that ID in a variable. And later, 
you reference that ID to update the contact. So these are the building blocks to create a good flow. So the start element, like all flows, you've got to start somewhere. This allows you to set the rules around when the flow would run. And we use it to schedule the flow and choose our starting date. So there's our start element. Get records element. So this element is used to check if any open cases were fine by, found by the get re record element, like in a previous step. And this is an important step because it makes sure the flow will only run further if there's open cases in the system. So then assigning an element. If open cases are found, then the element will assign the count of total open cases to a variable, which will be used later in a merge field. So like an e email template being used to send it an email to a supervisor. The action element is all the action takes place like the email is sent to any of the customers as in a service email where that email ID is part of an open case on a weekly or daily basis that action occurs. So here's five different ways to implement the flow. So you've got a screen flow, scheduled trigger flow, auto launch flow, record triggered flow, or a platform event triggered flow. Different ways based on what type of business process do you want a schedule to trigger the flow? Do you want it to be auto launched? Do you need a record to trigger your flow? These are all options that can be rather than trying to write code for all of these you're basically clicking on which type of flow you want to enforce so here's ways to implement the flow so we have screen flows this flow there's a series of screens to collect and they collect this data from the user and they perform some type of operation so this obviously requires the user to enter that information and then the screen flow can be accessed using custom buttons, custom links, or direct URL. The scheduled triggered flow, this runs only at a scheduled time and frequency. It runs only from the schedule and it does not support user interaction screens local actions, choices, or choice sets. It's on an auto schedule. Auto launched flow. So the difference here is in the background, there's no user interaction. In addition, everywhere this screen flow runs, we can also run it from the process builder or from Apex. So a record triggered flow runs only when the record is created or updated. And it makes before save updates to the new or changed record that launches the flow. And only these elements are supported. So the assignment element, decision, get records, and loop. So triggers for auto launch flows. So the trigger can be specified in the start element. The flow trigger can be a schedule or the new and changed records of a spec specified object. Without the trigger, you must set up other things to launch the flow, such as custom buttons, processes, Apex classes, or even Einstein bots. So you can see it becomes very, very automated, very, very creative, very, very customizable. And really a big part of, before we even set this up, is sitting down with our 
business users and finding out what is it that they need to be automated and then just leveraging which type of automation is going to work best. So there's scheduled triggers and there's record triggers to auto launch these flows. So a scheduled trigger, it's going to run for batches of records. The scheduled trigger flow starts at specified time uh, and frequency and it is for designed for a batch of records. You can configure the scheduled trigger in the start element of your auto launch flow. So right from that first start element. A record trigger, this is for flows that make before saved updates. So creating or updating a record can trigger the auto launch flow to make additional updates to that record before it is saved into the database. A record trigger flow can update a Salesforce record 10 times faster than a record change process. And these record triggers configure in the start element of your auto launch flow as well. So right in the beginning, we're setting this in place. So here's some best practices for building flows. We've said this several times, plan out your flow. So you're, you're basically doing the work ahead of time to find out what is it that your user needs. What does that team need to happen for their business processes? Then you use the sandbox or developer org where you have a practice type environment. So once it's created, it's not going to impact day-to-day -day business. Users can keep doing what they're doing. They can leverage what they have available today in production. In the meantime, you're practicing and testing in a safe environment that doesn't impact daily business. We never want hard-coded Salesforce IDs in place where we basically have constricted our org with hard coding. And then we want to be able to handle any errors that are impacting these test environments and walk through the debugging process. So creating a sample flow, we go to setup, home, platform tools, process automation, and then we click on flows. And you've seen this menu several times. So choosing flows in this process automation menu gets you access. And then when you build this flow out, you begin to understand more about the elements by really just creating it and testing it and seeing how the flow processes through your test environment. So we, if we need to create a screen, get records, make a decision, if it's true, what is, is the action? If it's false, what is the action? And then updating those records. These are all sample scenarios of flows. So once you're at this flow detail page, then you're going to click on the new flow button. And then you're going to choose which flow type from these options. And then you're going to choose your layout. So you can use a free form, which allows drag and drop. You can use auto layout. So this will give flexibility to add elements and the resources that you need at predefined positions. So you begin to drag and drop the screen elements from your left side menu. So you fill in the new screensaver information and label it appropriately on your screen properties menu. You press tab, it'll automatically generate the API name. So once you type it in the label, you click the tab key on your keyboard, 
it drops in the API label, and then you click Done. You click the Save button in the upper right hand corner, you enter the Flow label, and you press Tab to again create the API name on this window. You create a record variable for the course in the toolbox. You click on Manager, click on New Resource, and then choose the resource type from the drop down. So it, here's resource types that are available in these flows. So you have variable, constant, and then you have the formula. The variable is the data that can be changed during the flow. It can be any available data type. The most common are text, numbers, dates, and records. And this can be a single value or a list of values. So multiple accounts or just one account. So the constant is that's the data that doesn't change during your flow. So that could be text, number, currency, date, or the Boolean true false constant. Your formula, this is similar to custom field formulas. Your functions are from field formulas work and the supports again could be text, number, currency, date, date time, or Boolean formulas. So the resource types can be a text template, which provides a nice way to combine other resources and free text to create the text block and in the chatter post. So choices are single value use on a screen like radio buttons, check boxes, pick lists, or record set choices, uh, a list of potential choice values based on currently existing record data. So list of phone numbers, accounts that are customers, and then pick list values. So the values in a pick list field that you predetermined. These are all resource types. So creating a sample flow. You add the name, you input the components to the screen, you double click, for example, on the, the contact info screen, enter the label name, and click tab to automatically generate the API name, which is the normal practice on all of these pages, and then you drag the name onto the screen canvas. Then you click on advanced. Check manually assigned variable checkbox. You the first name, select the contact, and then the name. The value displayed would be the contact name. So here's where you're choosing the properties for this sample flow. Then you're going to choose the record choice set for accounts. So you click new resource, select record choice set from the resource type menu. So here's where you're making those drop down choices. And then you're, if you're adding a pick list to the component on the screen, you drag the pick list onto the screen and then you're going to name the component. So you're dragging it from your menu side and then you name it on the property side. So once you've toggled down and highlighted that component screen, now you can use the properties bar to detail out what that component would be called. Fill in the name label, select the object, put in a description, and then give the conditions per the requirements to fetch the record details and validate them. So here's where you put the object in, and now you're using these drop downs to create what filters are going to be available and what needs to be inputted into your flow based on the field, the operator, and then the value of that field. So adding the decision element, you specify the outcomes and the details and conditions. So again, they're completely drag and drop, uh, drop down choices without writing any code, you're making a choice based on the values you prefer in those fields. 
So to create a records element, similar type process, enter the label name, click tab, it creates the API, and then you're choosing from the radio buttons and from the drop downs in the record fields. So once you've created those steps, now you want to connect the decision element to the record update and it'll ask you to select the outcome. So you choose the pro appropriate outcome when it's created new or when it's updating the existing. You make those choices and then you test them in your sandbox environment. To use an assignment element to set the contact ID, you can make those choices and enter and edit the update records appropriately, set the assignment details on this page, and then click Done. Once you've created your flow, then you want to walk through testing. So there's the Run button, there's the Debug button. Click Run, and then obviously you're going to run the most recent saved version of the flow. You click Debug. It does everything that, that Run does, but with some superpowers, quote-unquote, thrown in. It allows you to enter values for the flow input and display debug, debug details while you're running the flow. So this helps you can see how the flow is processing. If you need to debug the fl that flow that you've created, then you click on the debug button, walk through the details, make adjustments, and then click run to run it. So once we begin to create some flows, there's going to be some of these that we want to schedule an auto launch. And we want it set up on a certain day and time. Or we can set it up where it's once daily or weekly. So it can run for a set of records. It can run for an object or a filter. To start the flow, we're going to go select the filter conditions in the start element so when your flow starts the flow interview runs for each record that matches your filter no looping would be required the matching record is stored in the record global variable so you can reference the variable or its fields throughout your flow so here's a couple of things to to remember salient points so the start time of a scheduled flow reflects the time zone of the org in your comfort company information screen so it's going to reflect what the org sees as the time zone that it's in when you configure the flow it's the start time will reflect basically that time that your user has defaulted as the company time so if your time zone is dif different then you need to account for that when you configure the start time and schedule that flow scheduled flows are going to run on the user called automated process user for conditions when using date time and so on you cannot currently use a formula it needs to be star gaff star a hard-coded date or time as a workaround you need to create a custom field that has the date and time stamp so you can use that as a filter condition so you have alternatives here's some points to consider formula references do not work in filtered conditions if you need to reference attributes associated to the record and the record flow use the global variable called dollar record you cannot debug a scheduled flow they're logged in the debug logs so you use the debug feature in the flow builder you can also create a version of your scheduled flow in as a non-scheduled flow to use the flow builder debug feature once you create your scheduled flow 
you'll see it listed in the scheduled jobs page and set up. According to Salesforce, scheduled flow limits are the same as Apex scheduler limits. So to run a flow at a specific time, we choose run. Select the scheduled trigger flow and click next. So that's the tab you're choosing. Choose the scheduled time, an object on which you want to have the flow built. Choose the frequency once daily or weekly. Click done. And then here's the steps for an HTML Salesforce flow. Define the flow properties for the screen flow. Create a screen to capture the user data. Add a screen element, add an email component, add a text component, add a body component. Add the text template to construct the email body and add a core action to send the email when it's to be sent out. But validation rules using these screen flows. So if you're going to validate a phone number in the city before saving it into the data. So you would first define the flow, pro flow properties. Add a screen to capture the user's input. Add a text component to store the city name. Add input validation and validate user input. Add a phone component to store the phone number and add input validation to validate user input. So first of all, define the, pl the flow property. So you're going to set up home platform, expand the process automation, click on flows. Click new flows, it'll take you to the flow console, and then you choose the freedom flow type and the screen flow. So here's the canvas, there's your menu, over here's your properties section, and we can drag and drop what we need. So you can add a text component to store the city. So you're grabbing text from the menu side and dropping it in and then naming it what you want to name it. Then you add the input for validation to validate the user input city. So then you add the phone component to store that mobile number. So you put required is true, advanced, revisited screen values, use the values from when the screen last visited this screen, when the user last visited, and you're adding these to your canvas. So you add input validation to validate the input, the mobile use number. And then you define the pattern matching your needs. So all of this can be done here in your properties of that phone. So for a dynamic screen flow, you're going to set up home platform tools, expand process builder, click on flows. Now you're going to click the new flat flows. It'll take you to the flow console. Choose the freedom flow type and screen flow, then add screen from the elements and add two text fields to take input from the users. So all of that happened right here from your menu bar and dropped it into your canvas and named it appropriately. Then set the component visibility. In this case, we've set it to... If the course model is offline, then it'll show the class location field. So again, you set that logic in your properties window. Then you link, link the flow and save it and activate it to use it. Very simple flow created. And then you use these buttons to save it and activate it. So that gives you the overview of flows, and part of this is going to be you testing it in an environment.
environment that's uh, safe for uh, users to be in a sandbox or the development org, and it's not affecting your production. So these lightning flows don't require code. You can build them yourself in environments that are safe. There's multiple flow use cases. There's different types of lightning pages that can be created. There are multiple building blocks that these flows are built around. And then you can implement different types of flows. And currently there are five different ways to implement it. Okay, welcome to Lesson 8, Demo 1, Creating Flows. We've talked about this in the past. This is your configuration hat as administrator. So this is where before you can create these, you have to spend some time to find out what is it that your business users need, what are the stakeholders requiring, what are the functions they're trying to automate, and then you can set up a test in your sandbox or developer org and then allow user testing so let's get started i'm here in our developer setup and so i clicked on the icon went to setup and now i'm here scrolling down to process automation i expanded the drop down i uh, clicked on flows and so here are some flows that are set up in this org. Some of them uh, came out of the box with specific uh, cloud platforms or applications that have been uploaded. But uh, so you can see that there's several that are active and some inactive currently that are already in our org. We'll refer back to those momentarily. But the point being for today, we just want to show you where to go. Uh, how to access, what to view, what are your options, so that you can see here's all the different components of creating lightning flows. So first of all, we would click on
Okay, welcome to Lesson 8, Demo 1, Creating Flows. We've talked about this in the past. This is your configuration hat as administrator. So this is where before you can create these, you have to spend some time to find out what is it that your business users need? What are the stakeholders requiring? What are the functions they're trying to automate? And then you can set up a test in your sandbox or developer org and then allow user testing. So let's get started. I'm here in our developer setup. And so I clicked on the icon, went to set up, and now I'm here scrolling down to process automation. I expanded the drop down. I uh, clicked on flows. And so here are some flows that are set up in this org. Some of them uh, came out of the box with specific uh, cloud platforms or applications that have been uploaded but uh, so you can see that there's several that are active and some inactive currently that are already in our org we'll refer back to those momentarily but the point being for today we just want to show you where to go uh, how to access what to view what are your options so that you can see here's all the different components of creating lightning flows so first of all we would click on the new flow button on the upper right hand corner and now with this uh summer 21 uh, newest release you can see we're already in an environment where we can choose from five different types of flows so salesforce is moving further and further in uh, allowing you to drag and drop and click and place rather than write code at all. So you have a screen flow, lightning flow that would require uh, user input and allow quick actions to be built around those. And then the other four flows are running in the background that really users don't interact with, but they would see the benefit from the results. So schedule triggered flow auto launched flow without a trigger uh or the record trigger flowed and then platform event trigger flows so these are all different types of automations and we would recommend that you choose and look at each of them you can use the salesforce trailhead and we highly recommend a salesforce video uh, on youtube where literally there's hundreds of examples that you could follow i want to click on uh, all these different flows plus templates that are in place that you can right here from this drop down walk through everything from uh, current flows that are in place and leverage them to the templates that you could leverage and then salesforce always has uh, some type of menu bar that you could uh, leverage on the left hand side that, that would allow you to further expand you know, your capabilities so whether it's contact flow screen flow user provision flows and then exploring the templates of how you would leverage those all of those capabilities are available to you for the purposes of this demo we wanted to show you that additionally salesforce now has a free form environment where as you get more uh, adept and more comfortable with creating flows you can drop them uh, on the campus and make the connections with these connector lines between the start environment all the way through decisions and records that you would be record types you would be putting on your canvas or you can leverage this beta that has the auto layout uh, basically clicked for you I'm going to click on that auto 
just to show you right from the beginning. Again, here's your your uh, menu on the left hand side, and you'll be able to select from elements using that drop down, and then the plus symbol allows you to expand out here's basically it's a pick list of what could be available to me that i could begin creating right from this environment and then i can drop the drag and drop from the flow menu everything from pick list values and label them, create them, uh, decide where my resources I'm pulling from in my org. I can set visibility, whether I want it to always be visible or just when certain conditions are met. I can provide a help environment so that if you wanted to give guidance and have those little uh, black dots all of those uh, steps are available and it's basically you're just dragging and dropping into your canvas area and then you're giving that component a name uh any ids that are required obviously you can see with this service appointment there's a lot of capabilities of fields that could be interacted with but we preset several different types of flows and so we want to take a moment to look at what we've already created for you and notice it can be as complex as dragging and, and dropping from the start button assignments based on uh, what object what uh, role needed to be assigned a decision that would be uh, met and these are all automatic flows and then if this then that and moving through a screen that would allow a, a user to interact with that screen or if not then pulling records from objects in your org and you can see this would be a much more complex capability but we wanted you to, to see that you you don't have to create from scratch everything that's in your environment you could do a save as if you liked this general flow and and this flow was working but you needed to tweak a screen or add a screen or adjust an assignment you can drag and drop from your menu place the arrows and connect them to that object that that element and then test it and so the way we would test is simply by clicking on the debug environment and then walk through the wizard and notice on the right hand side that it will walk you through exactly what code was in place if there were errors what happens with the next step and what transaction what transactions are committed so you have at your you know right at your fingertips the capability of current flows that are in place creating your own flows and dragging and dropping those into that flow environment and then saving it into your sandbox and running tests to validate how well that works for you and then testing those and debugging them if needed running them right from the user interface and or going into for example we set up cases earlier that I wanted to see it from the user interface and how that looks in the the user side I clicked on the app launcher I clicked on cases and so here are some test cases that I've created and when we go to that case number 
So you can see how that was put in place and automatically created by our flow. And now it has all the connection points to everything from milestones, related attachments if they were needed, the details of the case, uh, what the name of the case is, whether or not I need to uh, interact with uh, fellow employees for, from a chat environment. So all of that can be done really right from my original creation and then tested, updated, and debugged as needed without writing any hard code, without making any uh, updates that I have to log in in a, in a hard code environment. It literally is drag and drop and then adjust fellow employees for, from a chat environment. So all of that can be done really right from my original creation and then tested, updated, and debugged as needed without writing any hard code, without making any uh, updates that I have to log in in a, in a hard code environment. It literally is drag and drop and then adjustable, updatable, clonable, both in the list of the flows that I create and then in individual flows and what updates I need to make there. All right, that should get you started on flows. Uh, we'll look forward to, you, to seeing you in our next demo. Okay, welcome back. Lesson eight, demo number two. Basic, simple uh, email, HTML email from a Salesforce flow. It's kind of a, the beginning point. Uh, basic, if you will. So, we're at setup. We scrolled over and expanded process automation. We chose flows. We click on new flow. And remember in uh, this iteration, we now have the types of flows that are available to us immediately. And in other previous iterations, you would have chosen this after you set up part of, uh, and, and it created the flow, but we know this one, this in specific demo so we choose auto launch that this is the type of flow we want to represent we're going to say free form this time and notice salesforce is starting us off with a start button but there's nothing else on our canvas so we need to reach over and grab one of these uh, actions or logic items or data items and so we're going to grab an action and drop it onto the canvas and it makes sense because this is an email action once we've chosen that it gives us oh the primary basic option is to send an email we need to label this And then it automatically gives us an API name and best practice is to give it a description. And then notice as we scroll down, you have several options. Again, Salesforce is trying to help you. And as, as you get more ad adept at and prolific at testing, testing, creating, expanding, configuring, or and or you have team members that uh, have given you input, these optional leverage points 
will be everything from different types of email addresses you can arrange, whether it's rich text formatted, whether it's uh, a sender address included, that could be pulled right from your org. And it's just another way of automating specifics. But for our purpose, we're going to say uh, basically this is. So this is literally what's going to be uh, in the email content, the body of the email. And then this is the subject. You can see there are drop downs to give you multiple other options that may be pertinent depending on what you're creating. So really, I literally created it that quickly uh, our first basic flow, but notice they're not connected yet. So the starting action is not connected to the email itself Salesforce doesn't assume that that's how you want these connected so you have to do the drag and drop so there's my connector and then when we save that this basic simple step then we need to again create a label you tab over it creates the API address then when we click Save it's going to give you some warnings and these are not a warning is not an error is not a, a stop action it's basically saying the test demo needs at least one recipient. To be able to send it. So that makes sense. And if we were truly automating this, we would have set up the connector points in. inside my org environment but for our purposes today we're going to simply click on the run button to watch Salesforce put in place here's our next step so there are validation uh, rules running in the background and so that stopped me from running this specific email an email that would be sent without a uh, validation so let me click on debug and we're gonna find out where it's showing us here's the error and where it failed so we're gonna edit the flow So the validation rule verified that we need to have at least one addressee. Where is the email going to? And so for our purposes, again, today, in this demo environment, we're going to select a, a demo dummy email address. And again, this could be added to an automated from pulling down other drop downs then once we've created this simple flow we click save and run to test and now we can see our flow finished so we go to our gmail environment 
And there's the Gmail. And uh, my Gmail, uh, be careful, is this a valid message? But yes, there's the subject. There's the body. And so our simple flow worked and is saved as an auto flow in our flow builder. Now, notice we have not activated the flow yet. So just for our purposes of training, I'm going to go back to the original detail page, the window here, and refresh the flows that are in place. And here's our simple email flow from lesson eight that we created and notice it's not active. So we click on the flow itself. We click the activate button and the reason we're activating, we know it, it worked. We now want it to be uh, deployed and live in our org and so once we click activated now if we run it we know it, it we've tested it and run for run purposes I'm going to check if there's any debugging scenarios notice everything flowed cleanly it ran in milliseconds and so now when we come back to our home detail for flows and I refresh that page and we scroll down you can see now it has this auto launch process very simple HTML email flow and it has been deployed in our environment and now could be used as an auto run for the future and this specific flow could be added to a an object could be updated we can edit access to it we could give it more versions but now we've created this custom simple email flow that can be utilized in our org great We'll see you next time for our next demo. Okay, demo three and lesson eight. So we're talking about lightning flows. And we've looked at how to create them and where do you go to, to start that whole process. Remembering that you really need to get feedback uh, and this is the, the time that's involved, the analytical side of basically gathering your customer stories and what it is they need and get clarification. Sometimes that takes two or three meetings to get that clarification. So then we showed you in uh, Flow Builder and Setup where to get started there. Then we did a simple HTML flow and tested that and saw how it's not a screen that was set up but it was an automatic flow running in the background and now we want to talk about de deploying those flows so you created something now how do you get it connected to your users so they can leverage it in the field so we're going back to our org and we've chosen the accounts object to uh, deploy this uh, pre-created flow. And best practice, we're going to our setup gear icon in the upper right hand corner. We're clicking on edit page. And 
right from the user interface, you as the system administrator, now you're looking at the setup interface. So really this is the area that you work in on a regular basis. And now you have your menu on the left-hand side. You're, you have your uh, profile and edit capabilities on the right-hand side. And in the middle is your canvas. So what we're doing is putting flows in the place where uh, our users could activate them and, and utilize them. So I'm going to grab the flow component and move it under the activity timeline. Notice once it turns green, if I let go of it now, it won't drop onto the page. But once the component above it turns green, now I can release it. And notice it's already telling me it's defaulted to a flow component called create a case. If I didn't like that specific flow, if I was looking for something else, then I could scroll down in any active current flow uh, or specifically a flow that is screen activated. Remember in our previous demo, we created an auto launch flow so it wouldn't show up in choices here because now we're giving our users the screen capability to activate this flow so from the profile scenario i could change the layout and make this a two column component and edit and add filters as needed but really, for our purposes, one column is going to be sufficient. But I do want to make sure that the flow is how I want it to represent. in itself moving forward so once i clicked on edit that flow it's taken me to the flow details page and i'm going to click on create the case because that's the flow we're specifically focusing on and then i want to make sure that this is the process that i wanted to happen and so i could click debug here just to make sure that it's going to run and give me he, here's what's going to happen once it's activated for our users and so i'm just giving details for uh, this is exactly what the user would be interacting with uh, the the individual we provided this type of capability. So we have to fill in the required fields. Then we would have to choose a case type. So this is exactly what the user would go through if they wanted this to be created. And they can tell us, so for reporting purposes, where this case came from and... Because this is a text field, then we best practice, and obviously in this case, re required. We have our fields filled out. So we're just making sure that this is going to work. And there's our response. And so we know this has uh, created a case for us. We go back to the account record page. So we know it works. And if we go to 
cases then we look at open cases then we can see we've got those created that we've created In the past and updated here any op open cases that we just created so that gives you the over of how that was done but I need to make sure that it's activated for my org so I click on the act activation button remember I can set this for all accounts in in every app but instead of doing that I want to change that to make sure it's only going to be for my sales app because that's where uh, most of the cases arise from and if I wanted to uh, add additional then I can assign apps records profiles make it more specific as needed so we're gonna make it the sales app and I'm going to add service as well so that both of those teams could have that capability and we have service console with desktop and phone not just phone because our service team uses a desktop a lot so we've got that assigned we've got it activated now we're going to save it and once we have make sure that this is saved the changes have been saved then we're going to go back to our service console and make sure by the way here it is in sales so now that flow creating a case is in place and ready for our sales team to use it and we want to go back and check in the service console under the accounts And notice there it is in the service console as well they'll see that capability so that's how you deploy and activate and save specific flows that you want attached to specific users to give them this capability in their day-to-day -day use see you next time in our next lesson data loader so we've talked about the mini hats admins need to wear this is your security hat, your management hat. This is making sure that what you have in your org is clean and everything that you're, you're leveraging is best case scenario and best tools provided for your users. So after completing this lesson, you should be able to understand analytics in the Salesforce ecosystem, explain what the data loader uh, is, be able to configure a data loader. We'll do a demo of that. Uh, export uh, a set of data using the data loader, import data using the wizard, and we'll talk about the difference between the loader and the wizard, and then perform some mass delete for records. 
So it's important that just aware of how you're managing and providing the cleanest environment for you know, each of the business units and, and profiles that are a part of your system. So Salesforce Analytics, what, what does that mean? What does it involve? First of all, report snapshots. So we're going to talk about reports in another lesson, but reporting snapshots allow you to run reports to save results as custom records in, on custom objects in a snapshot environment. They can be scheduled so that you're capturing the data at a specific time and you can work with this summarization so that it's a point in time. Here's where we were. It's like a data mile marker. So benefits of using the snapshots. So running faster reports by reporting on data that's already summarized creating dashboards that refresh quickly because you got everything pre-summarized and sorting and filtering specific data via uh, list views and viewing trends in data because of these custom objects that are in place. So here's steps to create a snapshot. First of all, you're, you're creating a custom source report that's available with its columns, its headers. So this can be a tabular report or a summary report. It'll be uh, using this snapshot as its as a source, but the running user should have access to this report. And so the data is from one perspective. Then secondly, the target object uh, is a, a store of data generated at a certain time scheduled as specifics and it would have at least one field mapped to the source report. These fields are created the same data type as the report columns. So basically you're keeping it very simple. It can't be highly complex, but the field mappings from the report to the custom object uh, have a schedule of a specific or preferred time. So here's a snapshot, period one, period three, period two, and a legend that's showing stages and one captured moment of that summarization. So the data loader. So data loader is an application for bulk imports and it also can be used for bulk exports different than the wizard the data wizard uh, we'll see shortly can only import so the data loader reads extracts loads data from csv type files comma separated values and it exports data in that same format the csv format Here's some important points to, points to remember. So data loader supports all standard objects and custom objects. Duplicates will be allowed. So I remember a client previously that they thought because they were uploading their data from legacy platforms that Salesforce would automatically merge duplicates. That's not the case. So Salesforce can identify potential duplicates, but doesn't automatically merge them. And you can think about, realize the logic behind that. If there are two John Smiths, one lives in the state of Washington and another lives in Washington, DC, are they duplicates? And that's a decision that a user that, uh, uh, and or a, an app with fuzzy logic could be performed, but that fuzzy logic would need to be set up and the parameters put in place by someone outside of the standard Salesforce environment. The data loader has a batch size and 
the data loader can support up to a million records. So the data loader operation, so it, you have an insert for inserting records into Salesforce, an update for updating existing records, and upsert. So these are all basically, you know, terminology that's important. But the upsert is used for inserting the records and updating ex existing records simultaneously. And then you can use Data Loader to delete records from Salesforce. So exporting in the Data Loader operations environment is for extracting records from Salesforce into CSV files. When we're exporting all data, the records, including even the recycle bin, can be formatted into this CSV. So the installation. Basic steps, not really that complicated or difficult, but you Download the data loader installation package from the console. You install Java Runtime. It's got to be version 11 or later. So the Zulu Open JDK version 11 or later has to be in place before you install the data loader. And these instructions are there in your setup environment. We'll show you that when we do the demo. And then login considerations. If you're organization is restricting IP addresses, you need to use a password along with a security token to make sure it follows that format. So click on setup, click on home, platform tools, expand the integrations and click on data loader. And this is what it looks like in the menu field in the setup environment. It'll take you to the window where you can uh, click on the links to download data loader either for Windows or Mac and then you, cl you click on the one that's best suited for you. Then data loader, extract the files in in WinZip folder. You double click the install bat file. There's an installation window pop up. You choose the installation. It'll ask for a few details to create the start menu shortcut, desktop icon, those kind of things. Then you give the options as per what's gonna work for you. Once you have the data loader installed, then you complete the press any key. So the data loader icon will pop up if you haven't installed Java Zulu. So you need to make sure you've got JDK, set up the home path, download Zulu from your URL, choose the .msi extension file. Once it's downloaded, double click to install, click OK to finish the installation. So these steps again are in setup, but after you finish the Zulu Open JDK installation, open Salesforce Data Loader from the program, and then the window will open if Salesforce Data Loader is correctly installed. So the configuration. So you can select batch size, date format, time zone, and host server. If your org uses a proxy server, you need to enter the proxy server details. That's an uh, important side note. So there's a sec security token involved. When you access Salesforce from an IP address that's outside your company's trusted IP range, then you'll need a security token to log in. A security token is case sensitive, alphanumeric, that you append to your password or enter in a separate field on the client application. Security token is very important to use data loader as we're logging from a different environment to authorize the login. We should use the security token along with the password. Understand it's your data we're talking about. So to view, reset your security token, you use the navigation below. Click on your picture, the right corner. Uh, click on settings, expand my personal information and click on reset my security token. Then after you reset your token, you can't use your old token, the API applications and desktop clients. Just note to remember, uh, the new security token will be sent to your email ID. The data loader login using password plus security token 
to log into your Salesforce org, it has to be password authenticated. So here's an example. Password equals greater than A, B, C, D, E, F, and security token equals X, Y, Z. Then you'll need to enter the combination and click login button. Once logged in successfully, then you can click on next. Uh, we can avoid the token type login using the trusted IP range. So to add IP address to trusted IP range, you click on setup, home settings, click on network access. Click on the new button to add your range. And here's where you can have the start and end IP addresses and then add a description if that's important. And when you've walked through the steps properly, then here's what the loader looks like. So you choose the object from the list, choose the CSV file which you want to insert, click on next to proceed further. It'll initialize the file and once it's completed, it'll pop up the completion message. So mapping these fields from the CSV, you click on create or map, edit a map. And then the object fields and CSV headers need to be mapped. Drag and drop the relevant field labels at, to the matching field labels. Click on Save Mapping. And to have that in place for the next time you work on the same object. Make sure you click on OK. Select folder to support status report. So here's where you're looking at directory where you want to store your status report and you click finish. Now we're going to switch over into the data import wizard. I like to think of that as the little brother to the data loader and I'll tell you why. The data wizard can import up to 50,000 records at a time. Remember the data loader can support a million records, but actually it can upload five up to five million records so it works here's the thing about the the wizard, the little quote little brother data wizard it works only on leads accounts contacts solutions and custom objects it can help handle duplicate processing by data batching and allows us to disable workflow rules it helps to insert update and upsert records so it's an integrated interface that allows us to import and update salesforce records using that same csv file type so you click on setup home platform tools expand integration and then click on data import wizard it'll give you this detailed screenshot that gives you an overview and some directions and actually uh, videos you could watch and or uh, trailhead resources uh, trail community resources that are going to help you even learn more and uh, practice in an environment that would be suitable so here's the steps prepare your data so you you want to have a clean anytime you're putting data in any platform you want it to be as clean as possible so if there are duplicates you want to try to clean those up if there are uh, misspellings or blanks then anytime you can have that cleaned up before it's entered it's just going to make your instance that much more viable and you can understand if if users start clicking and you've launched the, this tool for them and then they start seeing errors in the wrong address misspellings uh blanks when they're expecting details to be there duplicates then they'll lose confidence in being able to use the tool uh, in their day-to-day -day business so you need to second point choose the data so you select the object you want to perform the, da the data on so you can go to accounts for example or contacts and right from that object 
environment launch the wizard you can instead of going to setup you can do it my point is right from the object so to map the fields you need to map the fields in salesforce with the appropriate source headers or fields in your csv file for example uh, it may say on your csv a uh, shipping street where you're using the field billing street in your salesforce environment depending on the object or how you set it up then you can map that one time at the beginning before you actually upload that information and you'll have it there cleanly and that mapping is a one time at the beginning it doesn't have to be done with you know every time you're using that same spreadsheet so then step four review and start your import you need to specify where your data your data is coming from and what's the path especially if you're using that csv and the wizard will help guide you right through those steps so a couple of important points click on launch wizard button it'll take you to the data import console and it shows you ahead of time i love it that salesforce gives you uh, stages instructions guidelines and if something goes wrong uh, error messages that allows you to be more efficient then you select the object so which object do you want this to be placed on so there's accounts and con contacts and you can see uh, smaller print but if you're going from the setup user in interface then pick the standard objects or custom objects that's uh, appropriate for what you want uploaded then you're going to select your operation. So once you choose the object, it'll show a second window so you can narrow down your choices. You could choose this is all new record scenarios or updated or a combination of new and existing. So then you can configure your settings for import. So you can select operation. Uh, and here's a quick snapshot of that but basically you're matching contacts and and accounts so the unique values in your data for example id values email values help salesforce determine whether to add new records or update existing records so if there's an id already in place then salesforce is basically upserting that and not creating new so the workflow flow rules uh, and their processes are triggered when the records which are being uploaded meet the criteria defined for those workflow rules so it'll automatically fire the workflows so you can make that choice and have that available so that what you have in place in your org will impact what you're uploading with this transaction in the wizard so uploading the csv file so in this step you need to have a clean csv and just like it's big brother that's really the only it's not going to upload a straight excel file it's got to be the comma separated so if it's applicable then we've got to select character encoding and again you can drag and drop the csv file into place or you can click the next button but if encoding is uh, an important step then you can do that before you go to next once you click on next then salesforce, salesforce is going to show you here's what it sees depending on the headers it'll it'll automatically if it's an exact match match up the fields in Salesforce with the headers on your document but anything that's highlighted unmapped you'll need to manually pick where you want that map to and then if you map them manually you can just click on map and then select from the list 
Then it's going to give you a chance to see a quick summary. Here's how many uh, records were impacted. And it, here's if there's any errors or unmapped fields. It'll show you that in this is before it's uploaded. This is like a pre-upload environment. And if you're good, then you can click start. If you need to, you can click previous and make more adjustments. Once you click next, then start import, then the import confirmation will start leveraging the data import wizard. It'll allow you, uh, many orgs will automatically default to this job status, but once you click OK, that will normally allow this detail page to pop in front and you can see the actual progress if that doesn't happen you can go to setup home expand environment expand job click on bulk data load jobs and then that'll take you to the same page we were discussing and you can see the completed jobs and click on the one uh, that you just finished uh, by clicking on the underlined ID link. And this report will have information about how many records were added, how many, if any, failed. Don't get discouraged if that happens. Uh, you can re clean up as needed and rerun that CSV and re-upload it and allow it to update your fields accordingly. But it's not a one and done forever. Mass delete records. So this tool helps us delete. You can tell we're talking about managing your data. So rather than tr trying to, you know, manually delete dozens or even hundreds of items that need to be removed from your org, you can use this tool. But it's not for every object. So there's really just a handful of standard objects. So specifically cases, accounts, leads, activities, solutions, contacts, and products. But I think if you think about it, those are probably in, in a business flow, those are probably some of the more um, easily uh, misloaded or combinations of uh, records that may need to be cleaned up especially if uh, someone loads accounts that were not supposed to be uploaded in this org or their old uh, accounts that are no longer active that were from either a legacy platform or from uh, an incoming new uh, branch of the company that's just been purchased. It, regardless, these are typically uh, the most we've seen needs for mass deletions. But we can delete up to 250 items at a time. And you understand that Salesforce doesn't want thousands of records to be deleted in a mass environment all at once because that that could create more problems for you uh when we delete a record then associated records are also deleted we can only mass delete reports that are in public report folders and that makes sense if someone has uh created folders that are shared by certain groups then we as an admin or as a mass scenario wouldn't uh, be reaching into those folders to make those deletions. Uh, we cannot mass delete reports that are attached to dashboards, schedules, or used in report snapshots. And again, that makes sense because those tend to be uh, more active data points. So limitations to mass delete for especially for sales teams. We can't delete partner accounts that have partner users. 
We cannot delete products on opportunities, but we can at least archive them. When we mass delete products, all related price book entries are deleted with the deleted products. That makes sense. They're attached. When we delete activities, any archived activities that meet the conditions are also deleted. So that's just important to know if you're if you're going to deal with historical information, just be aware that uh, it, it will impact your archived activities. Uh, when we delete activities, requested meetings aren't included in the mass delete until they're confirmed and automatically converted to events. When we delete reoccurring events, their child events are not displayed in the list of possible items to delete, but they are deleted. So to f perform a mass delete, we go to Setup, Home, Administration, Expand Data, click on the Mass Delete Records. Here in this window, it's at the bottom of that menu. So here you have the links to, on the right-hand side, what we have in larger print, mass delete accounts, leads, activities, contacts, cases, solutions, products, reports. And once you click on them, then the, the detail page opens and you would see where you could uh, specifically filter cleanly what you wanted to delete. You can enter the criteria and then uh, when, when you click search, it's going to show you here's what it sees that could be deleted. So first of all, you choose to delete accounts with closed one opportunities, for example, or you choose to delete accounts with another owner's opportunities. Oh, you want to permanently delete. If this is checked, it will permanently delete selected records and they can't be restored from the recycle bin. They'll, they'll be there for 30 days, but you'll have to reach out to Salesforce. You can select the records that you want to delete and click on the delete button. So on the left hand side, you have your tick marks. Once you click in, then you could click all at the top or just choose the ones that you need to be removed. So the difference between data loader and the data import wizard. So these two columns give you the overview. The data loader, bulk import, export, import or export. It's used to insert, update, delete or export. The data wizard allows only inserts and updates of operations. The loader can load at least 500,000 records and up to 5 million. The wizard can only upload or import 50,000 records. The loader, import and export data, wizard only import. Data loader, we have to in install the data loader first, then we can export and import. The wizard is available in the console, so you don't have to install it. Uh, the loader supports all custom and standard objects, where the wizard really, it's the custom objects and a few standard objects like accounts, contacts, campaigns, uh, campaign members, person accounts, leads, and solutions. The loader, while importing, duplicates cannot be ignored. While importing, du duplicates can be ignored in the wizard because it can be matched differently, separately, and workflow rules can be applied. So in my mind, data loader, big brother, data import wizard, little brother. So to summarize, we've been focusing on data and data management. The data loader is the big brother, 5 million exports and imports are the limits for that environment. And you really cannot uh, impact duplicates with the loader. The required installation is, uh, because it's outside of 
the Salesforce ecosphere. And so it has to have password protection, uh, user information, and it can have a token for extra security. The import wizard is part of the native instance that you're the admin of. And so you don't have to uh, download it onto your desktop. It's part of the SAS environment. The import wizard has a steps process that you're matching a CSV file like you have for uploading the data loader. Uh, the steps are just more uh, filterable and fewer records can be uploaded with the wizard. Data can be mass deleted, but there are limited objects that have that capability. So that concludes. Okay, lesson nine, demo one. So we're looking at data loader and uh, using it for the environment. Remember, up to five million records could be uploaded, uh, inserted. So we're going to set up. We're scrolling down to our integrations. We're choosing data loader. And here's the instructions. So follow these instructions very closely. Don't get frustrated if it takes you a couple of times. These six points right here, very, very, very specific. You need to get the Zulu Open GD JDK version 11 first, and then data loader after that and then extract all and walk down through those six steps and just be aware that uh, it may take you a couple of times but this is the way it should look in your environment so you have the the JDK you have the data loader environment the the zip file and ultimately here's what you're going to be uh, re reaching to where you can save this and have it available but here's the icon that is available to load onto your shortcut you know onto your desktop so the point being your your data loader tool is going to allow you to insert update upsert which is brand new um editing existing or doing both and so when you click on insert if you're not logged in to your version of salesforce it's going to require that you log in and remember that's because it's it's data that's got to be held secure but once you have that uh, login secure, then you can look at all the objects in your org. Or in my case, I'm at really best practice is to limit, especially the first time you're doing this, especially if you're going in, into production, to uh, a minimal impact. So I have some samples that I know I've uh, practiced with in the past and they're relatively small files and they're in notice they're in CSV format so when I pull that into the browser and I click next then it's telling me there's 423 records probably first time I would I would save uh, a smaller amount than that maybe just 20 25 records so that you don't frustrate yourself with what you're bringing into your org and so uh, this is a developer org and notice it's it's showing me 
I can choose to map existing or I can create a map that is going to work best. And so you're going to drag the Salesforce fields down to the column maps down below. So there's the account number. Then billing city. Right? So basically I'm matching to make sure I have you know what I want in place to make sure all of this is mapped to all of that. I'm going to clear mapping out now and then just make sure if I choose existing mapping then I could upload that way so I'm just showing you options of how you can match these if you click auto match fields then anything that's close or that has the same name it's gonna save a lot of effort so I'm gonna click save mapping click OK so I see the symbols that I like I see the fields mapped I click finish and it's telling me you're about to begin do you want to proceed yes so it's loading this insert and that fast it's uploaded it but you can see automatically I I've got errors so it did not like the way I uploaded that so I would need to go back and play with and open it and probably I'm assuming that the issue was I have an ID already in place here and Salesforce was creating an ID already so it did not upload those so I would need to clean up my SV file CSV file and then once it's imported then I would be able to see those moving forward okay I cleaned up the data and coming back to looking for a different sample smaller amount of records still not right okay I made my tweaks it's telling me okay initialization succeeded it's got 18 records now so I'm gonna create existing mapping make sure I auto match the fields okay click OK next finish so these new records are going to try operation is fully completed 18 successful inserts so view successes and that's what the issue was Salesforce will create a unique ID for these accounts so if I was upserting them and just bringing in uh, any updates then we would be fine but because I said these are new accounts then Salesforce is assuming it's gonna create the IDs so zero errors the process was completed it took us a couple of adjustments don't get frustrated but 
now let's check and see uh, these new accounts in our actual system org so we're going to come back out to our sales and we're going to click on accounts and new this week so here's what Salesforce just received those 18 accounts billing states and then if we had the city and so on it would show those as well so the point being successful update successful uh, new accounts in place and realize that because I'm the one that uploaded them then it showed me as the owner and so if you want uh, an owner different than the person who's uploading them then you would need to make sure you put the owner name as well in the file that you uploaded all right that concludes the overview of the data loader how to download it on your desktop following those instructions and then you could tell it's very very fast I only did 18 test uh, account object items records and when I did the first load I did not click on upsert I clicked on insert and insert means brand new so you wouldn't want those unique identifiers in place but Salesforce showed me the errors we were able to correct it in just a couple of minutes and get a proper upload all right, see you next time on the next demo. So now lesson nine and demo two. So this is exporting dat data. We looked at the data loader in an earlier demo and we inserted new records and we went through a testing and I think similar processes best practices should happen when you're exporting these are just copies it's not ripping the data out of your org so that you won't have it there anymore there is a I'll show you in a moment a deletion process but uh, what we're talking about today in this demo is simply exporting a version of in CSV files uh, one or more objects from uh, and record pages from your existing org so when we're looking at exporting then we're going to set up and we typed in the word export and it brings you to this export page where you can click export now and it would allow you to choose the object you wanted to export or you can click on export schedule and let's say you really needed a list of all the tasks and you wanted that uh, capability then you could set a time a date so let's say since we're um, not impacting a weekend we would just show all of the tasks for this month and then a preferred time when we wanted it to be exported and it might not happen exactly on that date and time but notice I could schedule it first day of the month so the point being I can include images documents files uh, and all of this could be as a backup and so you can think through if you wanted to include all your data and once a month back up all that's in your org this is the place to do that and schedule it and then place it in uh, the file or the server 
you wanted to save that information. Alternately, I'm going to click on cancel to come out of that. The additional way to export files or, or records is to use the data loader and instead of uh, trying to click on every single object I could choose just accounts and put those extracted accounts in the the file of my ch my choice and which fields I wanted to include in those and any conditions I wanted to add I select all the fields then it's going to use Soakable to set up an export and I want to begin that process so it's telling me there are 33 su successful extractions and I can see account numbers billing cities and this would be my file 33 of 33 uh, were extracted with zero zero error zero errors and so if I go now to the files where I put that here's my extracted accounts I would open it with uh, the app I needed to open it with and I would have that record as part of now an external great so that's extracting and exporting details and objects within our org and multiple ways to do that either from the export uh, embedded wizard inside of setup where we went first and we use that it's an export service that we could leverage or the data loader and export just specifically what we a copy of what we wanted to see today save it in the file we want and then open it uh, as needed great thanks for your time uh, we'll look forward to the next demo on lesson nine Okay, demo three for lesson number nine. We're ta still talking about data, managing data, having clean, uh, efficient, effective information for our users and secure. And so when we're talking about import importing, there's, you know, obviously there, there can be API calls from legacy platforms and that's a, a back of the house scenario. And many times IT departments make those direct connections. That's typically uh, what a developer, architect, those type of positions would be focused on. But for our users, that they're not going to make API calls. They're not going to do SQL or SQL and, and queries and those kind of things. And you as an administrator, you know, in your world, without uh, writing code, without creating you know those type calls you can uh, set up importing from other environments by simply leveraging the the data wizard and so what that would involve is let's say you have a, a previous CRM 
a client relationship management tool that's a legacy platform that's older and downloading CSV files from that environment, saving them into an environment you can access them from in uh, the Salesforce org, that's going to be the demo we're walking through today and really a best practice. So a couple of ways that we can do that. One is literally through the setup. I clicked on setup. I am in the home environment. Remember our menu on the left hand side. I started typing the word wizard for da data import wizard. And although this wizard, when I click on it, it, it won't import 5 million records, but it will import up to 50,000 records and you as administrator can come from the setup environment and you can monitor when there are uh, uploads coming from other environments and Salesforce is giving you this kind of checklist to clean up your data before importing it. We talked about that. Make sure your field names match Salesforce field names. Don't do too many records at once. Up to 50,000, but like we've said in other demos, you would probably want to test some data first and see how that worked and then move on from there. You can launch the wizard right from this environment. Uh, get your data cor correctly cleaned up. Choose what you want to import. Edit those fields if you needed to and review them and then start the import before i click on launch wizard notice that there are faqs there are uh, videos and there are additional resources like uh, trailheads and learning environments in the salesforce ecosphere that are going to really really help you transition to get the full breadth of understanding how you can import but I simply clicked on the launch wizard here and notice it's giving me options to either look at accounts, contacts, leads, solutions, campaign members, or if I had custom objects, like there is a customer object in this order that was created that I could import up to 50,000 records and walk through the process right here. And additionally to that, way of up importing and uploading then i am in now in the user interface so your users uh can have this out of the box they have this capability and then you can uh restrict it or allow it you know as you and your team feel like it's important but many many users and teams appreciate the fact that here from the account object account tab they can click on the import button and here they are in the same exact environment but just focused on accounts and contacts because it's right there from the account you know environment so notice that there are little question mark information help uh bullets that allow your users to quickly transition to find out okay what's the best practice what's the best way to do this if i was adding a new record i could use this drop down if i'm going to be uh, updating existing records i can choose that drop down or if it's a combination of new and existing and then notice i can use these pick list filters to uh even drill down more tightly to a ma to match if there's any contact records that i am updating i could use the salesforce.com id and uh, then create those and and name them and give them a record type notice that there's record types we've created in other environments but uh literally you could leave all of those just blank and let Salesforce do the uh, next steps. But we're going to click on the CSV environment 
which is probably uh, best case. Uh, these other Outlook, Act, and Gmail uh, are possibilities, but I've seen best practice to have a CSV file available. And then we talked about this before where we would find documents that are easiest for us to uh, leverage. And then we would pull those documents here. Let's see. There's samples here. And we would look at for all these different types of files. And uh, let's choose this opportunity data uh, on our next demo. But because we're looking at uh, the accounts object now we're going to choose our sample csv and we could also drag and drop it here to upload it but once we've identified that in our browser then we click next and notice here's uh, any mapping fields that needed to happen would be uh, right here and if there were mapping issues it would be in red that we would need to edit that I click next so it's telling us the ID is not mapped and is required for update insert so if we don't have the IDs then we need to go back and instead of leveraging the ID we're just going to use name name and site and then have that file in place and there's my sample and open and click next and next and so there's five fields that are mapped and they're all checked off there's nothing that else that needs to be mapped and now it's telling me my import is started when I click OK then it's going to take me to my bulk data load jobs and it's going to say 18 records were processed none of them failed it was very very quick upload and because we used this environment where we just used a test process then we can click on this view results and we can actually print that out as a, uh, a print object for us so then let's come over to the user interface and the sales app and the accounts object and new this week and here's our accounts that have been uploaded for us and then if we wanted in this list view to view uh, each of the fields that we map then we could adjust this list view to see exactly what we're looking for and uh, we've discussed that in other demos so that's importing uh, objects and data from uh, outside sources and in a safe environment that your users could be trained to do this and rather than walking through manually you know hundreds of records then uh, once they've done a test like this and you kind of practiced always we we test it first in our sandbox or developer org like this is then uh, once we're comfortable with the mapping and it's and it's uh, lined up in the uh, the fields cleanly and we've had this success then we could do a larger list up to 50,000 uh, account records and that would be an effective efficient way saving uh, multiple multiple time uh, tracking pieces and allowing our users to get right to what's most important to them, which is following up with their specific clients. All right, see you next time. Okay, welcome back to lesson 10. So we're almost there. 
we've covered a lot amazing amazing we're almost there we've covered a lot amazing amazing amount of information and hopefully benefit to you to just launch towards uh each day getting a little bit better and mastering this uh this amazing environment and the salesforce tool so lightning reports and dashboards is probably one of my personal favorites and uh, the reason being throughout over the years uh, this is my 14th year in the in the ecosphere uh, adults like to learn by and and motivate themselves by having goals by having something out in front of them that they are constantly pushing themselves towards and reports and dashboards allow you to create custom guidelines to be able to show yourself okay here's where i need to go and here's how i'm going to get there and i can document that and then in those reports they can be shared and collaborated on in teams and in units and can roll up and be impacted in, uh, not only in an individual business unit but across the ecosphere and those reports then can be added to dashboards and in one single uh screen view one single uh digital page you could see up to 20 reports ranging from all different areas all different objects and uh resources and uh basically everything from KPIs to ROIs to pipelines to service levels these are all uh visible both in reports and then dashboards and then those reports can be privatized where they're uh, really held confidential if it's a group like uh human resources or licensed compliance areas where or a security area that really we have to keep low visibility for the the greater good then either way you can have those customizations that allow you to expand what the company sees as a whole and then what you're motivating yourself for uh, at each quarter or each month uh, or each uh, level milestone that you're reaching so let's jump in at the end of this object this learning lesson you should be able to do number 1 implement reports and dashboards two discuss custom reports and the different types it's amazing how many different types of custom reports can be created uh, explore options available in reports because uh, every quarter salesforce is iterating and here just within the last couple of iterations they've added formula fields and capabilities of really leveraging uh how you can edit uh in line there's a beta right now for in line editing on reports like you can uh on list views uh number 4 share reports with users and and other profiles and that's what we talked about at the beginning being able to uh leverage the information and the data in a way that's going to enhance uh really every area of your business functionality and then explore dashboards and the visibility where dynamic dashboards can be seen from the user perspective uh, when you click on it you see what's relative to you or you can have dashboards that allow uh multiple levels of views across the enterprise so report types There are reports right right out of the box that are standard type reports and then there are customizations that can be developed over time. So a report type defines a set of records and fields that are available that a report can uh decipher and make visible 
the relationships between primary objects and their related objects. So accounts, contacts, opportunities, and then how activities are uh, interacted with those different relationships between those objects. Report types allow us to build reports in Report Builder so that users can create their own custom perspective. And I'm still amazed at how many different ways I'm seeing users leverage uh, report types so that they have the information at, at a glance at any given moment as soon as they log in and that they can even subscribe and schedule these reports to come to an inbox or to a team queue or to leadership on a regular basis. So there are predefined standard types of reports. Salesforce provides a large range of predefined standard types. So there's accounts and contacts, opportunities, customer support reports, leads reports, campaigns, activities, administrative type reports, like logins and user uh, details, and then price books and products for uh, manufacturing and industrial type uh, organizations. So creating these custom type reports is effective, easily developed, and very quickly put together. Custom report types extend the type of reports that are read out of the box, and as we've said, can enhance your view of what your customer needs are. So click on Setup, Home, Platform Tools, Expand Feature Settings, Expand Report, and Dashboards, and click on Report Types. So you'll see some of that right out of the box, and then others that you're creating. So Bucket Fields, there's ways in which you can group together related data that allows for summaries and groupings that make the report more like a pivot environment and more of a summary scenarios that give a quick glance of not just rows and rows of data, but how that data is summarized or grouped together in an effective uh, business functionality. So it helps us easily categorize values for a field without creating multiple formula fields or custom fields. There's out of the box functionality that we define multiple categories into these groups based on their record values. This is doesn't affect other reports or other objects, but it's a field with a number type or text and even drop down field values. So in this case, we'll create a bucket column in the case report using case origin. Here we created two bucket types. A portal bucket that has email and web options and customer phones that has phone options. Let's see how it'll be shown in reports. So when we do our demo, we'll talk about the fields we can create and then show bucket names and how those are then reflected. So there's a new column source from added. So we can see two bucket categories and the customer phone and their portal. So this expands the capability to allow us to see more details and more sources and where these customers uh, originated from so we can begin to track uh, best practice towards enhancing that area of our business. So a report returns a set of records that meets certain criteria. What is a report? It's a display organized in rows and columns. And that data can be filtered, grouped, displayed, uh, graphically as charts as well. Reports are stored in, stored in folders and that folder controls the access. You must have at least read permission on the record included in the report. Otherwise, when you run it, 
you wouldn't see that data or it would appear, appear blank. So standard reports versus custom reports, a little comparison. Standard reports are built in. Custom reports, we build from scratch. Standard reports are stored in standard folders. Custom reports must be stored in custom personal or public report folders. Standard reports cannot be edited or deleted. Custom reports can be edited or deleted. Standard reports cannot be searched on. Custom reports can be searched. So report folders, we've talked about that a little bit. The folders allow us to choose reports that are stored in specific groupings that we call electronic folders. Salesforce CRM we can't save reports to standard report folders. We can only save reports to my personal custom report folder. Unfiled public report folders or any custom report folder where we have appropriate read or write access. Using the link create new folder allows us to create report folders for custom reports. So the point being we have lots of diff different types of customizations, including who has access, uh, what groups could have what capabilities in a folder with multiple, multiple reports. And it would organize it so searching for and security of and access to are localized in one section, one part of the report types. And creating these report folders is really relatively easy. You can click the reports tab, click on new folder. There's options that are drop downs, and then you click the save button. We'll show that in our demos. You can label the report, give it a unique name, give access to other users, including read only, that really just lets them view it, read write that lets them edit it. And we can move the reports from uh, at large into the public, the, the report folders, so that, like we said, they can be organized, they can be uh, systematized, and you can really show standards. So, for example, if you had an executive folder of uh, standard reports, then your team knows, okay, this is what the C-suite level is looking at what they're expecting, what their quarterly expectations, what, you know, when they come to uh, end of the year or end of the month or end of the week, whichever, here's where they would be focusing to make sure that the business is on target. And then I've seen multiple users take a report like that, that they know is standardized and they know... Uh, the leadership is going to want to access regularly to check, keep accountable, and then they customize, they clone and save as and customize those type reports so that they could get specific in their state, in their city, uh, in their uh, opportunity types, in their account divisions. And so reports can be leveraged where you can get very granular and reports are very very collaborative where list views could really be filtered very similar to reports but list views are typically for an individual user to accomplish uh, daily tasks or uh, weekly updates where reports are really designed to be able to collaborate to uh, have goals and uh, missions keep on target. And with reports, you can put multiple objects together where in list views, it's best practice to keep one object. So you can have lists of contacts, but you can't mix them together with their uh, opportunities or and or their activities in a typical list view where in reports you can combine that and really see a more uh, compiled broader view of what's happening in your region and all in your team 
So report folders must specify their uh, accessibility. So accessible to all users, hidden from all users, accessible by the following user. So these can be set up in a hierarchy where groups, roles, or roles and subordinates can have a hierarchy user type interface. Any private folder that's managed by or restricted by specific departments would not be able to be visible in public groups. Or you can, on the other hand, set up folders that would be uh, organized in a really effective way, but everyone could have access to them. For example, pipeline folders where you want the entire sales team or and or the support team to be aware of regional pipelines or quarterly pipelines, depending on how you wanted to organize them. Here's a couple of important points. Deleted reports and dashboards can be retrieved from the recycle bin, but we cannot use the report search functionality to search for standard type reports. So here's how to create report folders. You click on the reports tab, click on new folder. A low window will pop up, enter the folder label, and then press unique name. It will automatic, automatically be generated. Click the save button. Below is a sample screenshot of ABC report folders which were created. So the menu bar in the reporter's homepage gives you quick access to all folders. Salesforce supports four main formats currently. They each have varying degrees of uh, functionality and complexity. So there's a tabular report, summary reports, matrix reports, and join reports. And this goes more complex, more diverse from the tabular to the join, but all of them could be effective based on what your business goals are and what you're trying to track. Tabular reports provide simple listing of data without subtotals. These reports are suited for creating lists of records uh, with a single grand total. They can't be used to group data. So really good, uh, powerful, I like to call Excel spreadsheet on steroids. So it's a basic format in the Salesforce environment, but very, very, very functional. You can see every header has filter uh, drop downs, and each of these will can roll up to totals. And the filters set up in this type report then can be a quick glance that are automatically updated as users are entering information in their view of Salesforce. Then this report. Uh, can include their automatic updates, their changes, and it would reflect immediately in the tabular report. Summary report shows uh, formatted summaries listing data like the tabular report, but it's sorting them, the sorting capability, the grouping capability, the subtotaling of data. These can be used to get those subtotals based on the value of a particular field. So uh, we were mentioning sorting, and because this is a summary type report, you could have sums, averages, minimums, maximums, and all of that is automatically updated as users input information into the org. A matrix report will provide totals for both rows and columns. So it allows us to group records vertically and horizontally by row and column. And so this is a true table type scenario. And has pivot capabilities where the lower right hand corner is showing basically bottom line, you know, ultimate totals 
of all of the activity and or record counts that are uh, above and to the left. So this is a true subtotal environment where you can pivot either horizontally or vertically to get best case and most accurate information by department, by account, by month, or however you want it to pivot the axes. A joined report is where you combine two different reports, two different report types to get a clear view of more data and how it's linked. It makes the real estate broader where uh, many times in a joint report you have to scroll to the right uh, to see the whole view of this joint report, but it very effectively allows one location, one report where multiple, multiple uh, interactions from multiple users would be reflected in this joint capability. So accounts, cases, opportunities, all could be reflected in this one dynamic view. So here's a little overview of best practices or best use case. A tabular report is excellent for making a list. It is supported in dashboards. So we mentioned that reports can roll up and you can leverage bucket fields in tabular reports. Summary reports, they group and summarize the data. And so they will roll up to dashboards. They have charts. Once you have any uh, one group or more, then you've got an X and Y axis and you can uh, show pictures charts of the data summary reports uh, allow for bucket fields and for formula fields a matrix report it's really best for groups and summaries by row and column so again supported in dashboards charts are available bucket fields and formula fields then the join report is a side-by-side -side comparison or compilation of data from different objects and you can't show them in a dashboard environment although you can uh, edit reports in dashboards with more filter capability so there's a lot of leverage uh, when a report is moved into a dashboard and even more filtering and chart capabilities but the join report is report chart supported it does have formula capability to reflect formulas and then it is the only uh, report type that allows for cross object formulas we talked about that briefly but if you need uh, a lot of different objects or tabs to be reflected in a report it may take creating a joint report to visualize that. So the Lightning Report Builder, awesome tool to make it quick, effective, efficient to create these reports. It used to be, and it was some CRM platforms, it still is weeks before uh, reports can be built. But now with Re Lightning Report Builder and Salesforce, it's a user interface that Salesforce sets up right out of the box and it's a drag and drop feature that helps you create and edit reports on your own so it's not waiting for someone else it's you practicing developing uh, sharing interacting with and it's a new modern look a, a feel to a data that allows a whole new level of not just accountability but goal setting uh, thresholds and real just good business practice development so features of the lightning report builder so you have interactive filters 
organized systematically with folders and subfolders, build reports using rows and columns, execute without saving so you can run the reports and see your subtotals and totals and, and not have to save the report unless that's going to be effective for you. And then merging dashboard components directly into the report so that I mentioned earlier you have a lot more leverage capability when a report is loaded into a dashboard so it can be colorized uh, more chart availability expanded and uh, filtered at a whole new level so here's a glance at the report builder console we mentioned the menu, the, the fields menu on the far left, and this is actually uh, come standard collapsed from the right over to the left, and there's a a little uh, vertical fields recognition here in the upper left hand corner. When you click on that expansion, it literally expands from left to right and shows you all of the fields that are available to create these column headers so a field name is a field in a salesforce record like uh account address uh, account created date account name those kind of things and then uh, it's also equal to and represented by a column header so when those things are adjusted, edited, updated in the field, they automatically get updated in the report. And we can cho choose which columns we want to show. Literally, you can drag and drop these fields. So once you expand out this column and once you drop it into this column area, then the column header and the details show up to the right and then you could drag and drop grab and move if you want a last modified date at the very top so you can see when is the last time that record was actually changed then you can make a lot of those movements and see it in a preview by simply clicking on that preview button automatically and then you can filter it from this uh, lightning builder environment and really take uh, as much time as you need to get it right and then save it and then come back and edit uh, edit it again if you so need to on an ongoing basis because you see these buttons give you lots of options from um, qu create this record very quickly clicking save and run and being able to leverage it and the details you've captured immediately. So Lightning Report Builder Console. So there is a fields pane and that lists all the accessible fields. We talked about that. A filter pane where you can create logic and uh, design filters so that you're looking specifically at, uh, for example, a certain state and all the accounts in that state or uh, a certain opportunity closed one date uh, all those closed in the last quarter that can be leveraged using filters pane the preview pane we mentioned uh, you can add reorder readjust and look at a preview before you even run the report that allows you to see did the formula that I developed enhance the report is it giving it a true uh visual representation of, of the actual data is this report going to be impactful uh when i make it available in the meeting uh this afternoon or tomorrow so you can right on the fly make adjustments and edits using the report builder preview pane it shows only a limited number of records so just be aware that if you have uh, a thousand records that you're 
uh, bringing into the report because of the way you filtered it out and uh, because there's a lot of really good data available to you, a lot of work being done, then in the preview mode, you may only see 20, 25 of them, depending on uh, one, the size monitor you're looking at, the resolution and the ratio of zoom you have uh, set up on uh, your dash desktop. or your iPad or whatever you're interacting with in Salesforce environment. But being aware of that just allows you to uh, don't panic if you don't see uh, you were expecting 500 records and you only see the first 20, then it's, it's either scrolling on your phone or clicking down uh, on your desktop to see more uh, revealed record types. So filters. The filters and their logic allow us to get more specific data. So the standard filter applied by default to most objects. Different objects have different standard filters, but most objects include show me and date field. Show me filters the object around common groups like my accounts, all accounts. The date field filters by a field such as created date or last activity and a date range such as all time or last month. Field filters are available for reports, list views, work rules, and other areas of application. So each filter set the operator value and those are in place because of that filter set. With tabular summary and matrix, matrix reports, you can drag a field from the fields pane into the filters pane and add a report filter. Uh, filter logic, you can add Boolean conditions to control how field filters are evaluated. You must add at least one field filter for uh, applying that logic moving forward. A cross filter, we mentioned this, that this is a filter based on the child object that's using with or without conditions. So you can add sil sub filters, filters to further filter by fields on the child object. But the point is you have a cross filter with uh, counts and opportunities and you add uh, the opportunity filter, you create, make sure that the name equals ACME on both. And so you can see a true correlation between those accounts and opportunities. For tabular reports, we select the maximum number of rows to display, then choose a field to sort by and sort order. If you use a tabular report on the source report for dashboard chart component, you're going to limit the number of rows that it'll return. So the process to use filters, click on new report, pick accounts in the record type, click on continue, click on filters. In the filter pane, add a filter to include a field filter. Choose a field from the first drop down list. For example, choose type. And then
set the filter operator to equals. Under value, select customer, direct, and click save. For cross object filters, then these filter types allow you to extend your reports to objects related to the original objects defined in the report type. But cross filters, the point being, help you fine tune your results without any code, without using formulas. You really can see objects with their relationships, contacts, and so on, accounts with opportunity relationships, and how those are functioning moving forward, where they are in their business cycle. So the process to use cross object filters, you go to reports, click new report, select account report, and click continue. Then click filters, set the created date range to all time, click the more actions arrow, select Add cross filter. Select a parent object from the show me drop down list and your choice determines which related objects to see in the child object list. And then select accounts. Choose with as the operator. Select a child object from the secondary object drop down or search by name. The drop down list contains all eligible child objects of your selected parent object. Set opportunities and click apply. So choosing cross objects. So here's a snapshot of what's available and then you can tweak this to what's going to work best as we collaborate through these. In filter logic, you can use and or or not. So operators are defined by our logic. And by operators I'm talking about the pivot point in the logic setup. So the operator AND finds records that ma match both values, or finds records that match either value, not finds records that exclude that value. The more you practice and use this, the easier it becomes. So creating charts. A chart is a pictorial representation of that basically linear or horizontal data. And it allows you to get a picture in your mind of, you know, what this group is doing, where they're headed, where they are so far. All of that can be done in this pictorial type environment. So you click add a chart on the button pane, select a ch chart type. By default, is we'll use a bar chart. Then enter the appropriate settings on the chart data tab. For the chart type we selected. Click on button to edit chart properties like x-axis and y-axis and for the right values and formulas formatting that you want. Okay, types of charts. So there's horizontal bar charts, vertical bar charts, line charts, pie charts, donut charts, funnel charts, scatter charts, and that, that's not really even all of them, but you can see lots of variations Lots of ways to look at information uh, depending on the users, the group, uh, what their focus is. This can be really a game changer. Creating joint reports in Lightning. So we've talked about it a few times. Now let's just start talking about how would that work. So Go to the Reports tab, click New Report, select Account Report Type, right? So we've been down that road. 
change the report type to joined report and then click apply. And so that's a drop down from that upper left hand corner. Lots of people miss that. And then adjust the filters for the account record. I'm uh, here we're using sample org. So we kept the filter conditions for all accounts and all time. Just makes for a cleaner view. So click the add block button and select the case report. Click on add box. Add a filter to the cross block to set status like new. Add one more block. You can select up to three. The opportunities report type for this one and set filters for the opportunity block to show open for the correct time period. Now set the group access block by account name. Click the add chart button to visualize the data and then dashboards. So dashboards are a very effective way of visualizing data. We've said that several times. With this Salesforce Lightning component, you can view existing reports in a wide variety of forms, charts, tables, graphs, multicolored, uh, dark format with a, a dark background running behind the, the chart that's out front. The grid area helps us to keep place the components by adjusting their size. The flexible layout is the key point which po supports multiple columns with automatic adjustment. It allows you to view multiple reports, charts, graphs, tables side by side. Both reports and dashboards become real-time smart utilities to allow users to make better decisions. So each dashboard we have mentioned can incorporate 20 different components, 20 different reports. Administration control or access how the viewers see the dashboard by storing them in folders very similar to reports it's just another level of visibility and accessibility and security dashboard folders can be public hidden or restricted much like reports based on group groups and roles if you have access to the folder then you can view its dashboard the difference between classic and lightning dashboards so I started out in Classic. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And then about six years into my development as administrator, then Salesforce began rolling out Lightning. And at first, I, I really struggled because I, I had gotten really focused on looking at data a certain way and creating that data. And, and Salesforce has... Well, even when we were in classic mode every year, three times a year, it kept getting one iteration better, second iteration better every year. Now with Lightning, the the classic dashboard has an all classic, uh, almost like a formal and a a smaller view, where Lightning dashboards are smooth, softer colors, cleaner edges. Uh, larger display capability. Classic had a limit to display three columns only in their dashboards. Lightning can display more than three and has a hybrid system. So depending on you know what your company wants to leverage. In Classic, the columns were not adjustable in the dashboards. There is a flexible layout in the canvas of setting up lightning dashboards uh, classic dashboards needed to refresh every time any change was added uh, lightning dashboards are reflect refreshing automatically based on a schedule that you can set up uh, the admin can put into place and Lightning dashboards are drag and drop. It's just amazing how uh, you can.
literally filter and update and change and enhance and really the only keystrokes are basically if you wanted to change the name of the report in your dashboard to be more unified then you could actually keep the report name as a as a base but update the name in your dashboard where it's more consistent across the components in the dashboard so components we, when we talk about components we're talking about basically they they come across as as little white boxes and those boxes can be adjusted in the grid to different sizes but you can have horizontal bar charts vertical bar charts line charts that connects a series of points uh, across the real estate of the chart the obviously the pie chart that compares uh how the different the whole and get a really good perspective of overall totals uh, donut chart so show portions of individual groups to each other a funnel chart which is really good for showing uh, pipeline progression and the different stages uh, especially if it's a sales cycle where you have the top of the funnel and then uh, as it moves down towards the bottom typically that's uh, the pipeline more ratio to close higher level of closing ratio so it's a true representation of the the tighter it gets at the bottom the better chance it is of closing as a closed business sale the gauge component kind of looks like uh, an odometer in a car but it allows you to show uh, your range and how far you've come and how many records or how many cases have been closed or won or updated uh, and, and those filters can be based on reports and then updated and shown in in a uh, segmented format so you can see the the actual uh, pivot bar moving towards the hundred percent goal to the lower right uh, a metric component so this is to show a single value to display like oh, eight cases closed you could have have one big eight right in the middle of that component and it stands out in red or however you wanted to visualize it and then the table component allow, allows us to show uh, names of the top five in service or in uh, equipment development or processing or sales So creating these dashboards, much, much more simple, much, much more effective and efficient. And really, you're clicking on the new dashboard button. You give your dashboard a name and best practice a description. Then you put it in a folder that is most effective for you know, your business unit. Uh, realizing that both reports and dashboards will default to private uh, in the beginning. And I've had several users uh, try to share uh, a report they created on the fly or a dashboard they just finished this morning. And they didn't put it either in public 
reports or public dashboards or in a folder that everyone they wanted to show it to had accessibility and it's a little frustrating can be corrected very very quickly but you can imagine a marketing executive rushing into a meeting whether it's online or in person and they just completed uh, a really great dashboard overview of the top 10 components in the marketing side of the business uh, uh, business functionality but they literally didn't save it to a folder a marketing folder executive folder or someplace where everyone uh, on the call or in the meeting can see it so you may be able to look at uh, and I've seen this happen multiple times in this in a zoom scenario user the leader is showing their report but other people have a side monitor or a mobile unit and they're looking at what they can see and they literally can't bring it up because they don't have access and i've seen that over and over and over again it can be adjusted and changed updated very quickly but best practice is to take the time to make sure it's accessible to the right people so that when you share it as a link in an email or in a chat environment or you schedule it to be subscribed or to to multiple users or like i mentioned you're in a meeting you you don't face the confusion or the frustration that people can't see or or interact with their own version of that report and many of them if it's a really effective type report or dash dashboard they would want to clone it and save as and leverage it for their region or their territory or so on so step three is to add a component and select the desired component and select click the select button so this is literally bringing the report up into your new dashboard and once that component's in place it's displayed uh, similar to the way your report was set up. But now, as I've mentioned several times, you can change uh, the access points. You can create uh, a new theme or name uh, or add components to the dashboard and enhance this one report with other reports that maybe move month to month or quarter to quarter. and here's the first component you could see in the upper left and good representation of you know an account sample type report and then you can imagine as you're moving from left to right you can enhance the flow of that information to show year over year or region over region comparatively so dashboard builder is another drag and drop interface it's not difficult it's it's learning once you do it three or four times and once you see the results and how it impacts your group then it gets literally I've had multiple users get very excited about leveraging uh, the developing these so the dashboard uh, can be edited once you finished and saved then you're not done forever you can come back and add an update and make changes as needed so you can click on the gear symbol to change the title and make it a unique name you can change the folder component settings give the dashboard a title uh view and set the running user for the dashboard we briefly mentioned that that uh it's not an unlimited dynamic environment but uh for most of our users, they have the capability of uh, the most important dashboards being viewed. When you click on it and view it from your org, you see the information that's relative to your area, to your territory, uh, to your group. And then other people, as they clicked on it, they would see what's relative to them and it just makes it much more efficient and you don't have to create multiple multiple reports or dashboards because it's pivoting based on your hierarchy and who you're related to in your org uh, you can set and and click the text field at the top 
to add a description. Uh, each component can have its own individual. So you have a description and a title for the overall dashboard. So let's say uh, KO, KOIs for Q3. And then each of those components could be reports that are reflecting a different part of key indicators, right? And so it just gives a really clean flow and one place to view everything. So we've talked about uh, Excel spreadsheets on steroids, just kind of the way I look at it. So you can go to the report folder, click on the report that you want to ex export, click on the drop down on the far right hand corner. And then when you choose the export function, you're going to see two different types of capabilities. So the formatted report, this is more designed if you're going to go to a meeting or show this report and you want to see topic headers, you want to see it's more kind of a formal presentation piece. Uh, it's not like uh, a, gl a glossy type thing, but just a much more it has your name, the title of the report, uh, date frame of the report. But then also, if you want to see really just the, the details like an Excel spreadsheet, you have that option to export it. And this makes it much more easy to filter, leverage, uh, change from a spreadsheet environment where the formatted report really doesn't filter as well because it's designed to take a snapshot of you and really uh, to hand out, print and hand out as part of. Uh, a meeting agenda or uh, a snapshot of kind of a upbeat or updated or uh, it's more than just raw data in columns it has subtitles and and at the very bottom shows uh, a kind of a summary of who created what when where and how so those are just to keep in mind it's not required obviously to export these uh there are exporting capabilities to back up your data but this is really one case use case i've seen is uh, as sales teams are back out in the field and making uh, in the field appointments and they're going to be traveling throughout the day then to make sure they don't get themselves in a, a negative position if there's not Wi-Fi or internet capability or if they're on a plane uh, and they just want a quick glance, something that's printable, tangible, and visible, then this is a way uh, that you could export either one of those types of uh, data representations. So if we choose details only, we can get the Excel format, the Excel SX, or the comma delineated report types. A couple things to remember. We can't really share reports directly with other users unless it's in a public folder or a folder that that user can share, has share access, access with us. So folders are the key. Uh, scheduling sharing the dashboards understanding that the folders are what keep the individual reports in a secure and clear and easy access and some of our users they uh especially when they're starting out most everything would be in a public uh environment but then it just gets so cumbersome after a while, even if there's not security issues, it's just trying to organize it. It's like having, uh, you know, a filing cabinet that all the files are laying on, out on top or on the side or not in the cabinet, not in any type of structure. And so this is kind of your electronic filing cabinet for reports and dashboards. So wherever that folder is uh, housed, you can go to your uh, folders detail page, click the drop down next to that report and then share it. 
And that sharing capability is going to be where you can leverage the filters and share it by user, share it by group, share it by hierarchy, by roles, by name, and then give the access of views or managing or editing. And you allow that to happen. And you'll notice when you save those and click that share button, then those names or roles or profiles here drop down below the access bar so you could scroll down and see you know i'm the manager that i gave capabilities of sharing or uh, editing or just viewing to these different groups or these different people then the summary a lot that we covered in this time together where we visualize several standard reports standard reports are really there right out of the box allow you something to look at right at the very beginning day one you can see uh, how business is floating and then you can filter or adjust those and then create custom reports clone those save as and then begin to put them uh in in folders because you've created different types of reports based on what your needs are and then these reports you can see a comparison basically from tabular to joint of how they get more complex more capable um, more data can be pivoted and then in report builders just like in dashboard builders you're going to be able to not only set up types of charts and types of reports but also uh, give coloring, give more visual appeal, and ultimately have standard dashboards, standard reports that kind of set the level, set the expectation, and then your users can customize those and leverage it uh, at every level of business opportunity. Okay, hey, lesson 10, demo one, creating dashboards. So we've talked about in our lesson, all the different variables. Let me show you how that works out from, from the ad admin perspective first, and then we'll flip over and look at the user perspective. So we go to the gear icon and click on setup. And we started typing in the word report and it took us to reports and dashboards and we clicked the drop down and so here's several things from a an administrator standpoint they're just important for you to be aware and they'll mean more to you the longer you're in your environment the longer you're managing the data first of all there are access policies that you can beyond folders and beyond uh, hierarchies then you can set policies that control the conditions which users have for these access uh, reports and dashboards and high assurance session required so this is for orgs or companies that really it's not that they're limiting the capabilities but they really want to tighten down and focus on you know these reports are for specific usages and specific teams and the the interaction with that data could be sensitive so that's one way of uh, highlighting and validating who it is that's verified to see those type of reports. So you can understand if we're talking about security clearance level or government, uh, uh, local organizations that are for the public sector, for, for government information, then this is one area where you can really really impact how information and data is uh, segmented 
then historical trending. So this is for companies who really they're they're in a long term uh, uh, compliance scenario. They have to keep. Uh, there are certain financial institutions that have to keep historical records for a minimum of seven years. Uh, others, the varying different times, but. With historical trending, you could show the trendings across the org, and in this environment, you as administrator can uh, set up across the enterprise, whether it's cases, opportunities, what you need to make sure they're tracked and uh, that there's capable reference points to see how are we trending in our business flow. And so these are areas where you as the admin can have, you know, a deep and important and viable impact. And this is where I'm recommending again that you have a council, you have advisors, you have a team, and you talk through these things because it's three, six, eight, ten years from now then if you've enabled this and you've kept just a viable recognition of what's happening, you'll really be able to show here's how the business has been unfolding and that would help and typically in projections for capabilities or for uh, you don't have to wait 10 years to get a, a good picture of where the business is headed. Talked about report types several times, and so as the admin, you can set up custom report types that allow for uh, the primary object and then labeling that and then what category it's uh, segmented into and how those report types are built out and a description of what's available in those and we're going to go into the user interface in a moment but here's where you as the admin create the relationship of what type of uh, report building is capable for each of our user interfaces. Uh, as well as snapshots. So you can uh, actually make report running faster, uh, create dashboards that have a quick snapshot, uh, sorting specific data summaries, and viewing trends in data with these snapshot milestones. And again, this is where you're, as the admin, kind of creating the leverage for what kind of snapshots are available. So you get to set up the name, who the running user would be from whose perspective, and then what source reports are leveraged to get that tar target object, that quick uh, point of reference. Then in reports and dashboards uh, setup, you enable floating headers. So just simple, you know, aesthetics versus uh, hiding classic reports. And that might be something that's important as your team transitions and lets go of what's going to be sunset and focuses on new formatting. Uh, and including enabling component snapshots, uh, excluding disclaimers from reports. All of these are, the users don't see this type of arrangement. You have that capability of setting up that up from your side. Now let's go into the app launcher. I'm going to type in uh, reports and go to that object. Because dashboards are really built on reports. So we mentioned uh, as soon as you go to that object, on the left-hand side is your menu. And 
Salesforce is always going to default to recent. It's trying to show you and help you. Hey, here's what you looked at most recently. And the more you're in the org, the more you're using this uh, database, then there'll be several reports that you have recently looked at. that will just give you a quick uh, reference point back. Uh, just remember when you are in recent reports, if you try to search on, because there is a powerful search engine here. We talked at the very beginning, lesson one, about this global search and the Einstein capabilities and the actionable items. But each of the object homepages have a search component, but I've had several users start typing in uh, the name of a report they created here and they get frustrated because it doesn't pop up but it's because it's telling you search recent reports and so the the best practice is to come down to all reports and now if you start typing search if uh, i've had clients that have had thousands literally i think one of the orgs i was in had over 5200 reports that had been created uh, for in an org that was uh, a little bit over 10 years old. So there's really not a limit on how many reports could be created, but uh, depending on the the type platform that you're, the instance that you're involved in. But the point being, uh, if you try to search on recent, you won't get a full picture. Uh, and remember, whenever you create a report, it's going to originally drop into the created by me and private report folders because those are just defaults. So if you want to save the report where other people can view it, then you would be clicking on public reports. Remember that folders uh, and this particular org, we really haven't set up folders yet, but you can create a new folder type and Then now this type of folder could be uh, available to anyone or you can share it with only specific user types or report types so for example, if the CEO, the CFO, the COO, you can see where this would be, you know, a C-suite type of folder. And we really wanted each of them to have edit capability. And when we share that way then the person creating the folder is defaulted as the manager and then the other in this case the other c-suite uh, individuals have editing capability but now this becomes oh uh, any reports that have their focus points then they they would have those reports saved there and it may or may not be shared by multiple other groups uh then you have shared with me if there's uh reports that are important and by other team members and they shared individually with you and then as you're saving reports then they'll drop into favorites and you can favorite a report by using the star up here or on the actual report itself you can make it a favorite and then it would show up both down here and in the folder wherever you have it in place right uh, we talked about this favoriting uh, when we were talked originally about uh, not just reports, but any page or object or record could be saved in that global 
favorites. So these are all the different types of uh, report listings or folders available. And then when we're creating a new report, then we showed you from the admin side how you can create these different types of reports. There, there's obviously multiple standard type reports that are in place, including activity reports, which are you know important to a lot of leadership teams and and holding ourselves to a high standard of what I want to get done by when and so. I could have activities that include my tasks and events, or I could include events with invitees. So these are important Im appointments, important appointments, or just appointments in general, depending on how I filtered it. Activities with accounts, activities with contents, activities with leads, and so on. And this just narrows down and focuses who I'm interacting with and what and shows me data that would be important uh, usually to keep myself on track but also to keep you know leadership aware of and when I create that report then the outline section allows me to look at columns that are automatically defaulted and then when I expand the fields out then I can show all the different fields that would be available to drag and drop and to be placed in this report as well. And then I can also filter. So you can see when I clicked on there's default filters in place. If I wanted to change my team's activities to all activities this would be all activities that I had access to in relation to these roles or all roles and uh, when I click done now I can filter on uh, the dates that I would want to see this for this report and you can do uh, when it was is when it was created when it was modified uh, when it was adjusted so I'm gonna say any lead created at any time and any activities uh, including open and completed activities and to show all tasks and events so that gives me a, as far expansive as possible to anything that would be uh, accessible to uh, a user and this obviously this environment is brand new we don't have a whole lot of uh, reports or activities saved so rather than going through and adjusting any of those or creating any of those I'm just going to discard that report and go to all and see if there's any sample reports in this org only this sample uh, screen flow so the point being as you're adding accounts and if I wanted to create a report I know we've uploaded accounts here and I just want an expansive view of you know the most recent accounts so here's activity I know there's not a whole lot of activity in this org right now I'm the only owner that could be available in this view but if I wanted to filter all accounts not just those owned by me and I wanted to do created date I know we have created here just in our session over the last uh, lessons then what's been created uh, this week 
how many new accounts have been created this week then refreshing that and again this is a preview and if I click the toggle button in the upper right hand corner then it's going to give me the most recent pre preview uh, it's up to 20 accounts typically but again I can drag and drop more column headers based on these fields these are all the fields available in the account layout so I could show right now I have the account name uh, the billing state and province but if I wanted the billing address then I could drop in and so here's a billing address uh, typically we would move the state down below the address line and for some they would want the city available so you can see where I can drop in city here and if there are fields that really are not giving me any information and I want to just uh, make it a tighter review then I can make sure I've got just a really tight report on right now it's a tabular report of information that's important but uh, very closely tightened up and if I wanted to group these accounts by state then I can click into the group rows and now do find billing state here and it grabs alphabetically now it's showing me I've got multiple uh, accounts in some of these states and if I just wanted to take a minute to show that in a summary report then you can see in Illinois there's a couple Massachusetts and so on and then if I wanted to add a chart to this to show you know a a view of alphabetically here's each of the states and then where I have more available and then I can show the values for each of those and that now becomes part of the history and it's also drillable so I could click on that bar and it takes me right to the details of which state it is and what cities are involved what accounts specifically and then when I click back out of it in the chart now you can see it's open up expanded to all the different states and now I could save this report and give it a name the tab Notice it's defaulting to private reports, but remember, I can put it in public reports or I've created the executive standard reports. And now when I save it, it's
it's given me the name, a description, I have my chart, and now I have the details of the report down below. Also be aware that if I wanted to remove the details and just show totals and not even subtotals, then if there were additional to totals I had set up by city, it would block those out. But then you notice as I click back on these toggles, which is at the bottom, it allows me to see more. I didn't have to create another report, it just allowed me to see more. So that's an overview of reports. We're going to uh, look at how these reports then now roll up to dashboards in the next demo. Lesson 10, demo 2, creating dashboards. So again, this is where really we are, we are enabled and empowered to give an overview of how the company is doing and where the company is going. And I can tell you from personal experience, when executives see the power of how the data can be parsed and separated out and different levels of views and how they can get targeted and then how they can help their team get focused. So a, a lot of time and effort is wasted on, wait, which report are you looking at? And what, what Excel spreadsheet and which email and where are we looking? Who knows the most latest? Is, is this viable information? So you as an, in, as an admin can be a real hero and helping develop what's the best case for these dashboard scenarios. And I can tell you uh, in, in teaching and explaining and empowering sea uh, level and, and management level team members. And then when they're aware that this, what they're looking at on a laptop can also be represented on an iPad or their smartphone. It just gets them very excited about what's next and how to get what done when and how to leverage the, the information that's being input on a regular basis because dashboards can be refreshed it's a little bit different than reports because reports are automatically as soon as someone saves a record it's going to show up in a report somewhere but dashboards are co combinations of right so they're up to 20 different reports simultaneously being viewed so it takes refreshing and we'll show that in a minute here in our in our demo but it's just amazing at the the excitement and the clarity of you know how to view this and now salesforce has taken this to a whole another level where they purchased a company called tableau and now there are tableau uh dashboards that have analytics einstein analytics and artificial intelligence running in the background and so it's algorithms and stories and epics and then uh where we're going to look at some filters this is very powerful but this is not the end this is really just the beginning of real capabilities and i would just again recommend that uh, you, you not stop here with this learning but you continue to expand and look on the just just type in dashboards or analytics into the trailhead salesforce trailhead environment into uh the video uh youtube salesforce youtube videos t type in dashboards you'll be amazed and and excited about how this is developing so for our purposes i'm going to go right into our live org and uh what i've done is download uh, basically a package of dashboards and 
that that comes free that is literally uh, I I did not have to go in and create all this information because it's it's a sample packet that if you just think for a second here age agent supervisor overview marketing executive dashboard sales executive dashboard sales manager dashboard sales person dashboard service executive overview service kpis so this is a highly rated uh app exchange app that is for free that i'm going to show in a, in a separate demo uh, how i downloaded this and the, the capabilities that are out there for you but this is data that i i didn't have to come up with it basically i downloaded these templates and their sample data but as my org grew and more users input information then we would get a true up of literally what's happening but if you look at the sales person dashboard then so this is showing a current monthly pipeline current monthly activities where the actuals are versus the quota and obviously in in my dashboard right now I'm the only person in this org so there really aren't any salespeople but each of these components is running on a report so this is a salesperson's open pipeline that's now showing a snapshot of that and if you're in the sales environment you're open viewing your open opportunities open activities and your closed opportunities as an individual if if i could just have this on my home page and every morning wake up and get focused on hey here's where i'm at right now and here's what i'm doing for my activities and here's and then if you're showing comparisons versus other team members in your group then it's even more powerful and just gets teams very very excited so this dashboard then could be subscribed to where it could be daily weekly monthly sent to recipients including myself including other users including individuals in the team and if this is something i want them to see on a regular basis then i can update it from there I can edit the capabilities and make changes to the individual components to the title up here at the top um I can rearrange these components move around where I could drag and drop where they fit I can edit each individual component uh if I wanted this to be a donut versus of uh, a funnel versus the gear then I can make those changes here and then when I'm done I click done and save and then if I wanted to create a new dashboard with a state in mind So I could make it the same exact parameters, the same uh template, but now it's Georgia salesperson's dashboard. And then if I wanted to upload different new components or download this as a uh printable item then here's where I can you know leverage this put it in a folder print it out if I wanted to and make adjustments as needed and remember that each of these could be saved in a folder shared um or limited sharing as needed and now I'm leveraging what's the 
what's the best for me as an individual salesperson, if that's the part of the company I'm in, and then all of this rolls up into supervisors, managers, executives. So if you see here uh, this executive dashboard, then all of the sales people in their region and their territory would roll up to and again my org doesn't have a whole lot of data in it right now but even just uh how we're set up right now then these nine components represent nine different reports that are all visible and can be added to and that then uploaded in when i click on edit then I could add a new component. So another report could be added from the give this given environment or other reports that might be accessible, whether it's a specific report that has specific details I'm looking for or totals that I'm looking for then that component is added here down at the bottom and I could either replace you know one of these existing components or move this up where it's more visible if this is an important uh, part of what my users need to see or, or my executives want to see, then I can make that part of what we're visualizing and then add up to 20 different components so you could see that you know here's a snapshot here's an overview here's every Friday at 2 p.m. this could be sent to executives or on their zoom meeting you know every other Tuesday they can one of the team members pulls this up that's hosting the meeting and they walk through all of these dashboards and in a matter of minutes they have a complete overview of all of the details of what's important and then if they need to save this is an executive dashboard that they need to get to very quickly then no matter where they are in Salesforce they could come right back to that by leveraging that favorites but all of these dashboards then become part of the agenda of what we're focusing on and what's going to be best practices and what's going to help move teams forward so that shows you uh, basic creating cap capabilities and if I just wanted to start fresh and a brand new And I wanted this to be someplace that other people would have access to. Then I start adding components from different areas in and different ways of looking at and best overviews and then save and drag and drop just in a matter of moments here you can tell 
I'm just basically right now I'm randomly just choosing And then, now this becomes looking into the future of, hey, here's where we are right now. Here's our priorities. Wait, we've got to really get better at our, our executives getting leads uh, put together. And so now this becomes a new dashboard that I can give access to, I can share with. And just in a matter of minutes, have a, a very poignant conversation to enhance the next level of what's best practices and then creating standards that we're going to build on for the future. Okay, so demo three of lesson 10 so we're talking about reports and dashboards and you can tell i get excited about this i've seen this just benefit so many people and i understand as an admin uh depending on our background we kind of get excited about data we get excited about configuring we get excited about um de basically developing or or being in an architecture environment and I get that I understand it but I think re really have to think about your users and your stakeholders and your champions and power users and uh, field administrators and delegated administrators and people who you know need to parse this data uh, from multiple different perspectives and then who they have to the shareholders and 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 or the board that they have to give you know accountability to and so the, for me reports and dashboards are really the fulcrum you know if accounts and contacts are the core objects and leads and opportunities are our core marketing uh, pillars of the Salesforce ecosphere. Definitely, reports and dashboards uh, allow us to tell the story. Th they would be the communication keys to what needs to happen, what can be happening. And, and many times it is what's happening in an org, but because we're not leveraging it, because we don't know where to look, or we haven't had anyone kind of walk us through, we're kind of focused on what we feel like is important to, and, and clean data, secure data, um, functionality, flows. We had a lesson on flows. And, and the power of what this can automate, all very important. But if we can't show deliverables and what's literally, you know, changing the face of our business and showing that we're stair-stepping up to the next level, then I can tell you, I, I've seen from personal experience, if... If the expense can't be validated in return on our investment, then then it just gets really tough to to keep the the org part of our day to day business flow long term, right? So to that end, what I've tried to do here in this demo, we're back at setup. So as an admin, this is where you live a lot of your life. And again, I'm going to reiterate I, one of the demos we did. We started talking about like every single area here and how important every part is. And what's interesting is as these new releases happen 
three times a year, then this uh, years ago, 2008, when I started with Salesforce, there really weren't that many menu items. Now there are so many drop downs in each of these specific areas that you literally could wind up hours hours just searching so that's why we went to this quick find environment so you can just start typing in things but across the top of this setup home page we really haven't focused very much on what these little components are talking about here i'm going to back up getting started with einstein bots i know for some some users if they're in the marketing world or the service world or maybe even the finance world this idea of einstein bots and can i help you and uh, it, it kind of right now doesn't make a whole lot of sense but i can tell you very definitely in marketing in, in some analytic environments in uh government cloud in uh the re they've definitely the online retail space then these ai powered bots that have um automated channels set up really a big deal for them the mobile publisher where you can create your own brand of a mobile app this is really a big deal for those of you who have a creative flair have an entrepreneurial flair have a development flair and you're just really good you you think out of the box constantly and you think uh hey if if this could do this wow this could help this and you connect those dots that's a really good place for you to be learning more um real-time coll collaborative docs so there's this whole quip and uh docusign and a lot of different uh electronic document environments that you're going to help yourself the more you know about how those documents can interact with the salesforce org and how raw data uh, can be leveraged not only in visual force pages but in in documenting in a in a published a uh, high quality level from quotes to articles to publications it's just uh, really a big deal the trailblazer community for me personally has been a a life changer uh 2019 when i earned my ranger status uh which means you're spending a lot of time learning but you get badges and you move up levels and you start out in this kind of uh, explorer stage and scout stage and the mountaineer stage and you move up uh, kind of like uh girl scouts or boy scouts environment and just fun ways narrative uh challenges hands-on in the org uh really shows a lot of the sense of humor that the developers have and, and the family has the ohana family has in the uh salesforce ecosphere but joining that community and getting in to trailheads just amazing the answers i've i've received and support i've received and then being part of uh the mobile environment uh, i currently have uh multiple phones that i leverage as part of my support of the contracts that i'm involved in and the clients that i have and uh they all have salesforce mobile so i can log in <laughs> to different orgs on different phones and so it's it's kind of fun but it's also it's a, again a lifesaver where i don't have to go through if, if i'm not online and have my uh multiple laptops and monitors up i can get to answers very quickly in the mobile environment but right here is what i leveraged for this demo 
where we're talking about Appy. So each of these uh, uh, caricatures are uh, is Astro and Appy and and uh, the different fun icons and uh, r- relational stories that come out of. So Appy is the App Exchange uh, favorite, and when I was looking at dashboards and reports, I knew that there's all kinds of uh, samples out there. So I just typed in sample dashboards, and I, I'm not looking to spend money, and I'm not looking to try to. Uh, leverage more f- for clients to pay but if you get the right type of dashboard insights then I'm just scrolling down here uh, everything from adoption dashboards which is helping leaders see are our are our employees using the tool um, all the way back up to what I downloaded into this org that, I'm, that I've been demonstrating, sample free sample dashboards where someone took the time to build out sample reports and just to get examples of what are some quality dashboard environments and they show you details and highlights about the dashboard environment or, or whatever app. There's multiple, there's thousands of apps. And then there's reviews, how other people have used the tool. And then there's reference to who created it and how you can get to them. And of course, in this case, it's the Salesforce lab. So it's people who work directly at Salesforce and getting to them and, and interacting with them and learning from them. And uh, by the way, these are all the different types of, it's just amazing how much has been created to help us get better. And so I, I walk through the process when you click get it now, then it takes, it took less than seven minutes to get what I'm going to show you into this org that I'm using and be ready to use. The reason I'm bringing that up is uh, you've seen in other demos, this is a developer org that doesn't have a whole lot of users involved. So it didn't have a whole lot of data. So it didn't have a whole lot of reporting or dashboard scenarios. So many of your, the employers that you are supporting, when they get right out of the box, they have sample reports and dashboards that come with the org. And I, for some people, it kind of frustrates them or it makes them, uh, they get a little confused. But uh, I'm going to show you uh, how to mass delete uh, things like, you know, extra information that would be in your way. But because I'm I'm going to walk you through the demo here and then when I I'm not going to get rid of all of it today but I'll show you how you can so that when you have templates together and and you save and clone them then you've saved yourself from creating the wheel from scratch but just before I leave this uh, banner here there's a uh, click to customize again for those of you who really like uh, building out and starting and leveraging that's uh, something you'll probably get in, excited about where you're you're the builder constructor configurer type uh, this is an app that you could get from the app store that is specifically for administrators that's another way to support you and help you this has been huge the new release notes uh, there is several new releases that just came out uh, this summer that have been game changers and again have helped me help other people do their jobs. And then uh, checking your system status and uh, making sure that you're up to speed with 
you know, security is just always important. And all of those banner items, uh, please take the time to walk through and just take a minute uh, when when you're in your work day. You will be very glad that you you know took a look at that. But let me click on uh, reports now. Uh, I'm sorry, on the app launcher, and then type in reports and go right to that object now. And just the few minutes we have here for this demo, I went ahead and downloaded that app, and in that app were all these sample practice reports, best practice reports. So, not all of these reports are going to have a whole lot of data right now, but I can tell you, like, this report right here, average case by resolution, I was just by agent. I was just in, uh, uh, less than two, three weeks ago, where this report, although my org doesn't have a whole lot of information because it's just me but being aware of how this report template is set up and again moving from left to right this you can create the title here and it tells you what type of report it is you can expand out the fields so that these are all the different types of fields that are available in the case object that you could make headers, column headers for your report. So, for example, I can see I already have status there. I have, if I just grab priority and drop it here at the bottom, then it becomes a, a header. And this column row also allows me to group them and also to group the rows and group the columns so I can build out matrix reports right from here. There's not a lot of cases, again, in this environment because it's just myself using it. But the point being getting very familiar with uh, we've talked in other uh, lessons and demos about reports and joint reports here's where you can leverage and create those and then these reports i'm going to click back on the reports tab i'm going to do the drop down next to it nor notice that i have a favorite that's saved and then these are some recent reports that I've been looking at recently and then if I wanted to go and create a tab for this where my report builder template would be right there available for me at all times I could add that there but when I click straight on the reports tab I'm not going to save the way I was changing that report but notice all reports and then all folders this created for me, uh, I had created the executive standard reports, but notice, the, again, these are just samples of best practices, and then I can share this report with other executives, other uh, titles, other leaders, and make this a part of, so there's roles, and... Remember, I had the CEO, CFO, those kind of things. And I can make the channel sales team a part of, you know, sharing this folder. And all of them would have viewing capability. So they couldn't change the reports that are inside. But they need to be aware of what are the best practices that are happening on the service side. So then... I can point to, hey, here's the trend of cases that, that are being closed. So we're not losing business out the back door as we're bringing business in the front door, right? So the whole point being, 
I wanted to have available the the possibility of real and and significant types of interaction so I could build on this and make it something that would you know be viable for for something to increase and get better and then build up into dashboards so this app that I downloaded allowed me to have all these different dashboards available so you've got service salesperson sales executive and now I have templates that I didn't have to create and now I can have a discussion with the executives in my company and walk them through here's the capabilities here's the reports so by the way if I right click on any of these blue links in the lower left hand corner of the component and then I click on open link in new tab then I'm I still have the dashboard in front of me but if I wanted to see what is that report that's running underneath it and what are the details of that report I just clicked two times one to create the tab and now I could go right back to there's the dashboard and the snapshot but I wanted to see wow what what is that what does that pipeline look like and so and now I have templates that I didn't have to create and now I can have a discussion with the executives in my company and walk them through here's the capabilities here's the reports so by the way if I right click on any of these blue links in the lower left hand corner of the component and then I click on open link in new tab then I'm I still have the dashboard in front of me but if I wanted to see what is that report that's running underneath it and what are the details of that report I just clicked two times one to create the tab and now I could go right back to there's the dashboard and the snapshot but I wanted to see wow what what is that what does that pipeline look like and so scrolling down now I'm seeing oh this is where those numbers came from this is a really 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 good example of a template that I didn't have to create from scratch but that is now available to my leadership team and when we're done with the details then we can we can put our own information so I can change the filters to different creation points I can instead of all opportunities I can do opportunities filtered by my team and and or these individuals and their teams and then save the report and have different cross sections and then create a dashboard off of that type of report so I'm just highly highly recommending that if your org doesn't have sample reports and dashboards that came with it then downloading that app sample dashboard app took five minutes and now I have something that I can have a conversation with and then as I was saying when I want to get rid of the detail the underlying information so it doesn't uh, clog up my org then I start typing in the word mass here in the the Salesforce support org uh, menu bar and the quick find and notice here's mass activities mass delete mass transfer approval mass transfer records 
mass update addresses. So this is for if you have a senior executive that moves to another company, you don't want to you don't want to delete his record because everything that's tied to him it rolls up to him. But you could freeze his record and then transfer accounts, opportunities, whatever from him over to the new role or position or profile as it you know and and without losing any details but here's where if i uploaded information and i i need to get rid of it now or it was the wrong set of accounts or like these samples then i can come in and choose any one of these links and click search I'm just i just leave the filters open and click search on any cases that are out there that are samples and here's all of this that this is not quote unquote real but important for my sample capabilities right now but if i wanted to permanently delete them I click that, tick that box, and then I tick the lead box for the entire listing, and then I click delete, and it'll erase all of those permanently. And they go into the re recycle bin, and then I can do the same thing with uh, accounts, leads, activities. And so that way, I get the best of all those reports templates and dashboards i get a, a leverage point to have good quality discussions with my leadership team and then get rid of what's not necessarily important to me within 30 days all of that's gone and now we're building on what we learned so that's a quick overview of leveraging managing uh, reports and dashboards and then as you teach power users and people who are excited about creating their own reports and showing them those little filters that we just walked you through and then you get good at that you're really really going to help other people do their job even better all right i'll see you in the next and try to embrace all that's uh involved in and a part of developing the next level in the orgs that you support in your career in your employer uh database wow so kudos to you and all the best in your next endeavors this lesson on deployments is important because transitioning from sandbox to production uh, could be important especially as you grow out and and enlarge the the data that's input and then there's more users that have more ideas that really want to test things first which is best practice and rather than redoing the entire process that you've built out or the flow then being able to deploy it from your sandbox into your production is going to save you multiple steps and because i'm not in a an org that is a production org uh, through these other demos then i'll do my best to uh represent for you the the best way the best practices and uh try to leverage some resources that'll help you uh, get a picture of what's going to work best so let's let's dive in just like we've started every lesson from the very beginning at the end of this uh, learning opportunity you should be able to discuss and understand deployment basics the kind of the how and the what and the when of deployment and then chain sets and different types of sets and 
how you can leverage best practices and not have to recreate the wheel then uh, creating a sandbox and how that's important to uh, your environment and being able to establish a really good uh, testing environment then sandbox types and configuration and when I first started out there really weren't a whole lot of different testing environments but now obviously because there's so many different ways we can leverage the platform and there's so many different cloud based components so many different applications we really didn't dive deep into all the various clouds that are now a part of the Salesforce ecosphere but uh, being able to deploy a chain set and what are the limitations of chain sets are all going to be important to your understanding. So what is a deployment? In software development, all the deployment testing work will be done in a separate environment. We said this from the beginning. Uh, I've been doing everything that we've been testing in a development org. So that way it doesn't affect actual business until it's been t tested and thoroughly vetted. So why these environments to protect business software products from suspicious code and we haven't really written any code but obviously there's code that has to be behind the scenes or this part of uh, the, the drag and drop that we've put in place although those are all fully vetted but there's just a lot that would need to be tested and the bugs worked out before it ever got into uh, product, a production environment and, and was impacting business logistics. So here's at least three advantages. It helps us maintain business continuity. Small missing code may lead to uh, crashing workflows. And hopefully you've not been through anything like that. But uh, preventing that is what you want for your career. Uh, so so slow and steady and testing multiple times before you ever introduce anything new is a best practice number two compatibility the new changes may be incompatible with existing integrations or features especially if you're inheriting or joining into an environment where you're not starting from scratch it's a, a environment that you are coming in as the second or third or or additional admin then domino effects can happen anywhere but especially if you haven't thoroughly and even if you have vetted and checked and done health checks and and compatibility checks you still you know want to test in a, in a sandbox environment and then user adoption so change is tough for everyone and if we haven't given individuals a chance to really make mistakes and click the wrong thing and and make the wrong choice with their data or upload something that wouldn't be a best practice in the data wizard environment for example then we can help people feel more confident more secure in a test environment that really even if you break it or if you put something in it it is going to be a controlled environment that doesn't affect the rest of the business flow so if the, if in an org there's multiple developers and they're working in multiple sandboxes and there's all different kinds of code uh, and there's partial sandboxes and there's full sandboxes and the code stays inside that one staging area then that's a good thing if it's pushed into production then you know we this is why this diagram has basically multiple 
layers, speed bumps, channels, however you want to explain it, so that the production environment over here has basically several walls of testing before anything's moving to the next level. For most of our smaller user environments, and even I would say uh, mid-level, then this this is overkill. But the larger your organization, and if you're involved in any global environments, then obviously this is really important to have in place. So chain sets. A change set in Salesforce is a mechanism through which the changes from development in that environment can be pushed into a production environment. So Salesforce change sets contain components which are developed by development teams and available to deploy into production for users. So here's some advantages. Declarative deployments can be managed with clicks. So when you're planning this out ahead of time, it's not uh, it's not like a fire alarm. It's not like an emergency. It's very smooth, very well tempered. It doesn't have to be multiple weekends of all nighters. Provides ability to select and compare deployment components, and when we move the change it gives you a good representation of the code coverage and the progress so for those of you who are in the IT world and you have that hat on and you really really love uh, creating developing code writing then you understand code coverage and how important that is to an environment and so an important note here at the bottom, change sets do not support all of Salesforce components. Like the standard pick list values, sales processes, divisions, organization-wide email addresses, etc. So change sets can't leverage or make life fully easy for every single object or record type in the Salesforce org. The two main types of change sets at this point are outbound change sets and inbound change sets. So obviously the outbound change set is used to make changes in the production organization that you're logged into and you upload those changes from typically your sandbox. Inbound changes, these are change sets contains all the object components of the items that are being pushed from the developer org into production so here's a good representation you've got a sandbox with object a workflow field x and y uploaded into this outbound change set environment and then received by the production environment and upon receipt then there's validation and then deployment so you can see there's built into this are many checks and balances. So to create a sandbox, we can go to setup, home, platform tools, expand environments, click on sandbox. And you can see in this representation, depending on uh, what type of org and instance your company has purchased, then you could have multiple types of testing environments that you could leverage uh, depending on your workflow and your time frame. Then there are developer sandboxes, developer pro, partial copy sandboxes, and then full sandboxes. And so you can see on the right hand side. It's kind of giving you what's involved. For example, a full sandbox is just like having a mirror of your production. And so you typically don't get more than one full sandbox. Partial sandboxes, really, it's a sample. It's a, it's a partial. It's true to 
your org information, but a smaller subset. Uh, your developer pro is the metadata only with a gig of storage. And then your normal developer has got 200 megs of data cap capability storage. But again, it's only the metadata. And the metadata really, remember, that is the structure that uh, is the, the field that holds the records. So it really is like uh, a template scenario, but really good for developing. So to use a partial or full sandbox, we've got to create the sandbox template so we can choose which objects we need to load in the sandbox. So clicking on sandbox template is going to allow you to get this information in a structure. So fill the name and select the objects which you want to load in the sandbox and click on the save button to finish. Definitely would want the basics, the account, opportunity, contacts, leads. To create a sandbox, click on the sandbox menu item, click on new sandbox button. Pretty straightforward. Fill a name, choose uh, which type of sandbox you want to create, give it a little description, click next. This step's optional to run scripts after each created and refreshed sandbox. You can specify the Apex class. Again, this is solely up to you, totally optional. For some, it would be important. So when you create the sandbox, you've got this initial kind of clean slate in place. And it'll be pending and in a queue at first. And it takes some time, again, depending on your org, your instance, obviously your uh, connectivity. But you'll see this change from uh, pending to processing and then becomes available for you. Once it's completed, now you can start using it. And really, this is best practice for UAT, you know, the testing environment, and for training where you can allow people, like we said at the beginning, to have uh, a sense of uh, adventure and fun and enjoyment and not be concerned that they're going to impact their their own personal, you know, information in the production org and or the business flow. So logging into the sandbox is basically leveraging the test.salesforce.com. And we usually append uh, the sandbox name where we add something to it like test one. So if xyzcorp.com is your sandbox name, then test one, you want to stay away from logging into production. And I can tell you, doing this for, again, 14 years, uh, I've had people log into production accidentally, uh, or, or the opposite way, they logged into Sandbox, and they were putting in their activity, and they were being graded on or uh, held accountable to their activities, and they had put them in Sandbox, and it wasn't showing up in reports in the production environment. So... It's something that you as the admin can help your teams because you can see who's logging into what and you can kind of help guide. Don't have to be the bad guy. Don't have to be negative about it, but just someone who's helping. So to create a sandbox... We can go to Setup, Home, Platform Tools, Expand Environments, click on Sandbox. Okay, Deploying Change Sets. 
So here's the, the main steps. Create the outbound change set and sandbox. Deploy, set up the deployment settings. Upload the change set. Validate the change set to make sure it's valid. Uh, that is an optional step, but we recommend it. Deploy the change set, and then let's just kind of take a look at how this goes step by step. Log into Salesforce, create outbound change sets. Click on Setup, Home, Platform Tools, Expand Environments, and click on Outbound Change Set. Create your change set. So click to continue to create what you've done, but here's the overview of what you created. Click on the New button to create that outbound change set. Enter the outbound change set name. Give it a brief description. That's important just so, you know, months from now or if a new person is hired in, then you can just give them clarity and they can see the steps. Upon save, you'll be directed to the following screen. You edit the change set, add the components. We're in the early stages and the status is going to be open right now. Then we add the change set components. It includes all the components that are available to push the production org and profiles we want to include. So click the add button to add components to your set. From the drop down, choose the components which you want to include and click add to change set. Viewing and adding dependencies. So this will help you check the specific button. Help you check what are all the dependent components that are required to be added in the change set. Example, if you add an object in a few fields, the same object and some validation rule and, and page layouts, we should add the validation rule and page layouts as the object is depending on them. So you kind of want to, to make this as realistic as possible. So you get a real sense of what's going to happen. Now we have to change it created. We have added requirement components. Now we click on change to check it. Uh, upload button to upload the change set. We click on the upload button. It throws a warning. The organization isn't authorized to upload change sets to other organizations. This is because the production org didn't accept the change set. So you have to log into the production org to resolve it. Step two, now we're in production. Go to deployment settings, click on the change set name, or edit to change the settings. Here we can authorize the sandbox org to update those change sets to production and allow inbound changes. Check the checkbox. authorize it go back to deployment settings we can see the change set one color change to green this means we can upload the change sets from the sandbox to production so it's really giving you a pictorial right green means go then We log in the sandbox, go to the outbound change set. There you see the change set been working on. Click on it to go to the detail page and click on upload. Choose the target organization. When you click the upload button, the confirmation message will pop up. Your change set has been uploaded successfully. It will be available in the production org to deploy it. So it doesn't mean it's deployed right away, but... Now you go to the outbound change set page. You can see the status is closed. This means the change has been uploaded to production and closed for edits. So now you log into your production org, go to change sets, click on inbound change sets, see the change set waiting for deployment. All right, so you get, you can kind of see this as kind of a handshake. Then you click on the change set to view the details. See what are the components that are available to deploy. Click on Validate. 
huge step. Make sure this is validated. I know it's optional, but highly recommended. So there are multiple test options. Default, run local tests, run all tests, run specified tests. I've been in some orgs where the senior admin was like, we're running all the tests. So choose a default for now, and then we'll learn more details next next screen here. Types of tests. So the default keeps the default behavior for all tests. No tests are executed in sandbox, but in production, all local tests are executed if the chain set contains apex classes or triggers. Local tests are all tests. So if there's apex involved, then the org is going to test it. So the local tests, all tests on the organization will run except the ones that originate from the install managed packages. That makes sense because those should be covered. This test level is default for production deployment and includes the Apex class and triggers. So the test available for chain set validation and deployment, run all tests or run specified tests. In the run all, the organization, all the tests are run, including tests for managed packages. The specified tests, only tests that the user specify are run. User has to provide the names of the test classes and commentator separated list. Advantage of choosing this option is it checks code coverage criteria at the chain chain set level rather than checking it at the entire org level. The test covers with an in chain sets minimum of seventy five percent code coverage. So again, your your leadership team. And again, have, in my opinion, have people around you who are advocates for you, who understand and can just validate for you. Yep, let's let's do it that way. When you're clicking validate, it'll it'll throw an information warning sign saying that all resources will be locking. Clicking on the deployment status from earlier screen will be navigated to below screen which gives us information about status validate deployed click on the name of the change set it'll take you to the detail page we're almost there now you can see the status change to validate succeeded click on deploy button to deploy the changes so you just got to make sure this right here validation succeeded so basically that's your ultimate green light again brings the Test option window to choose test sets for deployment. This step is mandatory. So obviously this is kind of the final test scenario that the org is going to force. Then when clicking deploy button, warning window will pop up. This is a form us that any part of deployment fails. All changes are rolled back. So it's all or, basically all or nothing. If the deployment is successful, the changes can't be rolled back. So click on OK to confirm deployment. Standard pick list values, sales processes, divisions, organization-wide email addresses, etc. They cannot be used. So these are, that's the first limitation. Because this limitation, organization can face the issue of increased deployment time, manual intervention, the possibility of human error. So it's kind of a trade-off, but I can tell you that uh, at this stage, uh, you want as much protection of the organization as possible. Second limitation, only connected orgs are supported. You have to have a different org instance. Then we cannot connect to the production org or vice versa. So it's basically we're trying to make sure there's a clean handoff. There's no rollback support and number four difficult to track changes done to a component so a specific component to show exactly what happened inside that organization very difficult the overview of today is having your development org and your sandbox gives you these layers of protection there are 
different types of change sets that can be processed into your production org from a connected sandbox or development org. The important thing here is validation before deployment. There's different types of sandbox uh, test environments. The full sandbox is a direct mirror of what you currently are running in production. So it's the best for use cases and UAT testing and training. Um, deployment chain sets are uh, important to save manual input, but they have to be employed. They're all um, validated. They are all or nothing. And you cannot validate and verify everything that's changed in a specific component. But this is the best world for uh, making changes in a mass environment and the multiple checks and balances that have been validated throughout the years uh, help us to understand that this is a good way of saving you multiple steps when you've tested something and then you want to move it into your production environment. a sandbox and then rolling out those uh, deployment changes into a production field so First of all, we're going to, you know, our setup org. So we get our production org launched and we're going to set up and scroll it down, click in. Clicking on environment and sandboxes or you could type sandbox in the you know the quick guide at the top so once we come to this detailed page of sandboxes now we're going to choose different types of environments are available to us so we click on new sandbox and we need to name what our sandbox is going to be and you can give it a description if you need to. You'll find that you uh, may have more than one test org. And so giving it a description would be important. And then you're clicking the next button. And that's a, a if there's Apex code required, you can type in there. If not, we're moving on. And then it takes a few minutes for this to set up. You can imagine uh, if you're going to do... A partial test environment then uh, it wouldn't take as long to to activate but it's basically Salesforce is copying another version so you could interact with this and that's why it's called the sandbox where you can develop right what's important to you and make the changes like we're going to demonstrate so it takes usually about 10 minutes, depending on the size of your org, uh, the maturity of the org, the more data, the more it's got to move into uh, this test environment. So it looks like it's activating and again, 10 to 12 minutes then we'll have a login capability and so once you click on login then you're gonna have to additionally uh, type in 
a username and password and you can use the same password we would recommend that but notice it says dot test two on the end of our username salesforce requires a unique username for every interaction so once we get our password our username in place then uh, you can activate it as needed but once the environment's opened up for us the way you can tell it's different is at the very top there will be sandbox test 2 and so now you know this is the production area where I can make changes and it won't hurt or harm so whatever I've created then I can use chain sets to move it over so we're going to create a custom object here that would allow us to see the custom object example and we're checking to make sure that we've got uh, current products and objects available now and then we're going to name this branch and so you have to no notice anything that has a red bar next to it is a required field so we type in branch and then we type in the plural and then again you can put any description down at the bottom uh, that that would be an option but Salesforce will create the API for you and then we recommend you're checking in, uh, allow sharing, allow reporting, allow a tab. And those are options, but it'll just help you to be able to identify and use this object. So once we've created it, then we want to create fields. And again, this is an example of a uh, real world. So we're going to create a phone number field for this branch object and we're going to call it branch phone and Salesforce automatically uh, creates the API address we're clicking next to make sure these are all available to our profiles and next that they're available to page layouts then our second field is going to be a test field and we're going to need to name this so there's a label for it and we're going to need to give it uh, how many characters so we'll give it 12 characters so that it reduces the size of the field and the real estate on your page layout and we're clicking next and next and then we're going to create one last custom field and we're going to name it so that we have three or four examples of what we could move from this sandbox environment into our production so now we've got the fields created for this custom object and we're going to go to the invite back to the environment again and we're going to look click on change sets and first we have to look at outbound change sets and this splash page lets you know you're on the right area because you've got to move from this organization to the production organization the information that we've created and notice you're not writing any code you're simply walking through the steps and we're in test two environment so we know we're in the right sandbox now we're going to create this change set and the change set as we mentioned in our lesson is what is going to move the details the data from this organization this instance this org this platform into our production so we've got to name the change set and again we always recommend give some description so you help yourself remember then we're gonna look at what 
what are the components we need in this change set so we're going to click on add here and what type of component is this that we're going to be moving over and it's a custom object so we'll scroll down and we'll find uh, a custom object that we could uh, allow the change set to see okay this is something that you created and you're going to choose branch and we're going to view those components and here's the fields that we created so we choose we want all of those fields to be moved over so you could choose only to move you know two of the three or four that you created then you can see here's the components that we we just created and this object is allowing us now to move it to an outbound environment and so now we come back to deployment settings so we set up what needs to move and now we've got to deploy it so deploy it is the actual movement and so here's this organization where I'm going to be moving the data and now I'm going to verify here's the outbound chain set that's ready to move and I have that upload link is available and now I can click upload into production you notice it had a little radio button next to the word produ production so now I'm telling it yep the chain set is ready to be deployed and when you get those green arrows you know you're ready to move forward now I come back to inbound chain set and I've got to uh, make sure yep everything is in place I'm checking to make sure that uh, the object can be moved so I'm gonna validate that I have uh, created this object that it's in one setting and that it's in it's not currently in production so I know it's not there that's what I'm just checking now and so I'm just validating and verifying ready for deployment but there's my branch object I've got to validate so these are checks and balances that Salesforce is uh, basically forcing us to make sure if I have any code that I wrote that I know is involved in that sandbox area then I could choose to put the name of this code in the string that's available uh, so that it specifies hey here's what's part of the change that you created but in this instance it's gonna be best for us to move to the default radio button so you can see we're typing out if I wanted to include that code but for most of us we're just gonna to go to the default validation radio button and click on that allow Salesforce to take the default position and notice it's saying yep 
it's validated and now I can deploy it and I'm going to let it remain in the default uh, object so you can see basically we're letting Salesforce do the work we did not write any extra code we didn't have to plot out the path basically we're just following the steps to create the custom objects in a test environment and collect those fields into a change set and then deploy those after we validated them between the two boxes sandbox and production and Salesforce verifies it's complete 